Provench is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, nausea or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis, which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. 
You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.
Hello everyone, I'm Alex, your host, and welcome back to the 2020 Prostate Cancer Patient and Caregivers Conference. I'm so glad you joined us. Today we'll be having presentations from Dr. Nicholas Vogelzang covering advanced prostate cancer and from Mac Roach covering radiation therapy, and an extended Q&A presentation with our famous duo, Dr. Mark Scholes and Dr. Mark Moyad. Before we get into those presentations, I would like to thank our sponsors. Bayer, Janssen, Estellus, Pfizer, Dendrion, Accuray, Abvi, Blue Earth, Advanced Accelerator Applications, Clovis, Myovent, Spaceor, Foundation Medicine, Progenix, Sanofi, and the Pan Foundation. Honestly, they helped make this all possible and it enables us to make this completely free for all of you. Also, we are giving away $50 Amazon gift cards today. So to enter to win, you need to do three things. Number one, go subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can visit our website, pcri.org, and go to the conference page, and you enter your email, and then you say, go blue in the comment below. Blue is not only for Dr. Moyad's Michigan colors, but it's also for Prostate Cancer and Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So don't forget to share this conference page on your social media channels and help us spread prostate cancer awareness. All right, let's get started with our next presentation. Dr. Nicholas Vogelzang is a medical oncologist with comprehensive cancer centers. He serves as the associate chair of the Genitourinary Committee for U.S. Oncology Research and vice chair of GU Committee SWOG, which is a worldwide network of researchers that design and conduct cancer clinical trials. Dr. Vogelzang serves as the clinical professor for medicine at the University of Nevada School of Medicine, as well as the clinical professor for UNLV School of Medicine. With that, let's get into Dr. Vogelzang's presentation. So I've known you probably 25 years. I don't know. There are very few people who know it as well as you do. There are very few people. To one of the best oncologists in the world is an understatement. So when we had an open slot, as this pandemic was occurring, I said, I've got to get a top-notch, world-renowned oncologist here who uh, I think would not only give a talk, but is very popular at this conference, plus is well-known as his hand in most clinical trials. So I immediately picked up the phone and called Las Vegas and called Dr. Nick J. Vogelzang. So I'm excited to have you here. And today we're going to do it a little bit different. You're going to give a presentation. I might chime in. I might not. And then I'm going to ask you some questions afterward. But first of all, I want to praise you for showing up here on short notice. But you were at the top of my list. And I'm so glad that you agreed to do this. Well, thanks, Mark. It's great to be here today. Um, you know, PCRI has been a, a wonderful addition. I, I really applaud uh, Mark and the organizing team for keeping PCRI um, on, a, on a very uh, focused direction. Um, I've, I've, been in, I've been, excuse my uh, golden retriever in the background, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, uh, I, you know, I've always been involved in patient support groups. I helped start us too. Um, I've been involved in bladder cancer and kidney cancer and mesothelioma patient support groups. So, um, I'd like to talk today about uh, sequencing therapy in prostate cancer. This is an adaption of a talk I gave uh, to urologists at UCLA uh, in March. <clears throat> I've added a few slides. Mark and I have gone over this, um, and I've asked Mark to actually moderate or intervene um, with questions as uh, they come along. Um, I'll give you all a little background. One of, one of, my, one of my patients right now is a is a, a fellow who's had metastatic prostate cancer for 10 years. <clears throat> he presented with a groin node when he was in his mid-50s, and it was a high-grade prostate cancer. And I've, um, I just saw him yesterday, and um, it's sort of a reminder of how this disease has a very long and wandering course. And one of the things he did uh, when he was younger was float the Mississippi. Uh, to recreate uh, the uh, journey of Mark Twain. And, um, and the, the idea of that is that this is a long journey. Treating metastatic prostate cancer sometimes can be very short and unfortunate, but many times can be a 15 or 20 year or sometime even longer journey. So 
the idea of sequencing therapy is what I am talking about today. We, we begin with the disease at the, whenever you enter the river. You might enter it in Minnesota. You might enter it in New Orleans. Uh, you might enter it in Vicksburg, or you might enter it in St. Louis. But the idea is to keep yourself on the river and not end up at the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, so to speak. So sequencing therapy. So we're going to talk about this as, a, um, as an idea of um, what, are the, what are the top things you should know about this? Well, in, in the most recent period, uh, the FDA has approved a variety of new drugs. So that's number one. There's new pills. And there will be more drugs available. So one of the goals is to keep you healthy and, and safe long enough to get access to these new pills. The second major advance is better scanning. We have new scans. We're going to talk specifically about that toward the end. The third top advance is that when there's only a small amount of cancer in your body, it's very clear that radiation to that area can be helpful. Some, some surgeons would argue that they should be the ones delivering surgical resection, but I think that is difficult. And with the advent of cyber knife therapy, uh, we can basically treat almost any site in the body. And a study from Netherlands showed, uh, called STOMP showed that radiation at all sites of disease slows the need for or delays the need for androgen deprivation therapy. Another big advance is that almost all patients who enter the Mississippi River that is, who have metastatic disease, should receive, at the very beginning, at least two or more drugs. The standard is no longer one drug, Lupron. The drug we used to give was biclutamide, but we no longer give that. It should either be uh, Luprolide with chemotherapy, docetaxel, or Luprolide with Zytiga, or Luprolide with, with apalutamide or enzalutamide. Um, and and we're, we're, we're clearly now at two-drug therapy at the beginning, um, and more and more there's movement to identify three-drug therapy. Now, the FDA, as I mentioned at the top, um, approved uh, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide for non-metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Um, and those drugs have disease control rates in the 90% for an average of up to three years. So those drugs um, need to be part of your thinking, uh, particularly if the only sign of disease recurrence is a PSA elevation. Now, um, a newer development is that um, all hormone drugs, uh, all hormone type drugs tend to be somewhat cross resistant. Now we're, we're still not sure about this, but in general, uh, we now know that abiraterone and enzalutamide, two very standard drugs for our trip down the Mississippi, are cross-resistant in about 90% of patients. Um, uh, Dr. Anton Arrakis at uh, Johns Hopkins has identified the uh, ARV7 that shows that androgen receptor is upregulated. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a learning process. Uh, process, we're now seeing more and more of these androgen receptor uh, mutations that are up, that are overexpressed. Basically, the way I describe this would be like the wind on a sail, and the androgen receptor is the sail. So if you're going to sail downstream, it'll go faster, but if you want to sail upstream, you need that sail, and that'll, that'll keep the wind in your sails. Um, so you deploy a different sail at times, and that different sail is your um, is hold on a minute is your um, um, way to move up and down the river. Uh, and now a, a subject that many pe people are not happy about is chemotherapy, uh, but um, number seven talks about how chemotherapy with cabazitaxel a very well-tolerated taxane-type drug is, is definitely superior um, to um, 
a second um, hormone therapy. So that is now important. And the drug that we use is, should not be considered uh, bad. It's a well-tolerated, easily given, unfortunately it's not given to very many patients, but it's very, very well tolerated and it's clearly superior to uh, those second line hormone therapies, abiraterone and enzalutamide. And then uh, in the last three months about uh, PARP inhibitors, a new class of drugs have been FDA approved. Um, and uh, now uh, we need to have patients tested for their DNA mutations in almost every single patient. Other drugs that we use on the river of prostate cancer are Cipulus LT and radium, um, and they continue to be very important drugs. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Sarter and a, a series of us showed that uh, African-American patients with a different immune system have a much different benefit and better benefit to uh, Cipulus LT uh, than uh, perhaps Caucasians. And radium continues to be very important for pain control. Um, so, um, and then the last thing I wanted to summarize for everyone is to say that these new androgen receptor agents are still being developed. Uh, these are areas that we, we are gonna see more and more of, but although these are androgen receptor um, inhibitors, cancer cells tend to become androgen independent. Um, and that means that we need new drugs. Um, and these new drugs are on the way. Pembrolizumab, uh, Dr. Schultz has stud studied. There's a new doublet called uh, Cabomedics and Atezolizumab, uh, which are uh, helpful. CDK9, uh, we have uh, it's that, that little thing at the end there, it says et cetera. Uh, there's Lutetium uh, 177, um, and Amgen recently has put a huge investment into what's called bite therapy. Um, by specific T cell engagement therapy. So um, we, we have a long journey. We have a lot of tools to uh, use on, uh, on our journey. Um, and, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. But Mark, I'm happy to have any questions from you at this point. This is the big overview, so to speak. And now we'll dig into some of these details. Well, we'll see this again. So I'll, I'll let you present. But there's one question that's just burning and I just can't get it out of my brain. When I look at this list, I think, what's your golden retriever's name? <laughs> Doug. No, come on. <laughs> that's really? what we call him, Doug. Just like the, the movie Up, we named yes. him after that movie. You're kidding. <laughs> nope, we didn't. What, that's what if I told you I know the, the voice of Doug? You do. Well, I do. Well, I do. Time. I'll have to, to tell you that off camera. That's a family <laughs> that I grew up with and the people who work on Pixar now. And uh, there's a very famous person, his last name is Peterson, that works for Pixar. And he, he throws in a lot of voices. I may have to get you a picture of Doug signed by the person who was the voice of Doug. That's that my favorite thing. That's well, it. I know, the, I know the voice of Doug. <laughs> Well, Doug, Doug is our joy. He's, uh, we have three. We have a little, little old demented dog. We have an old crippled dog. And we have Doug, who's sort of getting to late middle age. So, um, okay. Well, Mark, and, Doug's, and, 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 and remember, dogs, dogs get prostate cancer, right? Dogs have prostate. It was a model studied going back a long time, looking at BPH and prostate cancer, potentially in prostate changes in dogs. You remember all that? Speaking of which... We're going to talk about Charlie Huggins. There we go. Charlie, Charlie Huggins is the one that used the dog model. Uh, he discovered when he was studying dog, dog's prostates that they got prostate cancer. And when he would castrate the dogs, good lead, by the way, Dr. Moyad. Thank you. That's my job. When he uh, castrated dogs back in the 30s, their prostate cancers disappeared. And he went on then to say that maybe we should treat prostate cancer with castration. And the very first patients had dramatic responses. They, in fact, the first patient had a 14 year response to hormone therapy. Hmm. And he won the Nobel Prize for that discovery in 1966. Wow. So um, this is 
Doug revisited, so to speak. <laughs> Doug has already been castrated, so Doug doesn't have to worry about prostate cancer. <laughs> Doug's getting a lot of airtime. That makes me happy. Yeah, yeah. So what Charlie knew about prostate cancer is as follows. He knew that it was hormone sensitive. Uh, he knew and tried to figure out why adrenals played a role in prostate cancer. He knew there were good cancers, there were bad cancers. Um, we met many times and he told me before he died that hormones were not the sole solution to prostate cancer. And he recognized the benefits of chemotherapy for prostate cancer. And in fact, the androgen receptor was discovered in Charlie's lab uh, by Jeff Green at the University of Chicago. My sister-in-law, Gail Prince, uh, was the postdoc and uh, has her first name first on the uh, androgen receptor cloning paper. What Charlie didn't know, well, of course, many things, but uh, uh, first of all was that uh, PSA um, was a surrogate of AR um, and that androgen receptor and PSA go together, that you get uh, uh, multiple ways in which you can activate the androgen receptor. But one of the things I think that Charlie never got a chance to see or learn about was that prostate cancer cells produce their own ligands. They, they mean, uh, the way I describe this to the patients is they produce their own gas for the engine. And that is a vital thing to understand, that these are autonomous cancer cells. They create their androgen receptor, and then they produce their own wind for the sale. Um, it's a very challenging issue. And the other thing that he didn't know is that there were many genetic variations, that there's BRCA mutations and all sorts of different things, Lynch syndrome. So we're not going to try to go back to the 1940s, but it was an, a very... Um, important time. He, he really was a seminal figure in prostate cancer. So to give you a short history of this, Charlie Huggins showed that it was effective for castration in the 40s. Adrenalectomy was practiced to remove that source of food in the 50s. The LHRH agonists, these are things like Lupron and Elegard and um, Degarelix, et cetera. They were, they could be shown to replace castration. And uh, uh, Dr. Shelley won the Nobel Prize in 1977 for that. And then came this whole class of androgen receptor drugs, uh, flutamide now to the most current, uh, apalutamide or uh, darolutamide. And the Labrie hypothesis was that you could improve upon castration. And although Ferdinand Labrie uh, from uh, Quebec uh, was criticized heavily he, he understood intrinsically that there were more ways to treat prostate cancer than just castration. And so many kudos should still be given to Dr. Labrie for his pioneering and sometimes controversial work. And then came the discovery that the cancer cells produce their own androgens. And that's Bruce Montgomery's work and other people's work. Um, and ultimately, there are now trials which show you live longer and better when you give oral drugs. Um, and there's um, two and a half trials, I guess, about three trials uh, that show that when you give chemotherapy to uh, LHR agonists, uh, you live longer and better. So we have all this data that says you need to do more than Lupron, and we want to make certain that we understand that. So oh, this is just one picture taken from a paper by Dr. Scher many years ago, 16 years ago, showing that as castrate, as cancer goes down the Mississippi uh, from the right-hand side uh, to the left-hand side, the cancer cells make bigger sales. They make more um, collection devices so that they can use the male hormone to grow and move faster. And you see this very simply um, in the blue is the early cancer, but toward the end of the side is when we get what we call castrate resistant prostate cancer. Those cells overexpress the AR protein, they overexpress the AR mRNA, uh, they increase the DNA copy number, they increase 
androgen synthesis. So everything is pushing the cancer to grow faster and faster. So your cancer at the beginning of the disease process, way up in Minnesota or wherever it is you join the Mississippi, by the time you get down to the uh, Gulf of Mexico, there is a huge push to move this cancer faster and faster with the available androgen receptors. Can I ask you a question? Sure. There, sometimes I liken it to, when you show that side, sometimes I, I talk to the public or patients about, is this a good analogy? It's almost as if the cancer evolves and it evolves and has more mutations. It does what it can to survive. But even though you throw drugs at it, it develops resistance or it no longer responds to that drugs. Is a good analogy antibiotic resistance as the disease advances, it suddenly becomes resistant to X, Y, and Z, and you have to move on to something else? Or is that really not a way to look at when the, when the, when the cancer becomes metastatic and has all these new receptors or mutations, is, is, that, is there a different way of looking at it than looking at it similarly or analogously to antibiotic resistance? I think it's a good analogy. The, uh, uh, the, the bacteria uh, no longer uh, are killed by antibiotics and you have to switch to a different antibiotic. And that's the same thing with a drug like abiraterone. When we, uh, when we first developed abiraterone, uh, this was the very earliest paper. And if you look at it, you see that uh, n the, the blue and the yellow lines going below uh, the axis were patients uh, who benefited from um, abiraterone. And at the time, uh, ketoconazole, a fungal medicine, to use your analogy of antibiotics, was used for prostate cancer, and it worked. But here we had a drug that was an, an analog of ketoconazole, an antibiotic, if you will, uh, that suddenly was working for prostate cancer, even if they had prior ketoconazole. Um, and it particularly worked for pr no prior ketoconazole. So the analogy actually, Mark, is very apt. Um, it is a, a chemical, better living through chemistry, and that's what antibiotics do. You, you develop antibiotics to fight the resistance, and that's what the first, first abiraterone studies were. It was a ketoconazole analog that was better than ketoconazole. Can I add an asterisk to that since we're on that topic and then I'll let you go again for a while because sure. this comes up all the time. So that, so that makes me feel good that for 30 years I've been using the word antibiotic resistance and I'm not off my rocker. However, mm -hmm. I do know that when you have antibiotic resistance, you remove the antibiotic. But what's different in cancer is patients are always trying to figure out and, and docs are always trying to figure out, even though you might have resistance, you keep the drug that you no longer are responding to in place. For example, most of your trials in CRPC, patients continue their LHRH. They continue on that drug, right? So can you explain that issue? Because in antibiotic resistance, we no, you no longer give that antibiotic, the person's resistance to it. But in cancer, a number of drugs, including hormone therapy, even when you stop responding to it, the doctors like you say, you gotta stay on it. Yeah. Well, uh, Mark, again, uh, you're, you're right on. This is a dogma that may not uh, stand the test of science. When, when the cancer becomes resistant, it may not matter that we keep going on Lupron. And in fact, I've become very liberal in stopping Lupron in these patients because the, the, the negative effects of uh, testosterone uh, depletion therapy are ubiquitous. I mean, these, they, no testosterone hurts people. It makes them weak, it makes them fat, it makes their joints ache, um, it gives them a risk of falls, it affects their cognition. So many of us are trying to think about what happens. Does the cancer really need to be um, treated with Lupron as, at, as the cancer advances. Um, and much of this is propagated by clinical trials because yeah. they just automatically say, keep going on Lupron. Much of it is propagated by the FDA because they're risk adverse. They don't want to take that risk. And I always tell my patients, look, let's stop Lupron. Um, if your testosterone goes up, 
Um, we can always give you a single shot and see if it changes the natural history of the disease. So I'm very uh, willing to stop Lupron in many of my patients. I have never heard. I have never heard an oncologist admit that before. I just really? wrote that down. never, really? never because everybody wants to follow the protocol, which is whether I understand in clinical trials, you know, they want you to stay on LHRH, but I haven't really heard recently that the idea of staying on it. I understand there's a little bit of data to suggest you go after ten testosterone sensitive cells, but it's very preliminary, kind of weak, anemic data. And so I've not heard someone say, hey, this might actually be challenged because it's not just LHRH. We can talk about this as you go along. People ask me all the time, what happens when I fail abiraterone or what happens when I fail Enza or Nubeca or Lee? The bottom line is that this may not require us to be so dogmatic about Lupron. And in fact, Lupron may be a negative and it may accelerate death. Uh, you need your strength. You need your, your intellect when you fight this. And when you're testosterone depleted, that is never a good thing. It, it is a dogma that needs to be uh, addressed. And uh, there's a fellow by the name of uh, Chaudhry at uh, uh, Harvard who is, uh, along with Mary Ellen Taplin, are beginning to question that dogma. Um, and I, I think it's, it's long overdue. And I, I strongly support that, uh, that uh, idea. Um, so uh, one other slide before we get off this topic. So when, uh, and this is a very early slide, again, uh, from Howard Scher. So when you develop an androgen receptor inhibitor, uh, in this case, it was enzalutamide, it was, a, it was so obvious that this was an effective treatment. Look at this. There are 65 patients chemo-naive, 75 patients who'd had chemotherapy, and the blue lines always go down except for a small number of patients. This means that the uh, androgen receptors are still driving the cancer, and you can still inhibit them. It's for this reason that this idea of Lupron um, and stopping it is not without um, controversy, because you can definitely see um, re, uh, sort of a reactivation of the castration sensitive cancer cells if you do stop the Lupron. So it's a judgment call, um, but bottom line is that these patients do benefit from these androgen receptor uh, therapies. So I'm going to summarize the way the early uh, hormone sensitive uh, castration prostate cancer, that's what that stands for, uh, summarized the current treatment. So for um, hormone-sensitive disease, androgen receptor al alone, that is Lupron or uh, surgical castration or with biclutamide, is no longer a good option um, unless there's significant comorbidities, the patient is very elderly, et cetera. Um, the second generation anti-androgens, um, we call them androgen axis inhibitors, abiraterone, enzalutamide, and apalutamide will significantly delay time to castrate resistant disease. Basically, what I'm saying is they keep you moored um, at St. Louis. They don't, let your, don't, they don't let your raft drift down. And they do, in fact, delay and improve your survival, both in low volume and in high volume disease. The same thing, though, can be said for chemotherapy that chemotherapy also delays the time that you have to float further down the river. Now, there's, a, there's debate about whether this effect is only in low-volume disease or high-volume disease, and we divide low and high volume based upon the number of spots on the bone scan to the number of lymph nodes, uh, or whether, it, whether you jump into the river at Mississippi or whether you jumped into the river at St. Louis, um, or excuse me, Minnesota or St. Louis. Uh, but there is no debate that it that it works. So what many oncologists are now doing is they're starting with docetaxel, and then they are giving the third drug, maintenance, abiraterone uh, or enzalutamide. That's what I've more or less evolved to. Um, Merck 991 is doing a very creative thing, um, and they're 
taking patients who've had six cycles of chemotherapy, and then they're giving everyone enzalutamide, and half of those patients are getting a fourth drug, uh, namely pembrolizumab. So you might imagine that if we go back to the time of Charlie Huggins, we started with just one drug, taking away your testosterone. Then with Labrie, we took away two. Uh, now we have a better second, and now there's debate about three drugs right at the very beginning, and more and more, we're talking about four drugs um, at the very beginning of therapy. Um, and remember that we cure childhood leukemia uh, with four to eight drugs. Hmm. So it may be that there's some logic there. So I tell my urologist, when do you refer a hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patient? To an, um, to an oncologist? Well, it's not clear, but certainly um, you, you, those patients should come when they have high volume disease. They certainly should come when they're young, if they have a genetic background, or if they're African American. All of those patients um, are, are warrant more intensive therapy. The, high, the low volume, older, um, more pa patients who need gentle treatment can easily stay with the urologist. So that's sort of a quick summary of that whole field. Hopefully I've made a little bit of an understanding. So when does a patient become castrate refractory? Um, and, and this again, I, I hate to keep banging on that analogy of the Mississippi River, but this is when you're getting you know, to when the, the cancer no longer is benefited with hormone therapy. Um, and the definition is very simple. It's when the testosterone level is, more, is less than 50 and uh, the PSA uh, is rising. Now, there's a caveat there, and that is that some cancer cells grow without making PSA. So you have to be careful not to make the mistake and say, huh, well, your PSA is not rising even though you have back pain. That must that must be arthritis. No, that could be cancer making a non-PSA uh, type uh, statement. So you need to refer the patient whenever there is a rising PSA and the testosterone is low, but even in some cases that dogma does not hold true. You know, there's been buzz. I don't want to interrupt too much because we still have a lot of questions and I told you, I come from the old school where you're really deferential to the senior attending or the senior doc. And then when the talk's over, then you can grill him with questions. But you, during the talk, you have to be deferential. But when you say less than 50, remember, we've been discussing now for a decade or longer. Should that number be changed to 20 or? Yeah, 30? yeah. That, there, there's a recent paper uh, from Canada suggesting that uh, the lower uh, the, the testosterone, the better. Um, and um, that may well be the case. Uh, remember that abiraterone brings the, the testosterone level to less than, zero, less than one. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so, uh, in fact, I, I edit uh, something called Up to Date, um, and Nancy Dawson has been charged with trying to answer that question of, is there really an important role for uh, measuring the testosterone level to a level below zero or near zero, yeah. Um, and is that a is that a valid point? And, and it may be, um, it may be that we should tend to want to drive the PSA uh, to zero, just like we should drive the testosterone to zero. So my young uh, African American patient with a BRCA mutation the other day, he's achieved a PSA of 0.3, yeah. and I said, you know, not good enough. I want it at zero. Um, the goal is a PSA of zero, and potentially um, the, the testosterone also should have a, a target goal, and potentially that goal should be zero. So again, new data not fully defined yet. Maha Hussein and the SWAG were the ones who defined getting the PSA to zero is a very important point. Uh, that is not understood well by most patients. Yeah. And by most docs. Well, it goes to your history slide of Huggins. I, you remember the time period where 
someone would go on like a, someone would go on a Lupron or an LHRH, and then in other parts of the world they would add in some cases or just go on estrogen, some type of estrogen therapy like a oh, DES. Right. And then we thought, oh, DES works for when people fail LHRH. But in reality, what I was seeing in the trials is that estrogen therapy being added to Lupron or something else just brought the testosterone level closer to zero. So maybe, right? right am I right about that? So really, right. it wasn't some magical drug. It was just bringing the testosterone a little further and making us feel better about ourselves for a moment. It also was, uh, you know, a, a way sort of like the... Uh, poor man's heavy rataron or yeah. poor man's uh, uh, enzalutamide. Uh, you know, Ferdinand Labrie gave, a, gave the world a lot of controversy. There were nearly 25 trials that were spawned trying to prove or refute his hypothesis. And ultimately, he proved to be right. Uh, but it wasn't based upon adding flutamide. Uh, or adding nilutamide or adding uh, something else. It, the idea was that these cancer cells upregulate their androgen receptor, and even a very low level of testosterone uh, may be enough to drive those androgen receptor sales that we talked about. So, really interesting. Yeah. All right, ready to go? Ready to go. All right, so tumor progression. So when uh, prostate cancer starts to grow, you start drifting down river again. Um, what generally happens is that the androgen receptor is somehow involved. There's a 20% of the time it's not involved, but about 80% there, the androgen receptor is involved. And here's a list of all six different ways that the androgen receptor uh, can be um, involved. One is just by the sale theory. It gets overexpressed. The sales get bigger, catching only a little bit of wind. Um, the other way is that the androgen receptors um, actually become better. They make a better sale. Um, they, uh, you know, if you've seen these sailboats on the uh, oceans, they have these very the jibs and so on. Very interesting uh, uh, structures that the wind can catch more readily. And then you have this increased androgen receptor ligand expression. Uh, this, this is a, a bit like uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the tissues around the prostate actually make uh, testosterone for the sales. They inflate the sales. And then there's other things that get very deep into the biochemistry about co-activators, because remember, the sail itself has to send the power to the um, engine, to the DNA, and that power can be amplified by what's called co-activators. And then there's totally uh, what we call ligand-independent receptor activation. That is, the sails don't even need to be there. They just simply are stimulated by certain hormone-type drugs um, and and it, it gets very unique and very good chemistry. And, and we try to figure it out, and we sometimes do and sometimes can't. Um, but ultimately, the vast majority of prostate cancer cells are going to use androgen in, in ways that are uh, adverse to the patient. And, and that's why, Mark, to go back to your previous point about Lupron, it makes all of us worry that even a little bit of testosterone can be bad. Um, so when I give a patient testosterone um, after they've been cured of their prostate cancer, you know, it always, in the back of my mind, I'm going, is this safe? Um, and I do it a lot. I give a lot of patients testosterone once you they've do. been cured I, all the time. You do. And you, I do. don't you shake in your boots every time you agree to it? I, I, I have an engineer who has grilled me three times. Yeah. And George, I love you much, but he gave me the hardest time in the world. And he would say yes and then say no and then say yes and say no. And finally, he, he, but he was gaining weight and feeling miserable and he was, his joints were hurting and he couldn't lose weight. <laughs> and finally, he said, he took it and he said, man, I feel so much better. So, you know, there's a certain element of, just simple quality of life too. But remember, he's been cured. 
Yeah. He's not in the river. But um, don't you worry? Don't you worry if someone's a testosterone of 200 and they used to be at 500 and they're just hanging out between 150 and 200 and you think they've been cured It's four or five years later, just give me a little bit more. I want to take it to 300 or 400. Don't you worry there's one little cell hanging out just thinking, give me a little more gasoline. Just give me a little more test. Don't you think that? I just yeah, had that three days ago. Yeah, it worries me too. But you know what? Um, it, it's like Paul Lang, a good friend of mine from Washington uh, State, used to say, this is, a test, this is a prostate cancer stress test. If you've got prostate cancer in your body and you've had testosterone, it's, it, it, and if it's going to come back, it's going to come back, whether your testosterone is 100 or 200 or 400. I think, yeah, I think that makes sense. I just think, you know, you, ha you deal with some really aggressive cancers, you know, Gleason 9s, 10s that hang out on that side of the spectrum, which are so aggressive. And when they've been cured, you really think if it ain't broke, why am I trying to fix anything, right? And so these are the guys who will say, I just want a little testosterone. And it's, I'm, it's, I just... But, but the point... Uh, Mark, you just died on me again. The point, though, is that it is broken. They do feel miserable. Their, their weight, I mean, George's weight was up to 283 pounds. He, he was a hiker. He used to climb every mountain that he could. And, you know, his joints wouldn't let him do it. His muscles wouldn't let him do it. So ultimately, you make the decision that testosterone is a, um, a good thing for the patient. Yes, in the back of your mind, there's always an element of bad. Uh, it could be a risk, but look, we all take risks. We live in the day of COVID now. Uh, everything we do has risk to it, and we're going to have to just accept some risks. No question about that. But there's also, there are also those patients that complain about the side effects of low testosterone, and you wonder if you get rid of the side effect they're complaining about the most then you don't have to give them that extra testosterone. For example, annoying hot flashes. So I see what you're saying, but man, if you, if you don't mind giving a little testosterone to someone, to someone you think you've cured, then that makes me and the rest of the world feel better. So thank you for that therapy. Yeah, see, you gotta remember, Mark, that if you're not in the river, if you're not in the, 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 the progressive prostate cancer, your, your testosterone is safe. It's a good, helpful drug. Um, it's part of our natural physiology. If you're in the river, it's dangerous. But even there, Johns Hopkins just recently reported that high dose testosterone, flooding the, can the body with testosterone, slows down the cancer so yeah. that it may, it may screw up the sails. You never know. Yeah. And, and this is stuff that is not clearly uh, negative uh, in majority of patients. There's been a lot of myth about this. Don't give testosterone, it's terrible. Well, you know, I've been around long enough to not be so worried about that myth. There's a lot of myths in this field, let me tell you. All right, uh, looks like we lost Mark again. I'm gonna keep going. Um, so what is a urologist supposed to do? Or I should just substitute there to say, What's the patient to Basically, do? I know. I think that you talked some people off the ledge a little bit there, including myself, because uh, you know how ugly this disease gets. And when you're able to get to calm waters and you're still way up the river, you're feeling pretty good. It, it's exactly right. And, and there is time for the use of testosterone. I, I will, I'll just recount Sam briefly. Sam is a patient who is at the clearly in New Orleans, you know, everything I'd done, I couldn't keep him out of the Gulf of Mexico. And, uh, I, and I just gave him high dose testosterone and he was on it for a year. Um, and he, he felt much better. Yeah. He had, the cancer didn't stop. PSA stayed high at 1500, but he felt better. He could work again. He had a, a good emotional life and his muscles came back. So at some point you just say, look, it's okay to do testosterone, even if you're on the Mississippi River. All right, let's go uh, to the next slide and talk about what is a patient or a urologist to do after castrate resistance develops. So if you've got 
um, if you've gone through all the, the story of looking and trying to find cancer and you discover it in the lymph nodes of the bones, um, and if they've already had an Abby or an Enza type drug, you re-image um, and you look for what we call oligomets and you measure the testosterone. If the only spot you see is in the bone um, and you could use radium, if the only spot you see are in the lymph nodes, um, you could use Provenge. Um, you should definitely test for the DNA repair enzymes um, and you could use an alternative uh, anti-androgen. Um, for example, if you used abiraterone first line, you could use enzalutamide second line. Don't expect a lot though. And, or you could use chemotherapy. So this is a classic thing to do. Now, if the patient or the doctor finds out that your PSA is rising, but they can find no metastases, um, then you need to re-image. Um, and you, we use the PSMA scans, or in some cases, the Blue Earth um, Axman scan, and look for just limited numbers of metastatic sites. And then we radiate them, um, if possible. And um, uh, we would then begin um, either enzalutamide, apalutamide, or darolutamide. And again, we make certain that you're tested for uh, germline uh, mutations or somatic mutations. Now, if you were metastatic at diagnosis, you jumped into the river at, in Minnesota and the doctor gave you chemotherapy right away uh, and you've not had a prior androgen receptor inhibition, then the world's your oyster. Uh, your median survival is long, um, three and a half years at least, if not longer. Uh, you re-image, you make certain that there's not much that you would want to radiate. And if the bone is the disease, uh, you can use Abby or Enza and follow it up with Provenge or Radium. And again, test for DNA repair deficiencies. You're beginning to get a theme here. Now, uh, if METs were at diagnosis, if the patient walked into Mississippi at St. Louis and the doctor said, we're going to throw everything at you, chemotherapy, and uh, hormone therapy, secondary, including androgen resistant, androgen receptor, and your androgen receptor resistant, then Houston, we have a problem. Um, this is a, a bad cancer. Uh, we, again, we re-image, we make certain that we don't have it anywhere else, or if it's only in a few places we use radiation. We use Provenge or radium if it's bone dominant. Um, we test for DNA repair deficiencies again, making certain that we know. And then you use a drug like cabazitaxel. <clears throat> so it, it all depends on what's gone before. And that's why I take a long and careful history. Um, you, you always need to know what exactly was done, when it was done, for how long was the drug given, and what is the likely uh, evolution of the cancer. So again, Mark, we're talking about how does the cancer evolve um, and it, the evolution is a result of what went before. That's what the definition of evolution is. <laughs> you evolve from something to something else. So you always need to know what was done before, how long were you on it, how much pressure, how much uh, evolutionary pressure was put on the cancer, um, and what you do that is not part of that evolutionary pressure. Okay, so um, we'll move on. Now, here's, madness. say again, Mark? But there's a method to the madness. There is. Um, and then, uh, now this is um, for urologists. I remember I gave this lecture to uh, UCLA urologists. And the top 10 tips, <laughs> and you see number one, Mark, is to continue <laughs> LHR agonist. I love it. Can I interrupt you for a second? Absolutely. But I want the audience to know, and I'm going to reinforce this in my introduction, and I'm going to reinforce this again after uh, Dr. Vogelzang leaves us, is that Dr. Vogelzang had a number of lectures he wanted to give that he's given recently to very uh, impressive audiences. The reason why I wanted him to give the same lecture to you, who's out there right now in YouTube and other land, is that I wanted to give the same lecture that he gives the doctors, so you see the lecture he gives. And I thought many of the patients today are so well-versed. Of course, some of them have to come along and learn more. They have such a strong foundation. 
that the idea of giving them the same lecture that you give to the urologist and the doctors shows a for those people who are relearning the disease this is a good slide set that you can constantly review and you can constantly review the tape in order to improve your knowledge so there was a purpose in you giving the same talk to the patients that you gave to the doctors that's all i wanted to say yeah and i've done this for many years i i firmly believe that patients should know what doctors say and what doctors teach each other uh, yeah. because then then they learn from the doctor's experience so we generally say continue the lhrh agonist because we don't want testosterone to rise um, we always say uh, to the urologist monitor the psa rate of rise um, if there's a slow rate of rise if the doubling time is more than 12 months you're you're in a slow part of the mississippi you don't need to worry so much. Uh, take your time. If you want to take a three-month break, do so. Um, if your bone scan and your CT scan are negative, um, consider the PSMA scan. Um, you could also test for uh, these uh, abnormal androgen receptor variants. This one is ARV7. Um, if the patient is ARV7 negative, um, the uh, second line enzalutamide or apalutamide may work, um, but if it's positive, that means that the uh, cancer is resistant to a great extent to these te as testosterone-like drugs, and then you should consider chemotherapy. Um, if you've used abiraterone first line, enzalutamide is very unlikely to be effective second line, although a lot of doctors do it. Um, you should always test for DNA repair deficiency. This is important. Um, it, it's not just important for knowing what you can pass down to your children, uh, but it's also important now for the patient because we now have two drugs uh, that we use in this uh, particular subset of patients. The other thing we should always remember is that you need to continue on your bone drugs. Uh, the lack of testosterone always reduces your bone strength. Um, so generally, we say continue your bone drugs, either denosumab or zoledronic acid. Probably don't need to do it every month. Um, most of us are pretty comfortable doing it every three months. There is a side effect called ONJ, which affects the jaw, and um, that can occur, and you then need to stop those drugs. Um, I, I tell people to not forget Provenge. Provenge is a urology drug and also a medical oncology drug, and it's an immune stimulator. And uh, three studies all have shown that Provenge prolongs life. It doesn't lower the PSA, and it's very frustrating to patients. They say, well, how come, it, how come you give it to me if it doesn't lower the PSA? But I would remind you that PSA does not necessarily prove the presence or absence of cancer activity. Uh, it may be affecting the stem cells. Who knows? And uh, the other two uh, last lines are as follows. Radium uh, is a highly effective drug when bone mets are present. And you always have to give it with bone health drugs uh, because it pushes the uh, radium into the bones. Um, and if you give it with abiraterone or enzalutamide and uh, don't use a bone health agents, you get a fracture rate of 20 to 30%. So you have to give all three drugs. If, if you're going to do three drugs, Radium, denosumab, and if you're going to be uh, giving enzalutamide or apalutamide together with that, give them all three together. And then lastly, I'm, I try to explain to patients and to doctors that chemotherapy is not evil. It's not anything to be avoided. Um, it is part of the journey. Um, we're good at it. We've been doing this for decades, and um, it can be highly effective. The fellow that I told you about at the very top of the uh, lecture, namely the one who floated down the Mississippi, um, his PSA um, at, uh, about a year ago was 75. Um, he'd already had both docetaxel and cabazitaxel. Doug is agreeing with me, by the way. Um, and uh, his PSA uh, last uh, Friday uh, was two. Um, after another 10 doses of cabazitaxel. So you can reuse these drugs um, without causing undue side effects. 
So those are some of the tips that we use. Um, and we try to get uh, sort of a, a, a less fear um, uh, into the patients and into the referring doctors' uh, ways. So Mark, I'm about done now. I'm gonna move on to a slightly different, um, slightly different topic. Namely, when to use abiraterone or enzalutamide. It's the study called Prophecy. Do um, you have any questions at this point? You feel well, you're going to talk about this ARV7 test. I guarantee you, a lot yeah. of people. Uh, you're going to, yeah. A lot of people watching this have probably never even either heard or had that test. So my question yeah. is: Do you feel confident enough in the data that if the ARV7 test is positive, which suggests you might not benefit from so the ARV7 study that I found to be very helpful was this one. Uh, this one uh, is uh, from uh, 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 the Prophecy study. And what they did was they took patients who already had um, abiraterone or enzalutamide, and they did the ARV7 test. They did it either a yes or a no. Either you had a positive test uh, or a negative test, or they didn't do a test. That's the best thing you can do is not do a test sometimes. If they were positive, um, they got chemotherapy because theoretically the test predicts for resistance. If they were negative, they could get an androgen receptor uh, therapy. And then if there was, if they didn't do the ARV7 test, they could get whatever the doctor chose. So the results were uh, here. If you, uh, so if, if you have the high ARV7 level and you have a low volume of disease, uh, you're, it's not a good thing. Uh, even though you don't have a lot of cancer, the low ARV7 are um, excuse me, high ARV7 means that your cancer is no longer likely to benefit from hormone therapy. And you're going to be stuck to basically recommend chemotherapy more often. And this is what Dr. Sad said, uh, that if you have a, uh, this, this ARV7 uh, and you have high volume of disease, you have to begin chemotherapy sooner rather than later. If you have it in the liver or the lungs, you probably should begin chemo. If you're symptomatic, if you're losing weight, you should begin chemotherapy. Um, if you've had very short response to hormone therapy, you should begin chemotherapy. Um, if you have a high LDH, um, if you have an high ALK-FOS, uh, or even more, um, uh, more sophisticated, if you have high circulating tumor cell count, all of these are recommendations for the use of chemotherapy. Remember, I was giving this talk to urologists who, would, who are always trying to avoid giving chemotherapy, um, but the same thing holds for patients. They don't want chemotherapy, and they go, I don't want chemo. Well, here's what a urologist, Dr. Sad, said. Namely, here's your reasons to get chemotherapy. This is when a urologist recommends chemotherapy. So, it works to have an algorithm, and that's what I carry around in my head. I, I look at every patient individually and say, mm, are you ready for chemo yet? Uh, I don't know. And I go down this checklist. If you have a lot of disease and a low PSA, if you have 20 spots in your bones and your PSA is only eight, uh, I'm a little nervous about that. That means that you're male hormone is not driving that cancer. So we can all make these sort of subtle decisions, but ultimately, you, if, you're, if you absolutely fear chemotherapy, this may be some way to help you understand when to use it. Um, one, of, one of the issues that we just finished talking about was the role of chemotherapy. When do you go to chemotherapy? Um, and when do you stay with androgen receptor inhibition? Um, and there are new ways to develop androgen receptor uh, therapy. Um, and uh, this slide lists them. Uh, there was a big study looking at dual uh, androgen receptor inhibition, abiraterone and enzalutamide, 
that was a negative trial. So double blockade uh, doesn't work. The other thing uh, that we've learned is that the second androgen receptor uh, used back to back is rarely effective, but it's rare, but yet it does sometimes work. So you have to always have that in the back of your mind. Um, there are more reliable formulations for abiraterone, better absorption. Uh, the University of Chicago, Mark Rutain's work and Walt Stadler's work is that when you take one uh, abiraterone a day with a meal, it appears equivalent to taking four a day with an empty stomach. Uh, so here's a little bit of activity there, maybe some improvement. Um, and then there's a, a new uh, androgen receptor degrader uh, from our vinus. Um, there's a uh, N-terminal uh, domain inhibitor uh, from a company called ESA. Um, there are um, uh, certain inhibitors that are potent, uh, more potent. Um, Tracon was developed and they've dropped out of the race. Uh, the L790R, I think it is. Kintor has one drug. It's a Chinese drug that may still have traction. <clears throat> And then um, combining um, uh, PARP inhibitors um, with androgen receptor inhibitors um, may be a, a, a valuable step. And I'll just briefly uh, touch on those before we get to the next. So oliparib combined with abiraterone, um, there's a lot of what we call crosstalk between the androgen receptor and DNA repair. What does androgen receptor do? It stimulates DNA's uh, DNA. That's why you get muscles, because your muscles grow when you're on androgen receptor. So there's a lot of this uh, crosstalk. And in fact, if you look at um, uh, this color picture, uh, uh, it, it shows that on the, the top row, um, the uh, androgen receptor depletion upregulates PARP therapy and down regulation down regulates part therapy so you may want to get some ideas going in fact the uh, uh the study that's underway is um uh, this one namely oliparib with or without abby or excuse me abby radarone with or without oliparib so again ways to make an older drug as we know, abiraterone is now generic, uh, potentially making it more effective by combining it uh, with uh, liparib. Now, there was a smaller earlier trial which did not show any benefit. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Hussein. So it may not be a viable approach, uh, but it is definitely something that needs to be looked at. So what do we do for men with bad disease. African-American men generally tend to have um, some adverse features, and it's always worth keeping them as a separate category, even though we're talking in this time of racial justice. Uh, there are some very genetic, different, different genetic issues that African-American men have to deal with, and one is that they're less sensitive to androgen receptor inhibition. Um, they're perhaps more sensitive to taxane therapies. Um, this is work from Dr. Halaby, um, and we may need to give more chemo to them and less AR. Androgen receptor men have, uh, may have more DNA uh, mutations, and therefore they may be more sensitive to platinum or PARP inhibition, and they may be more sensitive to Provenge, and we need specific trials looking at African-American men uh, given uh, checkpoint inhibitors. One of the studies was a checkpoint inhibitor was pembrolizumab. Uh, this study, Keynote 199, was recently reported uh, and published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, if, if you look at this, you, you, I don't want you to look at every detail. You can look at it offline. You see a, a small number of patients to the very left bottom of the screen show benefit. These are men where the cancer shrinks by more than 90%. Um, and, and right now, we don't know quite how to identify those men. Uh, this study, however, was done in Europe. Uh, it was not done in the United States. Um, and therefore, the study was vast numbers 
of men were Caucasians. Very few were African Americans. And that was one of the criticisms leveled at the study. Namely, it did not um, take into account ethnic variation very well. So, but you do see this. Um, this is an example uh, of x rays, the shrinkage of the cancer. Pembrolizumab definitely has activity. It's safe in the majority of patients. It seems to work across a variety of men, but not in a very high number. Um, so we, we will simply say that um, there are new drugs that are available. Um, there's a continuum. The river begins with hormone-sensitive disease and ends with castrate-resistant disease. This process may take decades, um, but it is generally inevitable if the men live long enough. And there are certain things we know, namely starting with metastatic disease, starting with high volume disease is bad. It may, it, it's quite clear that if we, we can delay time to castrate resistant disease by adding dostaxel or abi enza apalutamide, uh, additional drugs, adding three or four drugs, may further delay the time to castrate resistant disease. There may be windows of time during which they're off therapy. Men can actually be cancer free, PSA zero, testosterone normal. Um, but once the men get into uh, the castrate resistant disease state, uh, this death process can be delayed. Cabazitaxel, uh, Cipulus LT, radium, PARP inhibitors, all these agents should be used. Um, there are other agents which are not as um, widely used. They include platinums, checkpoint inhibitors, others. There's this new bite therapy. There's this new lutetium therapy. So men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer should be referred for new clinical trials. We have many of them available, and hopefully uh, men will be able to participate in them. I'm going to talk briefly now, Mark, about uh, the... Um, uh, the uh, PSMA scan, there are several of them. This study was reported by Mike Morris um, from uh, Sloan Kettering. It's called the Condor Study. Uh, we heard about it just for the first time in, um, at ASCO in uh, beginning of June. And uh, previous data suggested this scan is better than any other type of scan. Um, and there are several variants of this PSMA scan. One is the fluoride scan. That's what this one talks about. The one at UCLA is a gallium scan, and there are other radioactive uh, ligands being used. Um, and what this was done was, this study was done to help the FDA approve uh, these scans. They're not approved in the United States right now. You have to pay cash to get this done. And Condor uh, was the one that was reported. And um, I just wanna show you the, the development plan for Condor, um, there's another set of studies called Osprey. Um, I guess they have a thing about birds of prey. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, the uh, Condor looked specifically at men who had been on uh, LHR agonist. And, and what it basically means is that you, you take a, 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 a small molecule you, you link it, you take that F18 and you link it to a uh, PSMA scan. The PSMA binds to prostate cancer and you then image the cancer uh, with the radioactivity emitted by the fluoride molecule. And what the Condor study did was looked at a very select group of men, men whose PSA was rising, who'd already had radiation, who'd had or had cryotherapy or who'd had surgery and their PSA was rising above a certain point and they had a variety of uh, lists here. And they did what is called a composite standard of truth assay. Namely, they, they looked at biopsies or they looked at conventional imaging or they looked at confirmed PSA and they said, this is truth. Um, and what, what they found essentially was that this scan um, clearly outperformed um, anything else. And more importantly, the scan was sensitive to very low levels of PSA. 
by the time your PSA got to be 0.5, which is very low, 40% of patients uh, could be detected by this uh, technology. And if your PSA was over five, on the left-hand side of the screen, 96% of men could have their cancer detected. So this is really amazing technology. And uh, essentially, it changes the way we think about this cancer. It, it allows us to use radiation more uh, efficiently. It allows us to uh, use hormone therapy more efficiently. And for a small number, it allows us to say there's no cancer that we can find. Uh, this is a PSA um, a false positive or something like that. So um, we, we had a good result from this study. And uh, bottom line is that um, it uh, demonstrated excellent diagnostic performance. It's superior to standard staging. And this should give the FDA reason to approve this scanning technology, uh, hopefully this year. Uh, we're expecting it literally within months. So um, although the FDA has its hands full with COVID, hopefully this will not be delayed. So that's uh, where we can end. I have other slides, uh, Mark, if you'd like to talk about Aliparib and other things, but uh, what would you like to go to next? I think I just want to go through a, a bucket list. Okay. I don't know if I want to use that term, but bucket list is just, you know, I just want to go through my A to Z list of what else. If I have, if I have uh, Dr. Vogelzang stuck in a Zoom for two hours, what do I want to ask him besides the name of his dog? So, uh, do you mind if I just start throwing out some of these? Nope, I'm, I'm more than happy. All the rest of my slides are about oliparib and PARP inhibition and but, DNA and so on. So you're free to now go over anything else I've but, said before. But I'll tell you what, this slide you have up right now, yep. this is a great way to end it. These are the two drugs out there that p patients can potentially get. There are others coming down the pipeline. Do you mind explaining these two PARP drugs and just where they are and what this specific slides mean without having to go into too much more detail? No, I, I will. So this is the NCCN guidelines. These were updated just this year. Um, and in May, uh, middle of May, um, these two drugs were approved. Oliparib, can you explain, sorry, can you explain NCC guidelines and their importance in, in our world? Sure. Um, NCCN is National Cooperative Cancer Network. It's a group of about 20 or 25 major cancer centers. Um, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering, MD Anderson, Mayo Clinic, uh, Duke, uh, you know, UCSF, et cetera. They're, and they get together a couple times a year and they grind these, uh, these guidelines out. And they say, this is what doctors should do for prostate cancer. Docs make, don't just make decisions uh, willy-nilly. I mean, we, we have guidelines. And the guidelines says that for men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer who have a pathogenic mutation, I'm quoting from the first bullet point, of, and then a long list of genes, uh, this drug is an option, oliparib. It's an oral drug. It's similar to chemo, but it's oral. And then the second bullet point is rucaparib is a treatment option for men with pathogenic BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And the difference between these two drugs is that oliparib went through a, um, a phase three trial and showed the benefit in all of those subtypes. Rucaparib, another pill from a different company, went through only a phase two, and they only had results from BRCA1 or BRCA2. Now, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are genes that cause breast cancer, um, and a variety of other cancers, melanoma, pancreas cancer, uh, ovarian cancer in women and men. Uh, but in men with a BRCA, the most common cancer is prostate cancer. And these genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, account for about 15, 12 to 15% of all prostate cancer patients. If you put in all those other long list of genes, uh, ATM, BRARD, BRIP, all these things that nobody pays attention to, um, that accounts for about 20 to 25% of all men uh, with prostate cancer, um, and particularly with castrate-resistant prostate cancer, have one of those genes. You have to do it two ways. 
uh, you have to do it on the cancer itself and you have to do it in the saliva um, or blood. And um, it's a little tricky, and, but I do it now for almost every one of my patients. And uh, you, know, you pick it up uh, pretty regularly. And if you, don't, if you don't do it, you'll never know it because their behavior, except for being slightly younger, um, men who get these genes um, is really not different from regular prostate cancer. So it's, it's uh, hiding, uh, as they say, it's hiding in plain sight. <clears throat> right. Can I, ask, can I ask you about that? There's a, there's a bullet point uh, in, that, in that first, for the first bullet point, it says patients with PP, PPP2R2A mutations in this trial experienced an unfavorable risk benefit profile. Right. This is a, a subset, a subset. Um, subset, you know, subset, exactly. Subset, you know, this is a men with men who wear green suspenders shouldn't receive kisses from beautiful women uh, sort of attitude. You know, uh, it, it's like, yeah, okay. I don't think I've ever seen one of those cases. Um, okay. But it, it's one of those rare subtypes. So all these people qualify potentially for... I don't know why. I still call it olaparib because that's how it looks like it's pronounced to me or Limparza because the drug started out in ovarian cancer as Limparza right. as a trade name. I think patients know trade names better than generic names and actually a lot of doctors too. But So all these people might potentially benefit, but this specific mutation from this trial might not benefit, but we're really not sure if that's who that is and if that's true, right? Right. We had a, we had a meeting the other day with some experts and um, for example, when you looked at uh, Olaparib or Oliparib, uh, ATM, that third gene on the list, yeah. really didn't show much benefit. And, um, you know, you can subset it and say, well, you shouldn't bother with giving it to men with ATM mutations. Um, and those, that's the third most common subset. Uh, but, you know, this is where debate comes in. This is where the experts agree to disagree. Yeah. Um, um, but it, the most important thing you need to know is get yourself genetically tested. Yeah. And then you can argue about what to do. Uh, yeah. But first of all, get genetically tested. So can we stay on this slide before you uh, get rid of these slides just to sure. stay on the topic? Sure. If I interviewed you five years ago, I don't believe you, you would have said you test all your patients genetically for a somatic or germline mutation, now you say you test all of them, right? Is that that's right? Absolutely, that's true, exactly okay, true. So, let, let's, so I was talking to this guy the other night who was newly diagnosed, but had a lot of breast cancer in the family. So I began to wonder to myself just the other night, if we fast forward three to five years, are we gonna be testing everybody diagnosed? Because if you've got a strong family history of a hormonal type cancer, and you don't test someone that's newly diagnosed and they might have one of these genes. I mean, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, why wouldn't you test people even earlier? Why do we gotta wait till they're advanced? You don't, you don't. And in fact, that's what we're studying. Heather Chen um, at University of Washington and uh, SWOG are trying to do just that. We're trying to test uh, men with T3, T4 disease and then treat them early with uh, PARP inhibitors or platinum. Platinum double-strand DNA breaks. PARP inhibitors, double-strand DNA breaks. They break double-strand DNA. And, and so it's a very lethal event. Um, the, the problem with these drugs, if there is a problem, is they cause a lot of anemia, yeah. uh, they cause some nausea, and they cause um, uh, on about 1% or so of, of patients, uh, if treated long enough, get leukemia. So you, you, you gotta treat these with respect. Yeah. And that's why a lot of us are, you know, going at it, but not going at it with, with, a, with we're going at it with care. Um, we, we go, well, these are, these are good drugs, but uh, they're, they're not as easy to give as hormone therapy. Yeah, I was interviewing, we were interviewing at the beginning of the conference, uh, Lori Klotz, so you, we know we've been around together, all of us, 30 years. Yeah. And he started telling me in his active surveillance protocol that if it comes up in the history, you know, he'll test them because they're on active surveillance and maybe they could, maybe that's an idea to move to treatment. So he's starting to think about which ones to test. And I just began to think this past week, 
again, I just hate to say it. Why aren't we just looking to test, think about testing all these men if they're going to consider active surveillance or no treatment? And I don't know, is that, is that a crazy way of thinking? But shouldn't every patient just ask about genetic testing and whether or not he qualifies or she and other cancers? Yeah, yeah. So the, um, the ones we don't test are the grade group ones, Gleason 6. Uh, those are uh, very slow-growing cancers. Um, and and you, you, you just end up spending a lot of money uh, for no particular benefit. I mean, part of this is uh, cost-benefit. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's expensive to do these tests. Um, and a lot of the insurance companies are dragging their feet, um, particularly self-insured companies. Um, so they're, they're wanting to be cautious. And I, I still, to this day, get a lot of pushback when I try to order uh, genetic testing on prostate cancer patients. So at least if you're going to do it, you should do the ones who have somewhat worse disease, maybe a third uh, T3, T4 uh, node positive, certainly all metastatic disease patients yeah. and the guidelines are very clear on that that's good okay all right you want to uh x the slides out and we'll just finish off with sure. some questions sure here we're going to go through my what i call my alphabetical list and we're just going to randomly pick off things and some of them you'll think are completely wacky other ones you'll think are very cerebral let's talk about covid for a second sure i mean we haven't had a real pandemic in 100 years so how is covid now what do you tell patients about COVID-19 and prostate cancer? And are you holding off therapy? Are you thinking differently? Are you still, are you going to more telecalls or, I mean, what's the thought process here in COVID-19 and oncology? Well, let's keep it focused on prostate cancer. I, it's, it's too broad a topic to cover, but there was an Italian paper uh, recently published, I think two weeks ago, in the Annals of Oncology, suggesting that if you were on LHRH agonist therapy, uh, you're downregulating temperus to ERG, and as a result, your risk of prostate cancer, uh, men developing uh, COVID when they're on Lupron is four in about 5,000, or one in 1,000. So that was very encouraging. But then over the last two weeks, I've seen two prostate cancer patients who were on Lupron who had COVID. So the Italians may have gotten it wrong. Um, there are several studies looking at uh, bicalutamide um, as a um, alternative uh, to prevent COVID, um, but it does appear that Lupron has a protective effect on uh, COVID. So if, you're, if your testosterone is low, um, you're less likely to get COVID. And that goes along with this whole issue of men have a higher rate of getting COVID than uh, women. Right. Um, and so I'm not advocating castration for men to prevent COVID, uh, but, <laughs> but you get the trend. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen every possible drug off label and supplement that claims that it protects you against COVID. So I understand the mechanism of action with LHRH, but, it's also, I, I don't know if it protects you against COVID. One company called me and said, you know, maybe we should put everybody on these hair loss drugs that might downregulate that receptor too. And, and so it'll be interesting how this plays out. Isn't it theoretically possible too that in Italy and other places, men who are in LHRH weren't very active, they stayed inside and they didn't engage in risky behavior that possibly helped transmit socially the disease. Is, isn't there possible oh, oh, there's another oh, oh, explanation oh, yeah, for it yeah. besides oh. that? Of course, there's so many different uh, variables that they can't control. And so when I saw two guys in the last two weeks, both on LHRH agonists, both were, by the way, African-Americans and overweight, um, you know, it does call into question this idea that Lupron is protective. It may not be. They may yeah. have different uh, just exposure, ex uh, ex like you said. They may have just been sheltering in place more or just less active. That's right. And at the same time, the UK does a really great study in COVID-19. It was called the recovery trial. And they were one of the first to find that patients who were hospitalized might actually improve their survival on dexamethasone. So on a steroid. So a lot of your patients are on steroids. So maybe also you're giving them drugs that, you know, based on what we know about COVID-19, 
steroid use for more extreme disease could theoretically be helpful. So I just right. don't, I don't want patients to think they can't go into their prostate oncologist. There's also a lot of positive there of the drugs that they're getting that could also be neutral or helpful. Yeah, it's a very uh, dynamic uh, environment. I mean, really, you know, we're, we're, we're experiencing something that no one has ever experienced in the last hundred years, like you said. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, my brothers and I argue about whether masks are protective and, you know, my brothers are a bunch of brothers who are doctors. And so we, we sort of get into this mask thing and, you know, for now, why not just wear the mask? Stop being arrogant about it. Just wear a mask and, uh, you know, continue to socially isolate. Why should you wear a mask? Well, I mean, we don't have to wear seatbelts. Oh, yeah, that's right. We all have to okay. adhere to seatbelts. That's true. So you, maybe you should wear a mask. Yeah. You know, you know let's I, just... I don't, understand, I don't understand this. You know, when I talked to Lori, people don't understand. I, I asked him this question. It was, it was a softball question. Mm. But he gave a great answer. I said, look, I, I've been in Toronto. I, I see you every year in, uh, in Toronto. I go there to the group. Toronto is a very populated city. People stacked on each other. Why, why didn't we see a huge spread there? He said, all I'll tell you is the first moment we heard COVID-19, you couldn't find any controversy on masks and social distancing. Virtually everyone on the streets, in the hallways, already were adhering to masks and social distancing. And I thought that was interesting, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I it's, it's uh, America, United States has a unique and, and long history of being contrarian, uh, being rebels and uh, you know just we're we're just contrarian um, and and you know we're, we don't listen to one another we just argue all the time. I mean, but we're As, data, but we're data people, and you know we have to be humble in our craft, right? And right. What that means is, I was around in February and March when this thing was taking off, and most of your top doctors that I have worked with were saying, this, this might be like the flu, it's not so bad. The bottom line is, if I told you that when I interviewed you in August or September, we'd have almost 200,000 people dead within six to nine months, I don't know if there's a single person in the United States that was an expert that would have agreed with that. No, and so my I, point is, it's been a very humbling medical condition that, damn it, I wanna do everything possible to protect patients doctors and the public and if that means wearing a mask and social distancing for now until we get other research why not yeah it's 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 typical american though i saw a great ad i saw a picture in a, in a pub in england that said all americans must be accompanied by an adult <laughs> <laughs> i love america but th th this thing i just you know, I'm a public health guy. That's where I started. I mean, the idea of wearing a mask is just, until they tell me that masks spread the disease clearly from a randomized trial, I got plenty of data that shows otherwise. So uh, I'll move on. But now I'm going to go on to something even more controversial that I had to, because you're one of the only oncologists I could talk about this with, because you can appreciate this. I call it the conspiracies of cancer, mm. right? Have you heard the conspiracy that basically a lot of the companies already have a cure for cancer and they're hiding it because cancer is such big business? I hear this at least once every couple months, whether it's on a hotline or some other place. Can you, can you please put to rest the idea that we don't want a cure somehow? I mean, I have not found that to be the case with hepatitis C. The moment we found a cure, everybody wants to use the drug and be cured in four to eight weeks. Um, every time we find a drug, I mean, everyone's pursuing cure. Can you please give the public confidence that there's no conspiracy that we're hiding a cure somehow? Yeah. So what I, what I do to tell people is, you know, they, they, they say, well, there's this, there's this clover in, uh, Czechoslovakia that really works and it's being suppressed by uh, big pharma. I would remind everyone that the federal government through your tax dollars has ever since the late forties has systematically every year collected every conceivable chemical structure and run it through screens looking for identification uh, signatures that would identify a cancer cell line or 
an animal line that would be treated by, treatable by these, by these drugs. And these have been studied repetitively. There's a whole building devoted to this at the NIH. And as soon as they get a hit, they see, oh, a drug like Taxane, it works for cancer. And immediately we have a new drug and they, they, they have CRADAs in place, C-R-A-D-A's and they, their cooperative research agreement, drug development uh, agreements, and they'll farm them out to pharma. And if the pharma company doesn't develop the drug, the NIH takes it back and says, you're not doing a good, good job. Uh, we think this is um, important. So our tax dollars are at work in this field. And the, the federal government has taken this job very seriously. I mean, you imagine the number of chemicals in this world, and they're, they're every year screening hundreds of thousands of these things, maybe more. So you just, it, it's just ludicrous to think that there's some conspiracy out there. Our government is, you know, people have lost faith in our government to some extent, but it's still our government, and we do fund good, solid research. I mean, all I know is I published my first paper 33 years ago, and I have never been suppressed or stopped from finding a cure for cancer. Quite the opposite. I've been well-funded. I'm just not smart enough to come up with a cure. <laughs> That's the reality. So I'm yeah. just glad you answered it from your side, because you, you, what I, the one thing I've always liked about you is you hate cancer as much as I hate cancer, and you, want, you would love to see this go away. And so... We could go do something else, you know, we'd go to a show in Vegas, we could go to the Vintner Grill. I don't, we don't want this around. So I'm glad you answered that question because I have not found a single conspiracy. Of course, things move slowly and we'll talk about that sometimes. They, people want things to move faster, but that's an important question that an oncologist needs to answer and I'm glad you answered that. All right, I already talked to you about genetic and molecular testing. We went through all of that, but uh, I want to talk about these androgen pills. These androgen, you mentioned them briefly, abiraterone or Zytiga, and now we've got Erlita, Nubeca, X, you know, Xtandi, all of these. So are you basically saying we've lost faith that combining these pills together is necessarily going to give us a synergistic effect, ultimately, that you'll see a person on one of these anti-androgen pills, and then when they fail it, they'll move on to a different type of treatment? Is that basically what you're saying? Let me nuance that a bit, Mark. Um, okay. The abiraterone is a unique structure. It's similar to ketoconazole. So for the chemists in the audience, uh, it's a multi-ring it, multi structure, but it's got a lot of differences um, from the other three. However, um, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide are also distinct chemical structures. And darolutamide is the most distinct. Yeah. Um, it's a non-planar compound, whereas Abby is planar, Enza is planar, and Apa is planar. So we believe that there are some cross resistance because they're all targeting the androgen receptor uh, protein, uh, but there may be non-cross resistance. I saw a patient the other day who had failed um, enzalutamide and his local oncologist in, uh, I think it was in um, Colorado, um, uh, had put him on apalutamide and I said, oh, not a very great idea, I would do that. And boom, he had a great response. <laughs> you know, and I go, well, so much for me, I guess I'm not so smart. Um, so every once in a while you do see these responses. Now, the, the reason may be that the androgen receptor is slightly different. Remember I talked about the wind and the sails and the different jibs and all these sail names, and they may catch the androgen receptor differently. So I, I hold out some hope, not a lot. Um, and it's to, to a great extent up to the drug companies to figure this out because it's their market. And if they can, if they can get a niche market, um, where their androgen receptor inhibitor only hits a specific androgen receptor mutation. Um, that's good. Tracon tried that, failed, and they're out of the business. Right. So 
um, it may be still true, but it's going to be a small market and uh, it may not be worth pursuing it for some pharmaceutical companies. So when you fail one of these pills, we talked very early on in your talk about if you're on Lupron and you fail Lupron or whatever LHRH you're on, then maybe you can come off, but a lot of clinical trials, you require the drug to stay on. When you fail one of these oral drugs, theoretically, are you supposed to stay on them and just keep going to other therapies? Or are they supposed to pull that therapy? Supposed to pull the therapy. They um, are supposed to pull it. That's they, you're supposed to pull them, yeah. They're, they're not helpful at some point. Um, in fact, what, what you can do is sometimes you can actually see the withdrawal response. Kevin Kelly in 1993 reported that when you stopped flutamide or, yeah, flutamide withdrawal syndrome, yeah. um, you would occasionally see uh, PSA dramatically drop. I just did that the other day for a patient, and I stopped Abby Radarone. Um, in preparation for a clinical trial, and his PSA went from 220 to 120. And, and I went, eh, what's that? So the guy's happy. Uh, I couldn't get him on a clinical trial uh, because his PSA dropped. Um, but, you know, it, it worked. So I don't know all the underlying molecular biology of that, um, but it's real and it does still, it still happen. And it may happen not just with flutamide, but with uh, abiraterone. It may happen with enzalutamide. It may happen with apalutamide. So I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that these are different molecules. They have different side effects. One of my patients is a doctor. He's been on the journey uh, for at least uh, 15 years now. Um, and he was on enzalutamide. Very, uh, he had a lot of side effects. He switched, I switched him to apalutamide. He had immediate pain relief huh. he, and his quality of life got better. Um, so, but his PSA didn't do anything. So I think there's many things we don't know about these drugs. We, there's many things. They've never been compared head to head, except yeah. Abby, Abby, Abby Radarone and enzalutamide. And those were fairly small studies. Uh, Kim Chi's study was only 200 patients. So we yeah. don't really understand who's going to have benefit when the other drug doesn't work. That's so uh, but, interesting. So yeah. interesting. Because I read, an, I think the editorials by Tia Higano, you know, he's a very famous oncologist out in the West yeah. Coast. And she essentially in the paper implied that what we're probably going to do with these drugs is we're going to figure out the side effect profile is, is, is unique to these and we'll work with those side effect profiles and switch patients based on exactly what you said. Maybe a person gets extreme fatigue with one, you switch them and the fatigue's not as severe with the other. And I thought that that's an interesting concept. It really is. I mean, uh, this doc is a skeptic. He, he told me um, before, he said, I don't believe this Provenge. Eh, he's, a, he's an infectious disease doctor. You know, he goes, I don't believe this Provenge. But he took it, you know, because it's evidence-based. And then when he was on the enzalutamide, um, having a lot of side effects and having increasing bone pain, <laughs> and he, he said, I can't believe this. Apalutamide was like, suddenly I was better in a day. The pain went away and my fatigue was improved. So there's something here. I, I don't know what, um, but all I know is that we're, we, we have not really scratched the surface of the differences among the androgen receptor inhibitors. That's awesome. That is awesome, awesome, awesome. So now I'm going to switch to a topic and you're going to think it's not related. And then in my wacky world, I'm going to show you it's related. All right. All right. We're going to talk about cannabis and CBD. So, you know, in Vegas and you know, over, uh, you know, in the surrounding states that somehow we woke up and there are these CBD distribution centers everywhere. This was going to save the planet. CBD was going to cure everything. Uh, cannabis is all this strong role. It's all these cannabinoids. What's the role right now of cannabis, CBD, THC, marijuana? Does it have any role in your practice at all now that it's more available? Um, hmm. Well, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, one of my patients uh, runs a large uh, grow uh, house and uh, has been on CBD uh, for a long time and is and I, he thinks his journey uh, has been improved by it, pain-wise and cancer-wise. Um, there's some evidence from Brazil that 
um, uh, marijuana extracts have some effect on the androgen receptor. Um, and I'm, I, I'm just not negative. I'm, I'm not positive, but I'm also not negative. I, I'm open and curious uh, would, be my, would be my sense. Um, so these cannabinoids do not have receptors on the prostate cancer cells. That we know. There's no receptors for cannabinoids on the cancer cells. But there are prostate cancer, there's, there are receptors in the brain. Um, so the quality of life may be a positive, um, but not directly anti-cancer. We don't have any evidence that's directly anti-cancer. That's interesting because, you know, we, it's been around forever and a synthetic or another form for side effects, whether it was to reduce nausea and vomiting, uh, whether some people take CBD to reduce their anxiety. For a quality of life standpoint, I see it, I see it finding a home and it has had a home. Where things get a little squirrely is that people start making all these promises that they do fight prostate cancer and do all these things. So I'm excited that it's out there. I'm excited we can examine it, especially maybe it stimulates appetite, mm -hmm. right? And someone no. who's lost a lot of money, we uh, lost a lot of, I said money, is that funny? I said lost a lot of appetite. You can tell I've been working too long. Um, but the cost differential, the quality control issues, there's so much still to work out. We still only have one FDA approved drug for CBD out there, and it's for a rare form of epilepsy found in mostly in, in children. So here's how I'm coming back to the androgen pills. I started looking at CBD and a number of these derivatives and they're heavily metabolized in the liver. So much so that when you look at epilepsy, it can raise the concentration, actually. It's an inhibitor, a SIP inhibitor. It raises the con concentration of some very common epilepsy medications. So I've heard about these case studies and I'm begging people to draw them up and I might write one up myself where somebody was taking a Zytiga or Abiraterone and suddenly they combined it with a derivative like a CBD and their risk of hepatitis or liver enzyme increases, which I know is already there with the drug, seemed to happen and happened very quickly. All I can tell you is it's heavily metabolized through these liver enzyme systems, um, some of these derivatives. So are these oral androgen drugs. And I just wonder if we're playing with fire a little bit and we're gonna find out in, in a year that you gotta be careful. Yeah, no, Mark, you know, Mark, you, you've, you've brought this up many years ago in other environments when, when you worry about polypharmacy using supplements. And, you, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you are playing with fire. I mean, that, that's real. I, I try not to take any supplements except maybe some vitamins. Um, and, and the answer is that nature has a way of using these these. Um, alkaloids. These are plant alkaloids. They're powerful. They were developed, the, the plants developed them to protect themselves from bacteria and viruses. So they are, they're powerful uh, little buggers. And so when, when you're putting those in your body, they may well have a side effect that you don't know about. Yeah. So I, 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 I would not be all surprised if we see some synergy or if we see some additive toxicity um, yeah. without, without really much, all you need is a few case reports and I think it'll become more, more commonly understood. I'm just, begging, I'm just begging patients and clinicians to ask their patients if they're taking CBD or one of these derivatives mm -hmm. just for transparency's sake so we can learn more. Whether the, there's a benefit or a detriment, we've got to encourage more honesty now that it's so widely available. Are you taking it? No big deal, but tell me what you're taking, how much you're taking, because we don't even have a handle on what dosage means. Yeah. These dosages are just being created in these clinical trials. All right, I'll get off my marijuana box, my marijuana soapbox. You mentioned, you mentioned high-dose testosterone. There's a trial at Hopkins called uh, it's BAT. It's bipolar androgen therapy. And where essentially what they do is they give these spurts of high-dose testosterone in people who have castrate-resistant prostate cancer and they've seen a couple of people respond. Like you've mentioned, do you think that if given someone out there is really desperate, they've tried a lot of different things, this is a viable option or they should get into a clinical trial where they actually get 
a, a high dose testosterone for their castrate resistant prostate cancer? So um, Hopkins published uh, their data, um, randomized patients uh, uh, against uh, enzalutamide or testosterone. Uh, the median survival of the testosterone, high dose testosterone group was, I believe, 19 months. Uh, the median survival uh, with the enzalutamide was 15 months. Mm. To me, that's level one evidence. Um, it may not be a big trial, uh, but it does show that the testosterone is safe and effective in advanced prostate cancer. So I have incorporated that, that into my practice, and I'm now giving high dose testosterone um, in patients who have uh, reached the uh, what you would call the the last you know they're in New Orleans you know and they're they're trying to stay away from the Gulf of Mexico um, and I've done that now five or six times and one one of my guys in particular um, has had 23 different treatments for his prostate cancer um, he he walked into the Mississippi when his when his PSA was 260. That was 20 years ago. Um, and um, I've, I, I put him on a lip rib, and there was a little bit of a, he does have a BRCA mutation. Um, and his, the lip rib dropped his PSA, oh, you know, maybe 200 points or so, and his lymph node didn't grow. And then I put him on, I added testosterone. Like, you know, it's totally anecdotal because what are you going to do when a guy said 23 different treatments? Um, and uh, I gave him testosterone. And his PSA immediately dropped from 4,000 to 2,000. And it's been going on now for four months. Um, he feels wonderful. He's got his sexual function back. Um, and so the, the idea that testosterone is a set of toxic for prostate cancer cells was developed by Dr. Shitsun Liao in uh, the Ben May. That's a direct correlate of uh, Charlie uh, Huggins' work. Shitsung was one of his postdocs and showed that you could kill prostate cancer cells uh, that were androgen independent by flooding them with testosterone. So it, it's a long and winding story, uh, but I'm really, really impressed with the Hopkins study. They, they did the study right. They did it prospectively, they did it high dose testosterone. It's 400 milligrams IM every month. Um, and that's the dose I use. Um, and um, I'm, I, I have no reason to think that they're in error. I just can't wait to see the paper come out in press. I just thought that they were arguing though, they're trying to figure out, I think it's an incredible thought and it's a, it's a great study, it's a great group. And I just thought, they're trying to tease out now, what's that subgroup that responds? And I thought, I mean, you know, you've read 10 million papers like I have. I thought they were arguing recently that one of the, the subgroup that might have responded were people that had BRCA or some kind of mutation there. They were better responders. Mm -hmm. So they, they're trying to figure out who's a real great candidate for this besides the guy that's already had 23 therapies. Yeah, exactly. You know, the ovarian cancer world has a... Um, has a thing called homologous recombinant DNA. And they, what they do is they look at a, a whole variety of these uh, recombinant uh, DNA repair, or not recombinant, but homologous uh, DNA repair enzymes. Um, and it, it's sort of a fingerprint for who has an abnormality of their DNA repair. And we haven't used that very much in prostate cancer, um, but it's beginning to occur. It's sort of like a, a gene array. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case. We, we have the same issue with radium. You know, there are some patients who get radium who have these dramatic responses and they're DNA repair uh, enzyme deficient in some cases. So you, you begin to see that there are patterns and D, uh, high dose testosterone may in fact stimulate a DNA uh, uh, damage repair uh, process. It may cause apoptosis and suddenly the cells and flooded with DNA cannot divide or are forced to divide and cannot. And then instead of dividing, they die. Um, you know, and it's, it's a fascinating field. And I think we need to study it with an open mind. It's, it's real, would, would be very important for quality of life for these patients. Yeah, that is absolutely interesting about your experience. I did not 
know that was your experience because I wanted to get an update of what was happening there because it's so fascinating in terms well, of... Oliver, Oliver Sardner and I talked about this last year at ASCO before yeah. we were locked down in COVID and Oliver had the same experience. He was very cautious and as, as any good scientist is, a little skeptical. And uh, then he started describing a series of his patients. Then I talked to Mario Eisenberger, the same at Hopkins, and he had the same experience. He was using it off protocol. I said, you know, it's time, and I, I, I'm doing it, and um, I've, I've not been disappointed. So, how, how so have you far. seen response or not? How have you seen the quality of life? Do you, do people say that they feel better because they've been off of testosterone mm -hmm. for so long, and then they get this surge from you that's an injection? Yeah. So, do they mention quality of life at all when you get it? They, they don't. It doesn't change very rapidly. It's not like they suddenly become raging sex addicts. Yeah. Um, it, they, they don't get a, a big change. They get mild hemoglobin rise. Uh, they get a reduction in joint pain. They get their back pain improves. You know, their arthralgias go away. Um, and, and as one of my, one of my ladies, uh, uh, she was married to a United Airlines pilot. She goes, you're giving me my boy back. You know, and it's, it had nothing to do with sex. It was just yeah. Yeah. his mind. His mind was clearer. That's right. And, and, and he'd been on testosterone ablation therapy for a long time, and he was actually becoming some, somewhat forgetful in early dementia. And um, so there, there's something more to be said for testosterone than just its effects on the cancer. It may have an effect on the brain. It may have an effect on joints. And, uh, and so on. Quality of life definitely seems to be improved. Not immediately, but, but within a short two, three month period. That is great, great stuff. I wanna go back to PARP for one second because I didn't get one question before I go back to my A to Z list. So the PARP inhibitors, like we said, Limparza and these ones that are being used now for these mutations. Someone asked me this question the other day and I didn't even, I've never even crossed my mind. This is why I love seeing all these questions coming in through the organization or on the internet. He said, well, you know, when you, when you fail a certain drug, for example, you can try another drug and that's the kind of thinking. And, and they said, well, when you fail one PARP inhibitor, is there a possibility in the future that maybe if you go on another one, you could respond? In other words, you know, sequential. So you didn't respond to this one. Then what happens if you try this one? Because all PARP inhibitors can't be 100% alike, just like your story about Erlita, right? And enzalutamide or a Nubeca. Is it, have, have you ever heard any talk about you fail this PARP inhibitor and then you try this one? Or is this crazy thinking? I answered uh, as follows. Before PARP became approved, I would have a few BRCA patients um, and I would try to get them PARP inhibitors and it was very difficult. Um, I would sometimes get one month supply or I would get some free samples from my local uh, gynecologic oncology team and uh, so the patients would get one month of this or one month of that or um, and then they would come off. Um, and my experience has been that these drugs are pretty much non cross are pretty much cross resistant, um, but I, I think the again our theme, if there is one, this afternoon has been that there's a lot of stuff. Well, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> that's 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 the theme. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff we don't know, and do we know whether these drugs are cross resistant? No, my my single group of two or three patients, small experience, um, suggest that they are not, that suggest that they are cross resistant. Um, but you know, you're not going to get a company running against another company's drug. I mean, no one's going to do that. Maybe in a, in an academic center, you might compare, uh, Rucaparib to Oliparib. Um, but, you won't really be able to, you know, like Kim Chi's study of abiraterone versus enzalutamide and then crossover it was a very helpful paper. It was published in The Lancet and it showed that uh, 
if you give enzalutamide first, Abby Raterone, given second, had a virtually 0% response rate. Mm. But when you gave enzalutam or Abby Raterone first, enzalutamide had a finite response rate. It was 10, 15%. So suggesting that enzalutamide is a slightly better androgen receptor inhibitor, there was no difference in survival, but the study was underpowered for that. I would imagine that that would be the same outcome that you could find with these oliparib uh, PARP inhibitors. Crossover, you know, randomized to one or the other, and then crossover at right. time of progression. And you may learn something, and it's a very valuable uh, study design. And Kim and uh, the guys in Vancouver did a great job. So the study is doable. Uh, it requires an academic center. It can't be done by the drug companies, but it requires an academic medical center to run that. I want to talk about chemotherapy next, just the topic. <clears throat> and I, I told you this when I, we first met. You might not remember. What I said was, maybe I was too candid about it. I said that some oncologists, not all, it's not a, not a broad brush, they're very bad sellers of chemotherapy. And maybe it's also the people in urology and the primary care. We think of chemotherapy as this, oh, just this horrible thing, and it causes all these problems, and people talk about it with such negativity, when in reality, it has a firm hold. It has a firm position, as you said, in prostate cancer. Maybe, my theory is maybe we're looking at it wrong. Before I get to your question, you know, Taxotere was derived from Taxol, is my understanding. That came from the Pacific yew tree. So the truth of the matter is, the chemotherapies that we use are plant-based drugs. They're plant-based chemotherapy drugs. So maybe if we change the name to plant-based chemotherapy drugs, maybe there would be more excitement about them versus straight chemotherapy. Anyway, that's one of my bizarre theories. But can you just talk about, because chemotherapy just doesn't have a role anymore in advanced disease. It has a role potentially earlier on for very aggressive disease. Can you just talk about that for people who are trying to avoid the C word, the chemotherapy word, and talk about the vast majority of potential candidates? You showed that slide, but you're now encouraging it potentially earlier, right, for very aggressive disease? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty simple equation. There are 70 or more different chemical structures. Um, and each one of them we call chemotherapy. Um, we're developing uh, with uh, a, a small company in the Netherlands called Modra, an oral form of docetaxel. And um, uh, the randomization is to IV docetaxel or oral docetaxel. Um, and the drugs are effective equally. Oral is the same as IV, at least in a small series so far. But the side effects are different. Uh, giving the drug orally induces more nail problems. It induces more neuropathy. It induces a bit more um, hair loss. Uh, but to the patient, they love the idea of taking an oral drug. Um, and uh, so I, I say, well, you're right. We'll just call it oral. It's not really chemo. Um, it's oral uh, something. But the reality is, these are chemical structures and how you get them into the body sort of doesn't matter. Um, and you know, the old, uh, you know, you used the word bucket list a while back uh, there. What was that movie uh, with uh, uh, those two guys? Who it was called bucket list actually. The one, it was, it was yeah. called bucket list, I think, where they went and traveled the world because they were right. Both, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. And, and you know, there's that scene where he's vomiting into the, into the toilet in, um, in the, the, the hospital, you know, and that's the, that's the message that, that has resonated for years. Yeah. And even, even Abby, it was Abby McGraw and her, her movie about chemotherapy. Um, all of these have sort of romanticized how bad chemotherapy is. I saw a vintner the other day from Sonoma and he clearly, clearly needs chemotherapy. I mean, this poor guy is just, he's ready for chemo and he, he won't take it. He just won't take it. He's had me and he's had Tom Beer from Oregon and he's had uh, people from UCSF tell him that, he'll, that he needs chemo. He just won't take it. 
Um, so, but if I could give him oral chemotherapy, I think he'd probably love it. Um, so there, there, this, this idea that it's chemotherapy is, you're right. You got to change the word. It's not chemo really. It's a chemical. We have to get it into your body somehow. Um, and if we could put it by in your mouth or through your, your rectum or any way, it, it would get into your body. Um, but it's insoluble and we have to give it through the vein. So educating people about chemotherapy is, is important. The other thing that is really interesting is that dostaxel um, is given first um, and Jevtana or cabazitaxel is given second. And that is strictly an insurance construct. It has nothing to do with effectiveness because when you look at uh, the two drugs front together, um, it was called first ana. That was the name of the trial. Yeah. They were exactly the same, except um, the cabazitaxel or Jevtana was significantly less toxic, less neuropathy, less hair loss, uh, although it had more diarrhea and more um, uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. Um, so I've, I've, for many men who are intolerant of dostaxel, I've just switched immediately to cabazitaxel, um, and even in first line. Um, if they're hormone sensitive, I, I will, if they have allergic reactions to those taxel or something bad, I'll just say, okay, we'll flip over. And usually the insurance companies pay it. So it's, it's not crazy to use drugs again or alternatively. Uh, so when, when cabazitaxel becomes um, generic in, um, I think, 2022, um, you're going to see a big switch. Um, most oncologists are going to want to give uh, cabazitaxel first line and not uh, docetaxel first line. So that means they would then give docetaxel second line? Yeah, or would they just win after the after, huh? Well, the, 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 hooker, the hook here is, is that cabazitaxel is not p glycoprotein uh, modulated, whereas docetaxel is. So the, they're there may be some benefit to cabazitaxel over docetaxel. However, in the first ANA trial, there was no discernible difference yeah. in terms of overall survival. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you couldn't retreat uh, or uh, use alternative regimens like oral docetaxel if you've already had cabazitaxel. Um, these are, you know, again, the, the, I guess the theme of our discussion this afternoon is, has really been on we don't know what we don't know. And the other theme is, well, you know, the dogmas don't always hold up. And there's a lot of dogma out there that we should challenge. That's, that's why I love it. That's why I love hanging out with you. By the way, two thoughts, Morgan yeah. Freeman and Jack oh, Nichols. That's it. That's it. That's Morgan the- Freeman. Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. And Jack Nicholson owns hospitals, and he's a very hard <laughs> right. I think Morgan Freeman is, uh, I don't know, remember his job. And then mechanic, they, I think. Uh, mechanic. And they travel the world on their bucket list because they're both suffering from terminal disease, and they, yeah, and they make chemotherapy look bad. <laughs> <laughs> they do. It's actually... I, I would like a meme of, of Jack Nicholson vomiting into the toilet. You know, <laughs> this is not what you're going to get. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're a powerful man. I, you know, I've written a couple of papers with you where, that have, have had a lot of play. You know, we wrote a paper together five years ago, which I'm going to come up, which has been downloaded a ton of times. And it was crazy thinking at the time. And now it's not crazy. I'll get back to that. But you need to change the name of chemotherapy to PBDT, plant-based drug therapy. You call chemo plant-based drug therapy? More people, including your friend, the Vintner, will end up getting it because they understand where it came from. It came from Mother Earth. Yeah. No, I use that argument all the time, Mark. Okay. Um, it, it's really a marketing issue. And to use the word chemotherapy is really a misnomer. Um, platinum is, is a chemotherapy that is tough. You know, it, it, it makes you nauseated. It is not the same as dostaxel. Dostaxel can give you allergic reactions. But it's nothing like those. It's nothing like cisplatin. Yeah. You know, we should we should stop using the term chemotherapy. We should yeah. call the term what it is. It's docetaxel. It's not platinum. It's not for, It's not five fu. It's not mitomycin C. It's 
Dosi Taxel. Yeah. And it's not Kabazi Taxel. You know, it's there. Yeah. Each chemical is a different drug and That's different good. unique side effects and different unique benefits. That's a real good point. So if you're under the care of a urologist or a primary care doctor and you have aggressive early cancer, you're saying that some men should get chemotherapy while they're still hormone sensitive. Can you give us some direction as to who those men are and when they should ask for it? Sure. So uh, as that one slide I used uh, earlier showed, there, there are certain characteristics of prostate cancer that commend it to earlier use of chemotherapy. Those characteristics include a low PSA and a high volume of disease, um, a high LDH. LDH is an hypoxia-induced gene. That means the cancer is hypoxic and may not be sensitive to hormone therapy. Um, it, it, an, another uh, time to use chemotherapy with either dostaxel or uh, um, uh, gabacitaxel is clearly after androgen therapy has stopped working, uh, when the patient is in pain, um, when, when the fractures are beginning to mount, when you have more and more bone fractures or bone pain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very simple. Um, we as oncologists, um, at least in the prostate cancer world, tend to bad, bad mouth our own best drugs. Um, why do we do that? You know, these are life-saving, life-extending drugs. Yeah. And we have all sorts of tools to reduce the side effects. Um, we, we, we shouldn't be belittling important tools that we have to improve the quality and extend the life of these patients. That's yeah. just ridiculous. And I, I really find it offensive when, when doctors go, well, you know, that's just docetaxel. That's bad stuff. Well, not really if you're facing a life that's otherwise going to be uh, limited by pain and suffering. Uh, dose taxful is not, not cancer. And it's relative, too. I mean, taking away your testosterone or putting you on a PARP or you name it, this is not a walk in the park. I always explain to patients that there are over 70 different chemical structures that we use the term chemotherapy for. Which one would you like to talk about? Would you like to talk about platinum as a chemotherapy or would you like to talk about docetaxel as chemotherapy or would you like to talk about uh, cabacitaxel as chemotherapy? Let's, let's be precise. English language is designed to be precise. We don't need to use the term chemotherapy. That's awesome. That's fantastic. I, there was a doctor that called me as a friend of mine and said, I got to go on chemotherapy, but I, I'm not losing my hair. Uh, and he said, they're telling me I got to take docetaxel to cause hair loss. You know, I'm not here to argue with him whether or not I think hair loss is significant. That's important to him. So he said, I heard that cabazitaxel doesn't cause as much hair loss. Uh, and so do you think there's a problem? I said, I don't know. Let me talk to the Nick Vogelzangs of the world. So is that true? You really don't get much hair loss with the other chemotherapy drug versus docetaxel? No, it's remarkable. Uh, a lot of the patients who... Uh, who have had docetaxel then get cabazitaxel. And then they come back to me and they go, what is this, the wedding at Cana? You're giving me the better wine second? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's true. They, they, my, my guy who started this whole talk um, about the one who floated down the Mississippi many years ago, um, he, he, his only side effect after 20 doses of uh, cabazitaxel has been uh, peripheral edema. That's all. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have any neuropathy. He doesn't have any hair loss. Um, you know, he, he doesn't have much diarrhea. I'm, I hydrate him every time to make certain he doesn't get uh, hemorrhagic cystitis. So these drugs, the, the, so the differences between cabazitaxel and um, uh, docetaxel are real. They're definite and real. And if, if there's somebody whose insurance will pay for cabazitaxel um, over a hair loss issue, um, fine, I'd go with it. If you have neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, um, and you probably shouldn't get docetaxel, I recommend routinely that you get a cabazitaxel in those environments. That is great, great advice.
Let's go on to immune therapy. I want to wrap this up in five, 10 minutes because I want your, I want your family to still like me as well as your dog. Uh, immune therapy. You know, I was there, I was there in the early days. To, I want to see Provenge approved. Provenge got approved. We thought here comes a whole line of approvals for immune therapy. Here we go. Just like in all the other cancers, we, we still only have Provenge for immune therapy. So what's the deal? Why don't we have more of these? Keytruda, they have a commercial. Tocentric now in bladder cancer. Why don't we have more chemotherapy? I mean, more immunotherapies approved in prostate. Yeah, uh, part of it is that prostate cancer is a slow-growing cancer. Um, the cancers that grow very, very quickly um, are like melanoma and lung cancer and bladder cancer. They have what they call high tumor mutational burden. Uh, they have a lot of mutations um, on their cells surface that the immune system recognizes. Prostate cancer is more like a turtle. Uh, it tends to not be very fast growing and does not have a lot of um, uh, mutations on the surface. So when I, I use, a, um, this is a, a conflict of interest, I, I am employed uh, part-time as a consultant to Keras. They're one of these big genetic testing companies. And uh, so I, I send a lot of my specimens to Keras and they send me back the tumor mutational load even though I really only want to know about uh, the PARP molecules. So I get data uh, and the data says you have a BRCA mutation or BRCA1 or BRCA2. And then they give me the tumor mutational load as a, another piece of data. And inevitably, if you have a high BRCA or a high PARP, uh, a high other molecule like that, your tumor mutational load tends to be higher. Um, so that is one of the problems. If you don't have a BRCA, then you generally tend to have a low tumor mutational load. They're not one-to-one -one correlates, yeah. uh, but the more DNA damage you have, the more likely you are to have a high TMB. And the TMB is what the immune rec recognizes. So prostate cancer is not a highly immunogenic tumor. Um, and Susan Slovin wrote a recent editorial uh, sort of saying that uh, she has become a believer uh, in immune therapy she, of prostate cancer. She used to be a, a naysayer. Now, she's been doing this. She's been studying this field for 40 years. She is not a newbie. Um, but she has never seen immune therapy consistently work until she started seeing uh, the uh, checkpoint inhibitors work in high tumor mutational load prostate cancer patients. So I think that the FDA has recognized this and just recently they approved um, um, nivolumab and ipilimumab in combination for high TMB patients. So if you have a prostate cancer patient who has high TMB, uh, they can get a second immune treatment. Um, I, I saw a, uh, a, a patient recently with Lynch syndrome. Lynch yeah. syndrome is high TMB, um, and they do get prostate cancer patient. Uh, they do get prostate cancer, and those patients are now eligible for treatments uh, that would be focused at Lynch syndrome, even though they don't have the classic colon cancer, they have prostate cancer. So you, you theoretically can treat uh, uh, prostate cancer patients who have either Lynch syndrome or who have t high TMB um, with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So there are more available than just uh, Provenge. That's interesting. Uh, the last few concepts I have is one, I've watched you do this and you, I seem mm. like you're more of a believer, <coughs> excuse me, debulking. Mm. Debulking, can you explain that concept? A lot of people have never heard it. I, you know what, I'll just tell you a quick factoid. You were at the PCRI meeting maybe four or five years ago, and I asked you about debulking, and I said essentially that you know in ovarian cancer, even if it's spread, they still reduce the prime, they still get rid of the primary tumor, and they might see a survival benefit. And in other cancers, even though the tumor is spread, you still might take out the prostate or radiate the prostate, even though the tumor is spread, and that might provide a survival benefit. 
And what do you think? And you said, maybe I'm, a, I, I'm at least excited about the possibility. And there's been a ton of views of that internet spot that when I <laughs> asked, when I asked you that question several years ago. So now I ask you again, because you seem to be more of a believer now in the idea of debulking, but let me know how you feel. Can you explain it briefly? And, and then let me know where we're at with it. The world is filled with anomalies and the treatment of the primary cancer has shown to have a survival advantage um, in colon cancer, uh, head and neck cancer, and ovarian cancer. Just this ASCO, uh, a paper came out showing that treating of the primary in breast cancer did not seem, at least in advanced breast cancer, did not seem to have a survival advantage. Um, there's now data suggesting that radiating the primary in lung cancer, small cell or non small cell, uh, has a survival advantage. So getting rid of the primary is a way to prevent, we believe, some of the really bad cancer cells that have been incubated within the primary site from metastasizing. There's elegant studies showing that those, those cancer cells can metastasize and then in turn the metastases metastasize. So we, we believe that this should be, at least some of us believe, that this should be a multi-pronged approach. That if you're going to uh, eliminate the primary, which we think is good, S Southwest Oncology Group showed years ago that patients who uh, had their primary removed did better than those who never had their primary removed. And that's Dave Crawford's work and others. Um, and, and now we have data suggesting that if you radiate the metastatic site or sites um, that's with Oriel or with um, uh, Stomp, uh, there's uh, a variety of these studies underway that radiating the, radiating the metastatic sites also improves survival. This is presenting us with a, um, a, a theory that suggests that each primary cluster of cancer cells has within it a heterogeneity. One of those cancer cells, maybe, maybe 10, maybe 500, maybe 2 million are bad and others are not so bad. And so and by, by bad, I mean able to metastasize. So if you eradicate the metastasis, eradicate the primary, you may have longer life. So this theory is gaining hold. And more and more physicians are uh, embracing the idea of removing or radiating the primary. That data was unequivocally proven in, in Stampede. And it only worked for the low volume prostate cancer patients. It didn't work for the high volume. That may be a matter of power and, and, and so on. Or it may be that there's so much cancer, you know, removing the primary doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But I have now consistently recommended a treatment of the primary. Um, and I, I've, I've got about 30 patients. I, wrote, I told you about those patients uh, four or five years ago. I haven't reported that yet. I've got the paper written. But I'm just waiting uh, for these uh, men to mature, as if you will, move down the river. And many of them still have not. Uh, they've had their prostate removed in the face of metastatic disease, and they've not had a recurrence. Their testosterone comes up, their PSA remains zero, and uh, I'm scratching my head going, what happened? What did I do right? Um, and the same thing with radiating metastatic sites. You know, with these PSMA scans, you can find oligometastatic sites. You can find a single lymph node or a single bone or two, two bones or one lymph node and a bone or something. Um, and it makes sense. Now, a lot, of my, a lot of my skeptical academic friends, and I do say this with all due respect, think that's hogwash. They, they say it's, uh, you know, you're just, it's just selection bias. You're treating the, uh, the best patients uh, who happen to have slow-growing ca cancer uh, with treatment, and um, you're not able to fix those people with bad cancers. I don't know. 
right now, the what I, st I do know is that uh, uh, we're SWOG is, is doing a study. It's called um, the uh, it's 10, 1810, I think. It's run by Brian Chapin. We're randomizing men with metastatic prostate cancer to either receive treatment at the primary or not. Um, we're 210 patients and it's going very slowly. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I hope it doesn't go so slowly they close the study. Mm -hmm. um, but we're allowing men to either at six months to get either surgery to the primary or radiation to the primary. Our radiation oncology colleagues were insistent that they uh, uh, allow radiation instead of, prost instead of prostatectomy based upon the stampede data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually been interesting because it's the radiation oncologist who've not been joining the study. It's, yeah. it's, it's been the surgeons who've been leading this charge. So, um, and I, I admit it's hard, to, it's a hard randomization. Uh, you know, you have to tell the patients after six months, uh, even though their PSA may still be coming down, they may still be having some pain. Well, now we're going to treat your prostate with a surgery, and they're going, really? I mean, do I need to have my prostate taken out? I'm, my, it's in my bones already. What, what's the value there? And the answer is we don't know. Uh, but in the long run, we hope that treating the primary uh, will extend life, and also radiating oligometastatic disease will extend life. Uh, again, the simple theory being that all of these clones, the primary and the metastatic site, uh, metastatic sites have adverse cells within them that are particularly bad. So much, much to learn. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. But um, right now, the dogma that you shouldn't treat the primary uh, is uh, beginning to be attacked. At least we're attacking the dogma. That's all we can ask. And that's, and that's good. I, I told a friend of mine to go see you. He's very, very happy. He went to see you. He's been getting systemic therapy. He's got metastatic disease. And what's amazing is that he got an imaging test. And even though he's on systemic disease and it looks like he's responding well, it looks like there's still activity going on in the prostate, right? right. So if there's activity going on in the prostate, it's not a crazy thought to get rid of the we call it the, the main ship. You know, the, they, some people say it, the mother's ship, the father's ship. So there's a lot, there's a lot there to do something with. And uh, I, I learned that from you that, of course, I want it to work. And, of course, I want to give it a shot. The last items are all philosophical. You want me to tell you what I tell people about you behind your back? No. <laughs> what do you tell them? Well, I tell them only good things because you've also been, I think we've been colleagues, but also like a mentor because you've arguably been practicing full time in the almost full time in the world of prostate cancer as long as anyone on this planet, if you really think about it. And I think that's not to say that you're older, it's deferential to your experience, right? But what I say about him, the only thing that can be conceived is slightly negative, but I don't take it as negative. I take it as positive. I say, if you go see Nick Vogelzang for treatment or consult, I call him Nick Candid Vogelzang. <laughs> Nick Candid That's Vogelzang true. does That's not true. beat around the bush. He will tell you what he thinks and what is going on. And the reason, let me preface this by saying, I have reviewed countless papers in oncology that still show the same thing, that most patients were not aware of their prognosis even when their disease was most advanced and dire or not dire. And I don't think that's a service to patients. I think it's important to be optimistic. I think it's important to be hopeful, but I think it's important to also be candid. Do you want to comment on that? Because that is one thing I've known about you since day one. You are so honest that I always tell them, get ready. You're going to hear an honest conversation and it might throw you off, but you should appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks, Mark. You know, that, that comes from our Dutch upbringing. Um, my, my Dutch ancestors were, were very down to earth people. My grandfather um, came from a dairy farm uh, on the German border. And, uh, you know, you, you just tell the truth. And there was no other option. It's that old Protestant work ethic. You know, you, you just say, it's not going to work. <laughs> don't, don't waste your time. Um, but, but reality is that, um, you know, we as oncologists have a what their disease is. And it, there's no question that 
that behavior on my part and I recognize that I can be overly candid and that does lead people to leave me. There's, there, you know, it happens. I mean, I, I saw a kid, uh, he's a police officer here in Las Vegas and he had very bad um, kidney cancer with spread to the brain and he wanted to be treated both here and in Salt Lake City. And I, I said, look, not a good idea. He, just go to Salt Lake City. Just be treated there because they've operated on you. Uh, if things go wrong, you have an immediate access. And he didn't like that. And he went to another oncologist who was willing to split his time. And I did the same thing with UCLA. I've, I've told them, no, go one place or go the other. Um, and, and, and so I, it's, it's okay. I, I, you know, I have thick skin. Um, I, I've, I've learned to just accept the fact that I'm not for everybody. <laughs> I'm sort of like P.T. Barnum. You can't please all the people all the time. Um, but, but the reality is that my opinions usually are, are based upon a lot of years of study and reading. And it may not apply to the individual patient, but the general principle that I espouse is usually accurate. And um, if I'm wrong on a, a given patient, um, I'm, I'm wrong. And I accept that. And I will admit that. Um, last anecdote. Um, I'm in clinic. It's Friday afternoon, uh, 24 hours ago. This guy comes in, billed as a kidney cancer patient. He's had his kidney out. And he's got bone pain. And... Um, the doctor says, oh, you've got kidney cancer put to the bone. And uh, I uh, take a history and he says, well, I said, when did you last have your prostate check? He goes, oh, oh 1989, 90, 98. I had a biopsy once. They told me there was something not quite right. I said, what was, do you remember what your PSA was? Oh yeah, it was 18. They thought it was kind of high. I said, hmm. So I went and looked at his x-ray reports and they said, blastic metastases. Well, kidney cancer does not give you blastic metastases. So I, within a minute, I said, okay, you've got prostate cancer. I'm gonna start you on Degarelix uh, from a gun and um, I'm gonna measure your PSA. But I treated him before I knew the PSA. PSA came back at 1900 mm. and um, so he's got metastatic prostate cancer, totally independent of his kidney cancer. So the, you know, the idea that you, you, you think about the disease and, and you think about the history, this guy's probably had prostate cancer brewing in his body for 10 years hmm. and no one addressed it and no one told him about it. So that brings me to the last point. This disease, this prostate cancer is a long journey. Um, you need a you need a partner. You you need somebody to help you sail that at boat. Well, I I think uh, just to go back to the candidness, I I have found it very refreshing. I have found it to I, I think sometimes you got to let people know what they're about to get. I the two cases most recently, I don't know if you remember. There was one was a friend of mine. I was in your office, and he basically had an anxiety attack when you told oh, him yeah. <laughs> you told him something that he had nobody had ever told him, but. After the anxiety attack in the office, he turned around and started handling the disease seriously. And that guy today is an undetectable PSA. And I think part of it was someone was so candid. They said, look, this is serious. This is not a game. You have to take this seriously. Yeah, it's a tough pill to swallow, but this is, you know, this is a serious disease. And I don't think it should be handled flippantly. And I don't think people should be so optimistic to the point where they are painting an unrealistic picture of what you've got to go through. But what's your favorite miracle cure, by the way? I know you've got a million. And I'm so sick and tired of people saying chemo this and talking about bad stories. You know, we live in a very pessimistic world. I know you've seen some great miracle cures. Is there one that just comes to mind where you just thought, holy S, how did this happen? And just walked away going, I love my job. Do you have one of those? Well, the, the themes that come back are prostate cancer is a disease that I have, I'm never sure when I've cured it. I, I don't like to use the word cure, but when I see a guy 10 years out 
who had it in all in his bones and is cancer free, you know, that's pretty gratifying. Um, that, that's, that, that hits me hard. I, I wish I could just relish those moments. The problem is those moments you, you're, you're spending all your time on the other patients trying to rep, reproduce that same thing. Um, but the guy who's been cured comes in and goes, I'm still good, doc. No problems. And you go, see ya. Have a great life. Come back next year. Um, and, and I have enough of those guys to, to make me find that, that key to the next patient's cancer. Not, not the guy that I just fixed, but the next patient's cancer. And I just keep at it. I'm going to keep going as long as I can, even though I'm getting over 70 now. I'm going to keep doing this. You know, but you have, them in, you have them now of all ages. You have young guys, you have older guys, right, that have just had some, suddenly it was there and suddenly it's gone. I can tell the audience that. You've had them. You have yeah. a lot of these guys. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling. Uh, right now I'm dealing with a, a, a difficult case. I, he's a young black guy, uh, HIV positive, BRCA positive, and he's been very skeptical of me. Uh, he's changed doctors and you know, we're trying to establish a rapport. And, and, I, and then I, I, I want to tell them, look, the goal is to get your PSA to zero. I, I know this is painful. I know it's difficult. Um, and, you know, looking at me, I'm a white guy. What do I know? I'm 70 years old. You're 49. You know, I've not been around. I, I don't have HIV. Um, you know, the world world's apart, you know, from, from that perspective. But I'm willing to be your partner. Um, and do, do you want to partner with me is what we're going through right now. And I don't know, you know, I hope I can help them and I want to help them. Well, but you give it, you, you can't, I guess I told my father who's practiced some 50 years. I don't, I never want to see the experience go away because we have so few people with that level of experience. They have something to offer. So you know, the, you know the most interesting thing you said tonight? I mean, you said a ton, but you said that, so you're not retiring anytime soon. I've heard rumors, and, and I've said, I told someone the other day, I said, I, don't, I hope the, I'm going to ask him directly on camera. So you are going to, whether it's part-time or full-time, you are going to stay doing what you do in Vegas, right? Well, Mark, we'll go a little personal. I, you know that I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease when I was in my 30s. Um, I got radiation uh, large amount to my from my neck all the way down to my uh, my pancreas um, that is why I have a bad voice that's why I have a little bit of a stoop that's why I have a, um, a thin neck and unfortunately it's affected my heart um, and so you know my heart is fine I can still do stuff but it's becoming a bit harder as I get older um, and, uh, when I reach a point that I can't do my work, then I will have to medically quit. Um, but right now I've got a pretty cushy job. I sit on my ass and move from one room to the other. <laughs> and then I sit on the telephone and talk to you. So, um, it's not hard. Um, and I love what I do. And, um, uh, I just wish I had more time to write. I wish I had more time to, uh, you know, counsel patients, but, Bottom line is, uh, it's a wonderful life, and uh, I wouldn't give it up for anything. Well said. Just just to make you happy, to show you how much more we're kindred spirits. Your dog's name is Doug. It came from the movie Up, and the voice was Bob Peterson. You can Google it. So who's Bob Peterson? Bob Peterson works at Pixar, and his brother has been my best friend since the age of 22, since college <laughs> graduation. He lives only 20 minutes away from me. We, we see his brother every month. And so I see Bob, the voice of Doug, probably once a year because he comes into town. And he did that voice and he did other Pixar movies. He helped write those movies. So your dog was named after a person whose voice, I actually know that person pretty well. I was, <laughs> I, was at, I was in his wedding, his brother's wedding, and he was also one of the groomsmen. So how do you like that for intersection? My well, friend... Uh, I'm, I'm going to get a uh, I'm going to get a voiceover of uh, Doug. I'll I'll put it in our house so we uh, we have Doug. 
Yeah, and so you'll talk, you'll say, who's the voice of Doug? You'll say Bob Peterson, like Ed Asner was the voice of Carl. And he, and so he did a prostate thing for PCRI not that long ago. And so it all comes together. But look, I don't want to sound too, too mushy here, but this is the longest time we've ever spent, not just me and you, but interviewing someone. And I didn't give a damn because I wanted this to go on forever. And hopefully we can do this again soon. But uh, I really appreciate the time. I know we had Zoom issues. But uh, we've got a lot of good material, and I really appreciate your mentorship, and I really appreciate the fact that I can call you a colleague, and I really appreciate the fact that you and I have published papers together, and so just thank you for being you. I mean, now, not to, again, not to sound a little bit maudlin or, gush or, or, or mushy, but I, I just really appreciate this time with you. I really do. Thank you. Mark, it's really a pleasure working with you, and I, I've enjoyed every minute. Uh, it's been a long afternoon. But you know what? Um, we, we've been able to communicate well. I think the benefit to the patients are that if they want to dig into these kind of interviews and you can segment them and cut them into pieces that are a little bit more manageable. I'm happy to help, uh, happy I have these uh, on, online as long as they need to be uh, because it's a dynamic thing. And what we talked about five years ago isn't maybe relevant today, but um, what we did talk about now may be relevant in five years and hopefully it will be yeah alex peter and the team they'll edit these down in segments like i said it's been seen thousands and thousands of times our little segments on the internet there's some of the more popular believe it or not i had no idea until i started looking at the number so um i think we did a lot of good education today and i really appreciate the time and i just hope you have a i hope you have a great day and i'll talk to you soon thanks mark have thanks. a great week bye-bye bye Bye now good night thanks everyone thank you
Thank you, Dr. Moyad, and thank you, Dr. Vogelzang. I wanted to take a moment to remind you of a few things. You can call our helpline if you have questions about anything in regards to prostate cancer. Also, on our YouTube channel, we post educational videos every week, so subscribe to stay up to date. And if you would like to support PCRI, we are a nonprofit organization. So in the description below the video, there is a donate link, and also there's a donate button below if you're on our conference page. This supports all the videos that we produce and helps keep all these conferences free. Don't forget that you could win a $50 Amazon gift card. We're giving them away all day today. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, go to our conference page, and enter your email and say go blue in the comment box below. All right, next we have our esteemed Dr. Mac Roach. He is a professor of radiation oncology and urology in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Roach has co-authored more than 400 peer-reviewed journal article, book and chapters, and or editorials. And he serves on numerous editorial boards and was appointed in 2013 by President Obama to serve a six-year term on the National Cancer Advisory Board. Without further ado, here is Dr. Roach and Dr. Moyad. Welcome back to the conference. I'm with the one and the only Dr. Mac Radiation Roach, the third, the third. I don't know why you're the third. I don't know who number one and two was. And before I let, before I give him his introduction, I have this introduction from, I think from UCSF. Look how long this is. This is someone that's got a huge ego. Look how look how long this 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 introduction is. This is gigantic. So because of all your accomplishments. So here's the deal for the audience before I introduce probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite, but I won't admit that again. Every time he's been coming to the conference, I've known him for probably 25, 30 years. He always has 6,000 slides. He has so many slides, he could make a book out of them. And so I finally said, this year, we're going to do something totally different. You, you do so well without slides, just kind of talking off the cuff, as long as you're not talking about me. You do really well, and so I don't want you to have any slides. So I'm going to call this my Dr. Mac Radiation Roach the Third. I'm going to call this segment Naked and Afraid. You've got no <laughs> slides. I've never seen you without slides. Yeah. And to me, maybe one of the most famous, if not the most famous radiation oncologist in all of prostate cancer. You can read his bio. It's really long. We're going to talk about some of his accomplishments. He's done it all. I welcome to the meeting Dr. Mac Roach. Well, thank you for that rather lengthy circular uh, uh, um, introduction. But I, would like to, but I would like to, I'd like to turn it around the other way. See, what you're doing is exactly what I wanted you to do. Okay. The best lecture I ever saw at a meeting was given by an older guy who had one slide. And I said to myself, when I grow up, I want to be like him. I want to give a talk with one slide. So you told me, no slide. That's even better. Have you ever seen the movie Ip Man? He's a no, kung fu master. Me. When you're a kung fu master, you can battle with whatever you're given. <laughs> you ever see John Wick? The guy was describing John Wick, and he said, you know, he kills somebody with a pencil <laughs> in a restaurant. You know, it's a, it's a violent movie. Anyway, my point is, I don't really need slides. So I'm, it's my honor to be here. I have to apologize, I'm casual in my house. This is my art smock I use when I'm doing art around the house and repairs. Uh, this is uh, my family room and you'll see art from my, my younger daughter over here, Sarah, my older daughter, Imani, an old painting by myself and some drawings. So I'm just chilling at the Roach crib, happy to talk about prostate cancer. And, and happy to talk to me, this is like one of your dreams. I mean, that you're part, definitely look, president of the Mark that, Tank Club. That part, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, I, you know, this guy right here, okay, this is like, I got you're this. You're going to reveal my gift I gave you already for the conference. I got this in the mail, okay. And I was, like, Azul. I was like, vamos uh, uh, Azul. And I was like, who do I know from UC Berkeley? <laughs> <laughs> it's got the same colors. I'm like, who from UC Berkeley sent this? 
because anybody in their right mind knows I'm not from the University of Michigan. Come on now, Berkeley's yeah. across the bridge. So this is my, I started to put UC Berkeley right here in the front, okay? But anyway, okay. Let's, let's talk about prostate cancer. I know, but tell, tell people why I gave you that gift. Tell them why I gave you this, because besides this, it means go blue in. Vamos Azul means exactly. go blue. Exactly. Right. And I did and that because. Español. Mi exactly. Español is muy limitado, pero vamos Azul, que significa, Go blue in English. Thank you. So to okay. the audience, I talk to Mac offline all the time. He, he's, I definitely am his best friend. <laughs> what I can tell you is he's always trying to learn other things besides medicine, which makes him different than me. I have no talents outside of medicine. So he's taking Spanish classes, correct, to learn Spanish. Sure. This is and true. he takes these classes every week. So I thought, what gift could I give him? So I decided to give him a gold blue and Spanish t-shirt and I got one for myself because I'm selfish and so I thought we would share that moment today and and you ruined it because you opened the gift before we went on the video so it's too bad I've got your gift so let's before we talk about prostate cancer I want to talk about one more thing all this art back here people don't know you're an artist too right will you tell us about your art history and how you've made it on the cover of some journals. And in all, in all seriousness, tell people a little bit about your art talents. Well, in my, the plan was to do, actually I'm writing a book on art, prostate cancer, wine, and quotes. And it's, I won't go into the details except to say that the art part started out about how art can inform science, how the creative part of art, when science gets stuck and don't have enough data to make things happen, then you have to use your imagination. You have to be creative. So art informs science, but there's other aspects of art that I won't go into, but that's how, so I've always wanted to be an artist, but I decided that art was something that I did for pleasure and for fun and for a career, I wanted to cure people of cancer. So I love art. I, whenever I travel around the world, the first thing I do is find out which museums are there, who are the artists. My favorite artist is Picasso. My favorite painter is Van Gogh. And my favorite drawer is yeah. Egan Schiele from uh, the Vienna. If you ever get there, his stuff is not as well known. Some of my drawings behind are inspired by his work. But anyway, I love art. Is the big, is the big piece of art off of your right shoulder, is that, who did that? I did that one. That one, I, that one I did many years ago. It's a very amateur, it's, I've never studied art formally. So you have to, that's a, that's, a, that's a primitive painting of my own, I'm embarrassed to say. But um, I've got better paintings now, but uh, that was a painting I did many years ago. I mean, I think it's nice, but didn't you just have a drawing put on a major medical journal? Uh, some kind of art piece. Yeah, actually, actually, this piece, this piece right here, was on the cover of the Red Journal. Can you tell the audience what the Red Journal means? The Red Journal is the International Journal of Radiation Oncology, Biology, and Physics. This picture here uh, is called Endangered Species, mm. and they had a the editor of the journal contacted me and said, "Mac, I want to do something." In this, in this era of Black Lives Matters and health disparity, do you have a piece of art that might be appropriate? And I sent him a few. I sent him this piece uh, called Endangered Species. I also sent him this drawing here, which might be of interest. This is actually a piece that I call, um, this is Consoling of the Floyds. So this is a drawing of the Floyd family being consoled at, a, at an event. And this other one is a, actually a, a young guy taking his child to a demonstration. Uh, and I was, I think that's, and it's called Raising Your Children. Mm. And it's about how we have to make sure that when we raise our children that we teach them something about moral, Ex moral commitment and excellence and uh, responsibility and so forth and so on. So yeah, so there, there are other things going on in my life. Yeah, but people don't understand that about you. I mean, those are, that's a real talent there. 
So I don't want to have to admit it, but those are really nice. And you've actually got talent outside your job. That's a. Uh, yeah. Now the only thing now you, you didn't appreciate the, 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 the talent, the, the teaching I put on you on the basketball court though. You oh, left that out. I okay. feel sorry for this audience today. <laughs> oh, okay. This is where the embellishment starts. <laughs> so, so you've got, you've got drawings in the, that are going in the, on the cover of very famous journals to go out to healthcare professionals around the world. You're taking Spanish classes. Um, you like wine. You're a big wine connoisseur, right? And uh, I would say I'm a wine snob. You're a wine snob, so I would agree with that. So you got a lot going on. Plus, I think you just turned uh, 85 or 90 years old, didn't you, recently? Now about, as my, my grandmother used to say, now about. <laughs> <laughs> No, you just had a big birthday recently. Actually, my birthday is coming up in about uh, three weeks. And uh, which birthday is that? 67. I'll be 67 in three weeks. I've known you for 30 years. That means... God uh, willing, if I assume I make it that long. Yeah, you will. So uh, tell before we get started, uh, and right in prostate cancer only land, Tell people what you do to stay fit, because generally, as long as I've known you, you've stayed very fit. You've had a couple of moments where things slided or slid, excuse me. But uh, well, tell people what your routine is. I run Lake Merced is about four point is four point six miles. I run that usually. I try to do it every other day, so I do that. I get up. I run about five in the morning. And then the day in between my run, I do sit-ups. So I, I have this thing called an AB chain. I do like 500 of those. Really? And that's my basic maintenance. So people ask me, why do I run? I run so I can eat more food and drink more wine. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah, so I'm a big runner too, as you know. I say I run because therapy is too expensive. Yeah, well. <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, no, same thing. I'm, so I'm glad, you know, you're one of those docs I like that practice what he preaches. So you, you talk lifestyle, but you also have always been a big time runner as long as I've known you. So that's awesome. I'm running a lot. Right. Yeah. Now I'm going to touch on a subject I didn't know if I was going to touch on, but then I thought, and you touched on it, and I'm just going to touch on it briefly. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, but then I thought, you and I talk a lot off camera. We've been talking a lot for decades. And so we talk about it a lot. So why not just let the audience in a little bit on what sometimes what we talk about? So I want to briefly touch on this. Uh, do you have any comment on still what we're seeing? It, it's a very frustrating movement in medicine. We still have such a low percentage of the medical students are African-American. And especially African-American males. I saw a statistic uh, this year that we had the same percentage in medical schools this year that we had, I think, going back 20, 25 years ago. So yeah. we don't have the representation. I know there's all these other things going on, and you alluded to that. But for the sake of this argument, what's going on here? Why don't we have more representation at the medical school teaching level? Well, medicine, level? medicine is just a reflection of the society in general. And uh, there was a time when there were no black men playing basketball. There were none playing baseball. There were none playing football. And uh, there were, black people were not in the film industry. I mean, you know, there was, you know, we finally got a black president. So the bottom line is that medicine is a reflection of society as a whole. And as long as uh, opportunities are not there, then people won't fill in those spaces. And also it requires mentoring, there's obstacles. I mean, it's a whole subject that, but I can tell you that for me personally, I was blessed in so many ways. One of my blessings is my uncle. My uncle, Hank Aaron, home run king for many years. Um, when I was in college, I went to him and I said, Hank, I said, uh, when, I, when did you know you could play? He said, I always knew I could play. And so he had confidence, he overcame adversity, and he was a nice person. And when you have people in your life that you know 
who are accomplished, who have confidence, it helps you have confidence. So that's one of the things I think it's important for me personally is I've always been confident. You revealed one of the secrets I was going to reveal later, but I'm glad you revealed it. It's more organic. And that is that your uncle is Hank Aaron, uh, the baseball, the home run king, really, right? I mean, yeah. so uh, that's incredible that you had him as a mentor. And I think you said something at the PCRI conference last year, if I heard it correctly, when I showed a uh, a snap, a snapshot of that 714. Was it 714 home run? I think you said 715. The, the one I was in the family box. You when were he the broke family the box. Yeah, I was in the family box. But you know the thing about Hank that I really love is, I mean, he has records. You know, he still owns the record for the most runs batted in. So if somebody says, "What is your goal with a bat in baseball?" It's to bring it bat in runs. Hank Aaron is still the all-time run bat in person in, in the league. But I can tell you the kind of person Hank is. I had some people over at his house once, and uh, I was telling them about how when Hank was playing, his, his team would go to some hotels, and because of segregation, his, his teammates would go sleep in the hotel, and he had to sleep on the bus and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Mm. And Hank said to me, what jelly? I wish I had some jelly to go with that peanut butter. <laughs> and he was serious. Yeah. But he was down to earth. The guy said, what jelly? Uh, so, so you know what? Uh, he's, you know, you, you can stay humble when people stay humble who are, who are great. And every, I tell you, the other thing that humbles me while I'm on being humble is cancer. Every time I think, and I'm sure it happens to other people, every time you think you got it figured out, that it's this way and it's simple and it's straightforward, then you're sitting there waiting on a fastball and a curveball is thrown in there and you'll, you know, so you got to always keep. And so one of the things, I think that there's certain advantages to being a, a, a doctor and being black. One is that you know that because something is considered to be fact, that I'm always skeptical about anything. So I always believe in challenging dogma because for example, it used to be fact that black people couldn't vote. It, it used to be that you know there was segregation. You couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. So the fact that I read a paper and somebody from a very fancy institution has written it and says, this is a fact. I'm like, yeah, well, I don't believe that. You know, I'm a skeptic. I like data. I tell my resident and I tell my patients, anything I say, if you say, well, where's the data? Show me, show me why you believe that. Otherwise, I characterize it as, well, I think, you know, there's some theories, there's this, there's that, but, with, but at least there's data, published, peer-reviewed data, or personal experience that I characterize as that, that I try to keep always up front and available to answer questions. I like the fact, I don't remember in any conversation that we shared that. I, I, I always say I have deference for cancer. And what I mean by that is, whenever people come across and tell me, just take this elixir and it gets all cured, or take this pill, I always go, then you don't know cancer. It, if it was that simple, all of us would be out of business. I would love to be out of business. I would love to be your assistant in the art class or basically, you know, you, you help me. You bring me water when I go into the basketball game because I'm such a better basketball player than you. But that's a different conversation. Yeah. Um, but the truth is that's part of what you mean. I mean, it's an, it's, it, you have to have deference for it. It's a horrible well, disease and it's always challenging us. Yeah, well, let me add this part to it too. The other thing is that is when you're my age, when you've been doing this for a long time, we call her, I call myself an OG. Now, if you Google OG, OG stands really for, but depends on what source you use, old gangster. Yeah. And so it doesn't mean you're a gangster. You see, gangsters usually don't get old. So when you're an old gangster, it means that you've learned something along the way. You got a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of wisdom. And I love it. You know, I've been in the field so long that when I'm at a meeting and I get into an argument with a radiation oncologist or a urologist that are, that are in their prime, I can quote papers 
that I wrote 20 years ago when they were in you know, elementary school that they never read before and quote data that goes back, you know, so the longer you're in the field, you know where the skeletons are, you know um, who wrote what, and you know the story behind it, and it definitely gives you an advantage. Now, there are things that they know that I don't know, uh, but uh, my impression is that a lot of that stuff ain't that valuable. So, so. Yeah. Well, okay, so yeah. we got through the fun part, we got through the sensitive right. part, but I, but I got one more piece of sensitive I thought I would tack that on. We haven't talked about this ever, so I okay. thought I would throw it in the question. Wherever you go to our meetings, people talk about, and they love to quote these things. Oh, get a PSA if you're this age, or if you're high risk. And another thing they always say, or if you're an African-American male. And then you see these arguments we have all the time. African-Americans have a higher risk from dying of the disease. And is this something going on genetically? People will argue, pathologists, urologists, radiation oncologists, or is it, is it a reflection of a health disparity that their access access in general um, is inadequate. So where do you stand now with all these genetic studies saying, well, there are these genetic variants we're seeing in some African-American men or these other camps are saying, no, it has nothing to do with that. The more we look at this, it's actually just all straight health disparity that, that many African-American men and families don't have access to care, so they're diagnosed late. So where do you stand on that since I've never asked you? Okay. So I'm gonna give you the short answer and then the, <laughs> then the detailed answer first, okay? Okay. The short answer is garbage in, garbage out, okay? 20 years ago, actually closer to 30 years ago, I was writing papers saying that race was not biologically responsible for differences in outcome between black and white men with prostate cancer. All of these papers were being published saying, oh, prostate cancer is more aggressive than black men. Prostate cancer is more aggressive. And I was going, no, it's not, folks. No, it's not, folks. No, it's not, folks. Mm -hmm. Now, the last time I looked at the data, there were 13, the, if you just take data from phase three prospective randomized trials that have been published, the last time I looked, there were 13 of them that oh, now no. attempted to adjust for race. And if you adjust for race, eight of the 13 studies, there was no difference in outcome by race. So now you're talking about randomized, they come in, they get the same workup, they get the same treatment, the same follow-up, race falls out. Three of them um, actually showed that African-American men did better than whites. And one of them showed that whites did better than African-Americans. The ones that showed that African-Americans tend to do better, and there's one actually in press that's gonna be published soon, um, they were larger and more recent. So all of a sudden, the pendulum is swinging. You know, 30 years ago, everybody would say, oh, the biology is more aggressive than African-American men. The biology is more aggressive than African-American men. And now you got people who are saying, oh, the biology is different in black people and white people, and therefore, you know, black men are doing better. Garbage in, garbage out. Mm. Race is not important. What's important is quality of treatment. Mm. First of all, you can't do anything about people's race anyway. Race is a phenotypic system that is used to characterize people. Most biologic systems are driven by pressures which occur early in, early in evolution or early in life, and there's not much difference between people. Now, we do know that prostate cancer is more common in African-American men. The area where research needs to be done is not in outcome. If you adjust for everything else, there's nothing different in the, different in the biology, but the incidence is clearly more common. And the question is, why is it more common? Well, the most stressed people are African-American men. High unemployment, low education, poor diet, and stress impacts the immune system. So if you take a kidney transplant patient and they get cancer, they're more likely to, uh, you know, to have aggressive disease. So clearly, stress could explain it, but more work needs to be done. But, by, but prostate cancer is not 
more aggressive in African-American men. It is more common in African-American men. And that explains all or most of the disparity in outcome. Quality of care is a factor, but how common it is is a big factor. Okay. Wow. All right. That was a profound moment. I'm here to serve. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing before we talk, we go into radiation the rest of the way. COVID and prostate cancer. I can't, I can't not ask that. Uh, do you have any thoughts about COVID affecting prostate cancer treatment? Have you seen, have you seen people scared to get treated? Do you advise people differently because of COVID? Bottom line, you and I have talked about this okay. off camera. Okay. What do you think? Okay, so, well, we didn't really get into this in any detail, but I, but I can say that first of all, you know, I'm on the NCC and guideline committee. And we met to discuss, you know, whether because, because we were anticipating the same kind of pandemic that happened in New York where, you know, all this stuff was going on. So we started pushing people back. I started deferring consults. We moved to Zoom consults and we were concerned that the medical system was gonna be overwhelmed. Well, it really didn't happen quite that way. So, so we then tried to make up and get people back into the back into the, the, the mill, and we're sort of caught up now. So, but um, I did not expect there to be much in the way of differences. There was very little. We saw, I saw virtually no difference in prostate cancer patients that are HIV positive and HIV negative in terms of how they tolerated the radiation and so forth. So I was not surprised. I haven't treated a patient that's known to be COVID-19 positive, but, 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 but the bottom line is that with the HIV patients, I did treat patients with radiation and we didn't see anything. That's number one. Number two, um, patients, there's an issue of, if you may want to delay people during the pandemic, to stay out of the hospital environment. Although we screen patients and it's very safe, we do know that in Wuhan, a significant number of the people that developed coronavirus, they got it in a medical environment. Mm -hmm. And when the medical resources are being exhausted in terms of the you know, people getting put on respirators and all this other stuff, we wanted to make sure that we're not diverting our resources away from those who need it the most. And, and, and so the discussion came up about is it safe to delay the treatment? And how long is it safe to delay the treatment? And uh, we just finished a paper on this topic where we looked at um, um, patients and we looked at two sources of data. One is data from randomized trials where we took patients, for example, the, the, probably the best one, uh, or at least one really good example is a study called RTOG 9910. That was made up almost completely of patients with intermediate risk prostate cancer. And they were randomized to receive either 28 weeks of hormone therapy before radiation or eight weeks of hormone therapy before radiation. At the time, we thought that, that the 28 weeks would be better than the eight weeks. We thought that the synergism would be more intense with the longer duration. Well, we did the study and it showed that there was no difference in outcome. Now, what that tells us is that if I have a patient that walks in the door with intermediate risk disease, and let's say he's COVID-19 positive, and he's, I want to wait until he's recovered from that to do radiation, I could put him on hormone therapy, and instead of radiating him after eight weeks of hormone therapy, which is the standard amount of time, we can wait an additional 20 weeks safely without compromising his outcome. So in some patients, even if you're going to treat them aggressively with hormones and radiation, we have evidence, at least for intermediate risk patients, that you can delay it. Uh, that's just one example. Uh, but there are, there were more, there were close to 30, ran, there's uh, 30 studies or so based on data from randomized trials that give us insight into what a delay might do. And I'll make, I'll give you one more example. There are two randomized trials, one called RAVES and one is called RADICALS. And those are studies looking at in patients that have surgery for prostate cancer and they have adverse features. Should you, is it, is it best to give them the radiation now or wait until their PSA comes up? And those two studies suggest that if you have 
favorable features in terms of the PSA, the Gleason score, and so forth, you can wait until the PSA comes up. Those two studies do not answer the question about people that have unfavorable features. The people with unfavorable features, that study, that, that, uh, that remains to be determined. But, but the point is that you can wait. So if you have a patient during this pandemic and for whatever reason, convenience or whatever, otherwise, or resources, and they've had surgery, and they had some of the features that were described in those two studies, you can wait and monitor them. And when the PSA goes up to 0 0.1 or so, you can give them radiation then without compromising their outcome. So one body that we used to evaluate delays was a whole body of literature that we can extract from randomized trials. The other body, was more than 40 studies in which people did post hoc analyses where they went back and looked at, you know, we had patients, they were diagnosed at this date. Some of them got treated at one month, some got treated six months, some got treated at a year, you know, what happened? And they also looked at what about low risk patients, what about intermediate risk patients, what about high risk patients? So that literature, now a lot of people would want to do what's called a meta-analysis. That's a complicated thing where you put all the data together. Oh the data was not suitable for a number of reasons. So at least four or five of the papers, the people said, you know, it was our institutional policy that when a man came in and he had aggressive prostate cancer, we would treat him sooner. And those that had less aggressive disease, we tended to treat them a little bit later. So when you do an analysis to look at what the impact of delay is on outcome, some of the studies show that people that had delays did better than people that got treated immediately because there was selection bias in terms of when people got treated. Right. So when you clean up stuff like that and you look at all the details and you look at, basically the problem is that the median time to treatment in most studies was around three months. So they weren't long, and some studies excluded people that had delays more than a year. It's a whole complicated thing. But the bottom line is that if you are a low-risk patient, safe delays are measured in years. If you are an intermediate risk patient, safe delays are measured in months. Mm. And if you are a high-risk patient, safe delays are measured in weeks. Okay. Just keep it simple. Yeah, I like it simple. You know? Yeah. So, 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 okay. delays, so delays can be appropriate and even the best thing for some patients. Now, let me just shift a little bit and talk about the treatment in terms of, again, the COVID-19. What about hormone therapy? Do we have any information on whether or not hormone therapy interacts with the COVID-19 or affects the outcome? And we don't really have good information on that. There is one study from Italy right. where they looked at men who were treated, and it turns out that men who got COVID, who got the, the hormone therapy did better than those who did not in terms of the COVID infection. We're not talking about the cancer. We have data with the cancer, but in terms of the COVID infection. And there's a study from UCSF, which is a basic science research that helps explain some of the pathways and the receptors that might be involved in this. So what we can say is it probably doesn't hurt the COVID-19 patient to go on hormone therapy and wait. It does not appear to impact the biology of the cancer in, in, a, in a worse way or a biology of the, of, of the COVID-19 infection in a worse way. So, yeah. so hormone therapy is safe from a COVID-19 as best we can tell. Yeah, so far it's looked safe. I, the I mean, you know what's also going on since COVID-19 started. Everyone wants to believe that their treatment, their pill, their elixir somehow is magically going to not increase the risk or severity of COVID-19, right. but decrease the risk. And so there is a receptor, the Tempest 2 receptor, and another one that are down-regulated when you uh, suppress testosterone. And people have been arguing, well, that doesn't allow the virus to replicate and bud and go out there. And there's all these great theories. And, and we know now from Italy and other places that more men percentage wise was affected. And we all want it to come down to one little pill or androgen suppression, but it's not that simple. There are a lot of reasons to explain why more men have been affected than women in some of these places, right? 
Well, yeah, the main one is that women are inherently genetically superior to men. So, you know, they got that part. <laughs> we, we, we know that for a fact. You know, they live longer than us. Yeah. You know, well, you, you outkicked daughter, your coverage on your wife. I know that. Daughter, she didn't even hear that. My daughter, my daughter said to me a few years ago, Dad, Mom is smarter than you. And I was like, you know, what's your point here? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I, I agree with that because I've known, I've yeah, known yeah. your wife and daughters for a yeah. while. And your point is what? <laughs> My point is, yeah, you're, you're right. So, uh, all right. All right, now we're going to go into what I call radiation 101. Mm -hmm. I want you to think like a 101 class. The problem I have with a lot of radiation videos, if I go to websites for radiation oncology, they say a lot of nice things but don't say anything. So I want to go through all these types of radiations today because to me, radiation has become like ice cream. There's so many flavors, you don't even know which one to pick. There's just, there's a ton and it seems like there's a new one coming out. So I just want to go through the basics of what patients have options. And maybe you can give your Mac Roach bottom line as to who is a good candidate or not a good candidate or what to look out for. It doesn't matter. Any sort of tip here, why don't we do that? Go through different radiation types, starting with brachytherapy or seeds. I don't care if we start talking about permanent seed implants, no, which no, I know no, you know a lot, no, 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 or no, temporary. No. So first of all, we have to go back. Okay. Because the word radiation is short for electromagnetic radiation, which is light, which is sound. God made radiation in all its forms. Now, when we use radiation to treat, radiation was one of the greatest discoveries in the scientific world ever. Nobel prizes have been given out related to radiation. We would not be able to do CT scans, MRIs, use cell phones. None of this stuff would be possible without understanding radiation. And life would not be possible without radiation. Now, the, the, the wavelength determines what type of radiation we're talking about. So sound waves are really long wavelength and x-rays have a very narrow band and that's what we use. Now, for diagnostic purposes, we use lower energy um, x-rays, which allows us to distinguish between the density of tissues, whether you're talking bone versus air. That's the basis for a chest x-ray. But in the therapeutic range, we tend to use higher energy x-rays because they go through things and they don't care whether they're going through bone or soft tissue. And if the radiation is appropriately placed, it can be a very effective treatment. And I would argue that radiation is the single most active agent in the treatment of cancer, meaning that the spectrum of cancers that will respond to radiation are higher than any other drug that you could give people. And um, radiation has been used to treat prostate cancer for more than 100 years and been shown some people think that, you know, they think about radiation, they think about prostate cancer, but, you know, we treat vocal cord cancer. So people that have cancer, the vocal cords, we radiate them so that they can preserve their vocal cords, so that they can speak. The cure rate is very high. The standard treatment for a low stage vocal cord cancer is radiation, period. Okay, radiation is used in brain tumors. Radiation cures cervical cancers. There are randomized studies of surgery versus radiation in cervical cancer that shows that it's better to treat certain things with radiation. So radiation has been around for more than 100 years. Radiation is older than a retropubic radical prostatectomy. Now, so when you say, what should the standard of care be for treatment of cancer? Should it be surgery? or radiation? What is the gold standard? I think the gold standard should include how long has it been around? How well has it been studied in prospective phase three randomized trials? Radiation has been around longer because the early process, they were limited by the anesthesia. 
Yeah. They were limited by blood loss. They were limited by all kinds of things. So radiation has been around for a long time. If you look at the largest phase three randomized trials ever done in the world for men with localized prostate cancer, they've been, those studies have been done with radiation. These people are enrolled on the studies, prospectively followed with validated quality of life instruments. So the outcomes of radiation have been very well documented in the world literature. So now Mark asked about the specific types of radiation. And as yeah. an artist or a wannabe artist, it's more like, you know, do you uh, use, uh, you know, oil paint, water paint, pencil, charcoal. And when you do radiotherapy, this is one of the reasons that I loved it and decided to go into it, is that you have to see things in a three-dimensional way. Right. It's not exactly what you do always as much as how you do it. Anybody can throw paint on the wall, but yeah. if you have a you good a little paint freeze job, there, uh, you, you got frozen. You got to you got to put tape down and block off the stuff you don't want to get paint on. Am I frozen, Mark? No, not anymore. Okay. No, so, now now it's a little bit better. Okay. okay. But, but we did catch your 20-minute uh, greatest PR for why I should become a radiation oncologist. Oh. Well, um, now we got to get into the meat and potatoes. Okay. So let's go through some of these radiation treatments. And I want to know, according to Mac Roach, what you like, don't like, who's a good candidate, the way I need to perceive it if I'm excited about radiation because they're being inundated by all these radiation types and commercials, and you got to help set me straight. So I thought I would just walk through them alphabetically even, because you, you, you still talk about brachytherapy, but I, I say that not many people talk about it as much as anymore, and I, wa I want you to take me through it. Well, okay, let's start with brachy, because the oldest form of radiation that was used to treat prostate cancer was actually brachytherapy. That's right. And um, there, but brachytherapy comes in two flavors. There's the permanent, where you stick it in there and leave it. And there's the temporary, where you connect it to the person, deliver the radiation, and pull it out. That's called high dose rate brachytherapy. Some call it HDR brachytherapy uh, versus the permanent implant, which is sometimes called LDR, low dose rate brachytherapy. Right. Now, people are frequently confused because they call, they say high-dose radiation, and they're referring to high-dose rate. Actually, the high-dose rate radiation is a lower dose mm. than the low-dose rate radiation. The way to think of it is like if you go to buy a car, you can pay, say, 50000 for the car now, or you could finance it over seven years and pay 80000 Yeah. So the low dose rate radiation is like financing the radiation over a period of time. And the high dose rate temporary implant is like paying for the car in cash. Yeah. They both work. They probably work about the same. The lowest consistent PSAs I've ever seen is with low dose rate radiation. And the total dose is higher. The problem is those people had lower volume disease. So it's not clear that this is an inherent biologic response or a reflection of the patient selection. So no, I'm just gonna, there, there, there's these at, so you, you mentioned that. So that's one misunderstanding. I think HDR is sold as HDR because people think, oh, that might be more effective than, than LDR, then high dose might be more effective than that old permanent seed, but how do you look at it when people want you to say pros and cons and they had equal outcomes, the permanent versus the temporary or I, and then the other side, the other thought I have is that where do you even find these people anymore who do these permanent brachytherapy and these procedures? Well, you got a lot of questions, don't you? I know I do, but I, cause I yeah. want, I okay. want some okay. so here's here's a simple, therapy commercial. Here's the simple thing. Okay. HDR has two major advantages. One is, it's technically easier to do in the sense that you put the needles in, replace the needles with catheters, and then you connect it to a computer, and you can adjust the doses where you are. 
it allows you, and, and the other major thing is from a technical standpoint, the machine from which the radiation comes, that same machine can, that source can be used to treat other cancers. So if you have cervical cancer, GYN cancer, head and neck cancer, you use the same radioactive source over again because it's inside of a catheter and it's still sterile. A permanent implant, you have to carefully stick those seeds where you want to put them and wherever you land, wherever they land, that's where they are. And sometimes one gets outside the prostate, will get into a vein or go, and go to another part of the body. It can go to the heart, it can go to the lung. Most of the times, it's not any big deal. They have to lose an occasional seed. But it, it's a little bit disconcerting. I had a patient that I treated once, and I've done more than 1,500 permanent implants. One patient happened to have a Geiger count. And he, went, he came, called me up and said, Dr. Roach, how come I got a seed in my heart? Mm. Well, so we started using stranded seeds. You know, you, you can get them on a strand rather than free seeds, and that may reduce it somewhat. It may reduce it completely. Depends on where you put them. There's different philosophies about plant uh, implants. There are some people that will consistently place seeds well outside the prostate in order to make sure they have it covered. And there are other people that will try to squeeze them all in the gland. It technically is more challenging. But anyway, permanent implants, you can't use the sources over again because they're consumed. You put them in the patient, you leave them there. So you've got to keep getting shipments of radioactive seeds. So if you're in a developing country, if you're in Nairobi and you want to start doing Reiki therapy, you want to use a machine that you can also use for treating cervical cancer because there's a lot of cervical cancer in developing countries, then to buy seeds that you have to, you know, keep having radioactive seeds imported. And they also, because they're radioactive and they have a short half-life. So if your case gets delayed a week, then you've got to recalculate the plan so the, the, the high dose rate, one of the source is so hot that it, that it takes a long time to decay while the low dose rate, when they're, they're, you know, you got to have it down to the, to, the, to the days, how many days, especially if you use some of the ones with a shorter half-life, some of these sources have half-life of nine days. You know, you say, whoa, you know, if the case gets delayed a week, that's a real problem for you. So, but they both work. And that's brachytherapy. Uh, pretty much the high dose rate also is a little bit more flexible in terms of the size of the prostate because you um, can, that way you can, if you have a really big prostate, you don't have to worry so much about the bone. You can put the catheter in, you can modify the dwell time to compensate for poor geometry in terms of where the catheter is placed. While with a permanent implant, you, you get what you get. And if the bone is in the way, then that's a problem. Having said that, uh, some of the most pleased patients I ever treated got a permanent implant. Oh. They came one time, they had the seeds put in, and they were cured. And some of them um, are very well-known, famous people, very happy people. I would say that the happiest patients I ever treated had a permanent implant, and the most unhappy patients I ever treated had a permanent implant, especially when we use brachytherapy in the salvage setting. So we actually sometimes... The patient's been treated with external beam radiation and they have yeah. a recurrence and I will go back and re and implant them. And that's the kind of thing that should not basically be done in the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's not done as frequently as it should be done, but it should be done by people that have the physics support, the backup and the experience to do it. But salvage brachytherapy of external beam failures is a real useful uh, tool. Why are there, why do I perceive that there's so few people who are competent or busy giving permanent seeds in the United States or possibly, I mean, HDR, I know a number of people, but well, what's, going, what's going on here? What's going on here with the permanent seed game where I don't have a lot of names to refer to anymore? Frankly, a lot of it is driven by reimbursement. It's about the money. I know, but radiation oncologists okay. are like the, are no, the no, no, I'm the talking world. about the reimbursement. So there's reimbursement. Right. And then there's technical skill. So if you, if you don't train enough residents, so if doctors are not motivated to do very many cases because of the reimbursement, 
then you don't get to train the residents. And if you don't have well-trained residents, if you don't have somebody that has a lot of experience and well-trained to do brachytherapy, you do not want to get a permanent implant from them. Right. Most people are not around very much anymore. A lot of the people, the people that train me are not, are not practicing. They're either deceased or retired or whatever. Uh, and, and my residents, some of my residents have never seen a permanent implant case. They see some high dose rate implant cases. Yeah. So HDR has become more popular. Now, in my own practice, I've sort of, I, I went from doing, so anybody that I was treating with curative intent, intact prostate, not a post-op case, I routinely did brachytherapy. If it was a low-risk patient, they got a permanent implant. If it was an intermediate risk place, the patient, they got either a permanent implant or a permanent implant plus external beam and maybe a little bit of hormone therapy thrown in there. And a high risk patient, they, if it was confined, they would get long term hormone therapy, external beam radiation, and a permanent implant. I felt like it was the best cure, the best doses, and everything. I have uh, shifted away. I use more stereotactic body techniques. Uh, I use the, we, there's different brands. You can do it with a linear accelerator. You can do it with, we, we have what's called a cyber knife. I don't want to mark that marketing for, for the cyber knife company. It happens to be the machine that we use. You can do it with the linear accelerator as well. That's a, that's called SBRT. That's, that's what's SBRT, advertised. It's stereotactic body. It's SBRT, right? Now, yes. Now stereotactic body radiotherapy at UCSF was designed to simulate HDR brachytherapy. So when you do radiation, you can generate things called dose volume histogram. This is a dose distribution. This is a geometric printout that shows the rectum got this much and the bladder got this much and the penis got this much and the prostate got this much and all those things. And the way that we were treating people with HDR monotherapy in the old days, 950 times four. So we took the robotic device, the cyber knife robotic device, and we generated dose distributions that looked the same as the HDR. And we started giving 950 times four. And, in, and also in those people that were getting external beam plus a HDR implant, we went from to external beam plus SVRT boost, we gave 950 times two like we had done. So we had a proven track record of a certain dose to a certain volume over a certain period of time. And we just changed the device. So instead of using a, a um, synthetic paintbrush, I started using a, a natural paintbrush, you know? So, so, so I'm now doing more, and it's just part of it is convenience for me. Cause I'm over at Mount Zion hospital and we have the cyber knife machine there and the, the brachytherapy, the, the operating room is at Mission Bay, and I don't want to go down there. And I think I'm getting good results. And, and part of it is my own personal experience with certain specific patients that convinced me that this was a good way to go. In fact, I've moved from doing, so the traditional sequence is external vein for five weeks followed by the implant, or external vein for five weeks, followed by the cyber knife treatment. I have now flipped it and I do the cyber knife treatment first and then I do the five weeks of external vein radiation. And as I tell my residents, I have five reasons for wanting to do it, but I'm not gonna go into all those five reasons except to say that I had, the, the, what, what got me, the, I like to make the analogy with boxing. For those of us who are old enough to remember seeing Mike Tyson back in the day when he was in his prime, when the bell rang, he came out to get you, <laughs> okay? That's the way I like to radiate prostate cancer. I like to hit the cancer with a couple of really big shots, and then I start throwing the combination. But I like to go for the knockout. And I think the, 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 the uh, SBRT treatment up front may be biologically more effective. I had one patient that had 15 out of 15 cores positive for Lisa 9. He was completely blocked, obstructed. Yeah. And I treated him in that sequence. And I had several others. We actually had a poster at a meeting on palliative care of what to do when men presented with obstruction. And I never saw obstruction go away as quickly or as completely using the sequence of the what I call the reverse boost. 
hitting the prostate hard up front and followed by external vein. The other thing is that we know that small field radiotherapy stimulates the immune response. So mechanistically, I'm thinking, you know, maybe when you hit the cancer like that, you break up cancer cells, they go throughout the circulation as sort of a type of auto vaccination. They tell the immune system, look here, there's a cancer floating around this guy's body. Everybody get busy and get to work on this. And I like to do that before the pelvic radiotherapy because pelvic radiotherapy can be immunosuppressive. So I like to hit the cancer hard, real heavy up front. And then uh, I'll just finish with the third with the third issue. There's five. There's a couple of other reasons I like it. They're more logistical. But one is that there was a randomized trial that was conducted by somebody from Michigan, um, from that area, from the Detroit area. I hate to, you know, there's actually some pretty good prostate doctors in that Detroit area. Actually, some of the best. Yes. And there's a guy named Jeff Foreman, who unfortunately is deceased now. Yeah. He did a randomized trial of neutron radiation first to the prostate, followed by pelvic radiation, versus pelvic radiation followed by neutrons to the prostate. And it turned out the people that got the neutrons first did better in terms of their biochemical control. So I think that the stereotactic body radiotherapy with the cyber knife is somewhat analogous to the neutrons first. Mm -hmm. So I think from an efficacy standpoint um, that I like to do the reverse boost. Now the problem is, what I've noticed is that if a patient walks in with obstructive symptoms due to cancer, the reverse boost will improve their urinary symptoms. If they walk in with no urinary symptoms, it makes their urinary symptoms worse. Because if you don't have urinary symptoms, all you can do is get worse. If you're blocked by cancer and you get rid of the cancer quickly, yeah. then your urinary symptoms get better. So uh, it, it, it is a factor that, e, but I still prefer the sequence. So the sequence that you described, you say SBRT for how many days on average, then move to the other? I give two treatments. Nine two treatments over two days? Yeah, two days. How long, how long does each treatment take the SBRT? How it long? It takes long? about 35, 45 minutes. With the okay. side. It's faster with a linear accelerator. If you use a linear accelerator, you can do it faster. Okay. So... This is, this is all the rage lately. This is all the advertising in your field. Like I said, there's so many different flavors of ice cream, but the flavor of the year, in my opinion, whenever I travel, or I used to travel, I'm not allowed to travel anymore, is uh, SBRT, right? So this one form is CyberKnife, right? That's the type you talked about. They're advertising one week and you're done. That's yeah. all you get. So now can you explain to the audience how people watching can go one week with radiation therapy five days in a row, or I know there's different sequences and be done with their treatment. Well, Will you explain who's a good candidate for that? Okay, so let me clarify one thing. That's weird, you're correcting me. Uh, no, 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 no. You know, so it's, so um, when you, the more accurately you give radiation, the tighter you can make it. So, so think of this, this is the prostate, right? Think of my head as the prostate, right? Yeah, that's the scary when I was prostate. A, when, I, when I was a young man, I had hair. I was a resident at Stanford. We used to draw the radiation fields with a crayon. We'd have a set of orthogonal images, AP and a lateral. Mm. And we would shoot contrast of the urethra, put contrast in the rectum. We would take a CT slice, one slice, and we would run the dose distribution on that one slice at the middle. And we would use either an eight by eight or a nine by nine field. Okay. Okay. But, um, and we, and back in those days, not just at Stanford, everywhere, we assumed that the prostate did not move. Part of the reason why we assumed that was because we didn't have anything we could do about it anyway. So you might as well just assume it's still there, you know. So in about 1986, there was a guy from Michigan. I mean, the, the Michigan people come in handy every now and then. He was a physicist named Randy Tenhock. 
He wrote a paper. He showed that, guess what? The prostate position is moving around. So, and then also Michigan, they had the first FDA approved 3D planning system called Scandi Plan. Mm. And the guy who was chair of the department happened to have trained at UCSF. So as soon as he got this and got it approved, one of the first institutions to get it was UCSF. So I came to UCSF 30 years ago, 1990. And I arrived and they have a 3D planning system and I had never seen one before. We didn't have them as a resident of Stanford. And um, so at that time, you know, I could talk about how things evolved, but the bottom line is that People didn't understand 3D. They didn't understand dose volume histograms. 3D evolved to, I mean, so conventional radiation, which is what I was taught as a resident of Stanford. Yeah. 3D, we helped pioneer. We were involved in the art, the, the, we had the first, the RTOG did the first studies in the early 90s on a dose escalation using 3D. We then, in the early 2000s, uh, the NCI sponsored something called the NCI IMRT Working Group. IMRT is Intensity Modulated Radiation. You use computers and leaves to modify the leaves, so that, and you use optimization algorithms to limit the doses. And then we helped pioneer some of the work with image guidance. One, of the, one example of that was the first paper we wrote in 2006 or 2007 in post-op patients, where we took patients who had had radical prostatectomy, they were gonna have radiation to cure them, and we implanted gold seeds in the anastomosis where the prostate used to be. Right. And we imaged that every day before treatment and we could adjust the beam to make sure that we hit the right spot all the time. We also published probably, I think it's the first paper I ever had that was accepted with no modifications. We had, we had three patients that had morbid obesity. And we, uh, we put gold marker seeds in their prostate and we showed that in people that had morbid, the standard of care used to be to line people up on their tattoos. Right. We showed that if you line people up in their tattoos who were morbidly obese, you see, you can move those tattoos wherever you wanted to, right? right. You, you could completely miss the prostate. In other words, you bring the patient on the table, you put the patient on the table, and you line up the beams, and you give the radiation, and the prostate was completely missed. That's not good, because you don't cure the cancer, and you radiate something else, and that's bad. So that's how image-guided radiation got to be evolved is that guiding, you know, that image guidance allowed us to make the fields tighter and tighter and tighter. So okay. when we went from conventional radiation to 3D conformal radiation to intensity modulated radiotherapy to stereotactic body radiotherapy. SBRT. SBRT, the body, the, when we use the CyberKnife, for example, it is tracking motion. So you got seeds in there and the beam is like, well, you know, if you move over here, we're going to go over here. If you go over there, we're going to move over there. Uh, which you need to do if you're going to shoot somebody over 45 minutes because air and gas and motion can occur. With a, with a linear accelerator, it doesn't track the same, but the treatment is given over a shorter period of time. So it's sort of six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. You either, if you do it, if it takes longer to deliver, you got to track it. If you do it quickly, you just need to line it up, make sure everything is set and hit it. So you believe that all these people going gaga and all excited about SBRT, getting five treatments and being done, that ultimately it will show to be equal efficacy to many of the other treatments. So is, is that what you're saying? You're saying that these so, advertised five days of treatment and you're done with SBRT is actually real? There, well, there's randomized data. I know, but this is, you know, we don't have a lot of randomized data. We have okay. some. So I'm but just noticed you noticed I said four treatments. Five treatments is most frequently used because they get more money. We developed our own technique because we were using, we were reproducing the our experience with HDR. 
the way that the way the reimbursement was set up for stereotactic body radiotherapy is that the per treatment charge is greater than a conventional IMRT charge, but they capped it. They said we will pay you SBRT for no more than five treatments. Uh. So many doctors say, well, five, okay, I'm gonna do five treatments because you get paid for each treatment. We did not change, we meaning some of us in our institution did not change because I didn't change because I could get paid for five. I used what we knew, what we learned based on what we, what we were doing. So right. I used four. I treat Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, or Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. Give one day off in the and middle. You, and you believe that, like in other cancers, this will, be, this will ultimately show it to be, for some patients, equal in efficacy to going weeks and weeks of radiation treatment. OK, look at the data. No, I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not questioning it. I'm just asking. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a data person. So, you know, Jackson has a paper review article with 6,000 patients. Keyshawn has an article with other, you know, we wrote a paper on unfavorable intermediate and high-risk patients. There's papers on PSA kinetics, right? So one of the things you look for when you're comparing forms of radiation is what does the PSA do? We know we published years ago that if you took a patient and you compared, we took low risk patients and we compared those patients that got conventional external beam radiation, dose escalated to brachytherapy. What did we see? We saw two big differences. One is that if you did it, serial MRIs with spectroscopy, you actually measured the metabolism of the gland. The gland was more atrophic after MRI. Choline citrate ratios, uh, that are normally high, they it was complete, they're more likely to have complete metabolic atrophy with brachytherapy. Yeah. And the median PSA, when you look at a patient treated with external beam radiation, after a number of years, excuse me, three to five years, the average PSA is around 0 0.4. Okay? Okay. But if you look at those patients that are treated with brachytherapy and LDR implants, our median PSA is less than 0 0.1. Mm. So there's less metabolism, both normal and cancer, and the PSA is substantially lower with brachytherapy. Now it appears that HDR is just about the same. Maybe yeah. a LDR might be a little bit lower. That means the PSAs may actually be a little bit lower, but again, there's patient selection differences. I tend to, the higher risk, higher volume patients tend to get treated with HDR. So more recently, people have done, and Kishan has done a lot of this work, and we've done some of this work. We've compared the PSA level and the, P, the rate at which the PSA went down with SBRT versus HDR, and it appears to be similar. So if you give the same doses to the same volumes using the same fractionation and the PSA does the same thing, if it swims like a fish, and it smells like a fish, and it tastes like a fish, it's a fish, I'm convinced that HDR and, and, and SBRT, if given, now again, I don't use the fractionation that these people use and are doing these five fractions. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm right. saying that our fractionation and our dose volume histograms are done to match HDR. So in our hands, I believe four fractions of SBRT are roughly equivalent to four fractions of HDR. And the other thing that we do when we do SBRT, and not everybody does this, is we do MR and CT. After we have the gold seeds placed, we do MR and CT. Before you go there, will you please explain to people who have not had a procedure yet, why are you even placing seeds in, in my prostate? Okay, so these gold seeds, they're 1.1 by 3 millimeters, they're 24 karat gold. If you use lower um, than 24, there's probably a higher infection rate. Okay. So some people had problems. So 24 karat gold, 1.1 by 3 millimeters. As I stated earlier, back in 86, Randy Tenhocken showed the prostate was moving. Putting the gold seeds when you have, when you use electronic portal imaging, you're out, the therapist is outside the room. They can actually see where the prostate is 
and we line the beam up to the prostate and we do SBRT the, and with IMRT, the, we make sure the prostate is lined up to match what it's supposed to be based on the plan. And how many gold seeds do I get and how long does it take to put those in my prostate? Well, we usually put in three, but sometimes four. And uh, we have our urologists do it. Um, okay. Some places the radiation oncologist does it. And it stays in permanently? I can't take the gold out and sell it, right? No, it stays in permanently. No, it's about two cents worth of gold. So, you know, you might, Not anymore. <laughs> you better leave it in there, okay? You don't want to go in there and try so to it get it. It stays in permanently, right? It stays Seriously. in permanently. Okay. And then how long after the seeds are placed can I get my radiation to start? Well, we usually recommend about a week, but okay. we used to do it in the middle of treatment. I mean, you can do it. The problem is when you place the seeds, the seed, the, where the seed is placed, you can have a little tiny bit of swelling, just like when you have blood work done, right? right? So you can have a little bit of swelling. And so the seeds may not be perfectly settled completely. So we like to wait a few days and let that edema come down. We did yeah. a study uh, about 15 years ago or so. We took patients immediately before a brachytherapy permanent implant. Shunahara measured the volume of the prostate. After the permanent implant, he measured the volume of the prostate again. The prostate was 20% bigger mm -hmm. after the implant. Mm -hmm. So when you stick needles in the prostate, you can have swelling. So one of the reasons that I have moved more to SBRT instead of brachytherapy is not just my convenience and not just because I saw that these things were unobstructed faster, is because we don't need to use anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And when you do an HDR implant, you're going to give the same dose, the same volume, but first you're going to stick needles in there. And with, with SBRT, other than the little gold seeds that are placed, no anesthesia, less invasive, more convenient. Uh, if the patient's on drugs like anticoagulation, you don't have to worry so much about stopping them that you would need if you're sticking needles in there. Uh, so, so there are other reasons that, and it may be, it's possible that SBRT is actually better than HDR because of the lack of trauma to the gland and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the fact is you don't need anesthesia. I mean, I have never sat down with you and heard you sound like such a walking advertisement. Not, I'm saying, not saying that in a bad way, a walking advertisement for the excitement around SBRT, that you really think it's all that and is where we're moving to a large extent. Well, well, look at it this way. A certain specific patient that 25 years ago, I used to treat with 40 treatments. Yeah. I now treat with four treatments. And I think the treatment is as good or better. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, so actually, so, you know, the, the folks in the UK, my good friend, David Dennerly did a study called the CHIP study. It's the biggest study done on localized prostate cancer. It wasn't a survival endpoint. He compared three types of treatment, conventional radiation or hypofractionated radiation. Now, when we do SBRT, we call that ultra hypofractionation because we're going down to four. But he went from like 39 or 40 treatments down to 20 treatments, 300 times 20 versus your typical 200 times, you know, 39 or so, right? And he concluded that you can do just as well with, um, with, 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 with 20 treatments. The, um, the problem is, that, and so they, it's called the CHIP study. So Dr. Dennerly was retiring and he was leaving to the world a new standard of care of going from basically 40 treatments to 20 treatments. And I love David, he's a great guy, but I'm like, why do I want to go down to 20 when I can go down to four? <laughs> right. I mean, 20 is good if you don't have the technology to do SBRT accurately. Okay. Then fine. I think it's a reasonable. And the other problem is that that technique was used in patients who only receive radiation to the prostate. If you're treating a higher risk patient, I would argue that you might want to consider treating the pelvic lymph nodes. And in which case, your 20 would have to come down to 
you know, you still have to do the, you'd have to figure out what, because that, a big field that includes the pelvic lymph nodes includes the bowel, and you don't want to treat 300 a day for 20 treatments to the bowel. Yeah. So you'd have to figure that out. And for me, what I do is I do traditional fractionation for the bowel, and then I do the SBRT. I give two treatments as a boost rather than, um, uh, you know, the protracted course. So I can treat with 27 treatments for a high-risk patient, do conventional fractionation to cover the lymph nodes, if the patient has a PET positive scan with cancer in a, in a lymph node, yeah, I treat five weeks, but I give that 6,000 hypofractionated. I use like 240 a day to the PET positive node and then do a boost to the prostate. And like I said, I tend to prefer a reverse boost over a forward boost, but I don't have any proof that that's better, but it's just my impression that it's a good way to go. So... I've told you this. I've talked to well, when I talk to surgeons and radiation oncologists. I always say the greatest advertisement for surgeons and prostate cancer is the following statement: "I know this is going to make you raise your eyebrows and you're going to get mad, but the reality is, it is the reality." And that is, if you sit down with someone, you can say, "Hey, well, if I take it out and it comes back, then you can still get radiation and get a cure." However, if you're radiated up front, and it comes back, you can't get surgery. We know there are exceptions, but you can't get surgery. But what I, the reason I'm telling you this is that a lot of radiation oncologists are really bad at advertising the fact, and I want you to comment on this, that you can get radiation after radiation. In other words, if it comes back after radiation, you're not done. You can still get radiation again and try to get that spot or spots within the prostate. Please comment. I would say over the last 30 years I've been at UCSF that I've probably been told maybe 150 times that, that, that whole point. Uh, Dr. Roach, but if I have, uh, if I have uh, surgery, I can get radiation afterwards. I get radiation, I can't have radiation. And um, first of all, you can have surgery after radiation. I could give you 20 papers, 30 papers, with you some can. of which are large series showing surgery after radiation. It usually isn't done because the patients who choose radiation tend to be older. They tend to be people that had more advanced disease. But uh, the fact is that you can have surgery after radiation. The complication rate is higher, though. Right. Now, Big time. Um, but we have re-irradiated many patients. I would say probably close to on the order of 200 patients who had radiation first, had a recurrence. Of course, most of them came from somewhere else, you know. No, not you. <laughs> most, most of them came. But if a person has radiation first, it is possible to radiate them and cure them. However, there are some general principles there. First of all, you cannot give full dose radiation to the same volume that you would treat with the same doses as though they did not have radiation. You cannot ignore the radiation they had. Okay, that's number one. You have to, you have to go back, and let me tell you what I do. I get the radiation that they had originally, preferably in an electronic form, and put it in our computer and bring up the previous treatment. Then I figure out what, where the cancer is and where I want to give radiation again, and I generate a composite plan that shows their old radiation and their new made radiation to make sure that if there's overlap, I know where it is and minimize the overlap. Specifically, you don't want to overlap in the urethra or the rectal wall. You don't want to get a fistula because a fistula can ruin, can ruin a patient's life. Some patients would rather have progressive cancer than to have a fistula. So the ideal patient for what we call salvage radiation, radiation treatment of a radiation recurrence, is a patient who uh, is a long time interval between their old radiation and their new radiation. One of the things I was taught as a young guy was that, now I don't know that this is actually true, but this was the teaching. The teaching was you lose about 10% of the dose a year. That means that you get some tolerance that you can give radiation again. It's old information, you know, it may be wise tale, but, you know, time also allows you to figure out, you know, whether there's a complication or not. Right. 
And typically it means that the recurrence is a slowly growing recurrence, right? So that if you catch it early and it's a slow and growing, uh, slow growing recurrence, and if it's isolated on one side of the prostate, that's an ideal patient. Mm -hmm. So a patient had prostate cancer, they had cancer in their right base, in their right mid gland, in 1995, they got external vein radiation, their PSA went way down, it started coming back up. You do MR spectroscopy, you do biopsies, and, and the PSA is still pretty low, but it's positive biopsy right where it used to be. What I do is I just implant where it used to be or treat where it used to be. I've been using SBRT for some of those as well. So we've even used SBRT to, uh, to do salvage radiation. Now I have a preference for the technique depending upon the nature of the primary treatment. So for me, if I see a patient that had a permanent implant and they have a recurrence, depending upon the nature of the recurrence, I prefer the, the easiest patient to implant in a salvage setting are people that had a terrible implant to start out with. Mm. So if, they, if the doctor that did the implant missed half of the prostate anyway, I just implant the half they missed right. and create a composite plan that looks like the implant they should have had from the, from the get-go. Yeah. You know, so, so these are the nuances. This is the art of radiotherapy. It's patient selection, trying to figure out what part of the prostate's involved, what part of the prostate's not involved, what doses you can give. One of the reasons I like to do permanent implant salvage or permanent implant failures is because I can actually see where the seeds are. When you yeah. do external beam radiation, you're like looking at a computer. You can see where the seeds are, and then you can match the other seeds so that they line up. And when it's all done, you go, see? That's what it should have looked like. Those patients do very well, very successful. Now, we don't see as many patients who have permanent implants anymore. So, so that's something. So our series that we did, we had 15 patients. We published one of the first series on brachy salvage or brachy failures that had, a, that had, you know, it was a pretty good number of patients, 15 patients with reasonable follow-up showing excellent results. So we've had great experience with both permanent implant salvage, HDR salvage, and now we have some data with SVRT salvage. So salvage radiation is a realistic option in patients who have recurrences in the prostate. Now the other recurrence that we see are patients who got treated with radiation and they recur outside the radiation field. That happens most commonly where the patient did not have their pelvic lymph nodes treated. It also happens in post-op patients, patients have a radical prostatectomy and the cancer, they, they have a recurrence and it's in the lymph nodes. And we're picking more of those up because of PSMA PET and axiom and PET scans where we, um, 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 you know, image them with PET scans and we find, oh, there's a lymph node that lights up and we treat those. So those recurrences are outside of the radiation field or outside of the surgical bed, but sometimes in the bed. Well, you just spent the most time in my 30 year career admitting that you can radiate after having radiation and they call it salvage. And I just don't know why more people don't mention that because you get clobbered Look, you get clobbered when that statement goes out that you can have surgery first and then radiation, but not vice versa. And so I'm just glad, well, you, I'm just glad you elaborated on that. But let me just say, I, I watch this video and I go, okay, I want Mac Roach to give me my SBRT for four treatments because I know he's not paying or buying more art with five treatments because you know he makes more money with five. So uh -huh. He's going to give me four treatments and then I come back and I recurrence are you saying that even after SBRT if it comes back you can hit it with more SBRT or do you generally choose something else how does that uh, I usually choose with, something with, else uh, salvage but let, me, but let me add one additional disclaimer first of all I said uh, you know they make more money I'm a salaried employee of the University of California the <laughs> University of California would get a higher reimbursement if I use five fractions but that's not how I decide to manage patients. So, and some, I'm not saying that people that use five fractions are trying to get more money. I know, so we're just That's joking. how they were trained. I they understand. were resident at a place, that's how they treated it, or they read it in a paper. I and know. I have no problems with people using five fractions. But I can tell you that the bio, the BED, the biological effective dose of the four fraction regimen 
is higher than the standard five fraction regimen. And I feel more comfortable with it. I like the convenience of finishing in one week. Uh, so, um, so, you know, about, uh, you know, the money thing isn't really. No, really no, I know. I, I just threw it. So you've been hanging out with too many serious people. That was a joke. See, when, at least when you hang out with me, you realize once in a while we're going to have some jokes. It's not going to be all serious medicine talk. So let's hey. go back to the question. You get four, five, 28, doesn't matter. You get four or five SBRTs. It comes back. Are you saying I can get radiation again with SBRT or do you just prefer something else in that situation? Okay, now, it's important to understand there are some, there's a series from Harvard that looked at salvage, they did a really nice study with salvage, breaking, salvage therapy after radiation failures and had horrendous complications. There's a series from Europe that had horrendous complications and bad results. Okay, the yeah. failure rate was like this. Well, okay, first of all, in both of those cases, they did salvage radiation, but they tried to treat the entire prostate. And, and particularly the series from Europe, they pick, they pick people that had pretty advanced recurrences. So one of the take home messages is that patient selection is really important and how you do the implant or how you do the salvage radiation is really important. So in, in treating cancer, it's not always what is done, it is how it's done. So when we, our experience, my experience with salvage radiation, I do, sometimes you have people talk about focal therapy and they say, what's the role for focal therapy in prostate cancer? I think there is zero role for focal therapy in prostate cancer, except in the salvage of radiation failures where you use focal therapy to treat a focal recurrence. Can you tell the audience what you mean by focal therapy? One example. Some people will do HIFU, they'll do cryosurgery, they'll take a patient, they'll, they'll, they'll try to ablate one part of the prostate. Well, first of all, if the patient's disease is so mild that they only have a little bit of cancer in one part of the prostate that has a low Gleason score, they ought to be on active surveillance. Yeah. Those treatments, those focal therapies cost money and they have morbidity associated with them. So focal therapy is, in my opinion, pretty much a worthless thing. I mean, the patient probably didn't need treatment at all, period. Now, if the patient has disease that needs treatment. So if you look at patients who undergo radical prostatectomy, let's say they have a Gleason 7. And I love this series. There's a series from the Mayo Clinic. I know the surgeons don't like this series, but I like the series. One of the problems with prostate cancer, when we talk about intermediate risk, a patient can be intermediate risk using the Nico classification if they have a PSA between 10 and 20, or if they have a Gleason score of 7. Those things are not equal, not equal. So the thing I like about this paper from the Mayo Clinic, they had a, a study that had Tolison is the first author, published, I think, 2006, 2007, Journal of Urology. 1,688 patients, Mayo Clinic, one of the highest ranked hospitals, urology programs in the country, 1,688 patients, all Gleason 7s, average PSA around six. They underwent radical prostatectomy. What was their cure rate? Well, at 10 years, 48% of the patients that had Gleason scores of three plus four were biochemically controlled. And for Gleason four plus threes, it was 38%. Less than half, 48%, 38%. That's what taking the entire prostate out. So if you don't cure a hot, and now those results, other people may have better results, but let's say instead of it being 50-50, let's take half of those. Let's say it's only a 20% recurrence rate at 10 years. The fact is they took the whole prostate out and they still had recurrences. I don't think it's gonna be safe to do focal therapy on people with Gleason 7s. Most patients that have prostate cancer do not have prostate cancer. They have prostate cancers, multifocal disease. 
Once you have a Gleason 7, you start to have to worry about microscopic metastases, the lymph nodes and stuff like that. Focal therapy is only makes any sense in low risk patients for whom the best treatment would be no treatment. Okay. So I'll, I'll oh, have to except, except focal therapy. So, so, so here's the situation. We know a man mostly has multifocal disease. Yeah. He had a lesion in his right base that he was treated 10 years ago. We treated the entire prostate. So if he had microscopic disease in other parts of his prostate, that dose was probably adequate. He probably recurred in the same place that he had cancer because it was adequate for controlling low volume disease that we did not find, but not adequate to sterilize the high volume disease, which we, do, which we, which, which we did find. And so we've shrunk that thing down and now it's started to grow back. Those patients are perfect patients for focal therapy. Okay. Man, you know, do you realize we've gone about an hour and a half? This is the longest we've ever gone. I, I well, think I, I think too much time talking about the other stuff. We no, we did it. No, we did that about 20 minutes. It's just, yeah. it, it's just with you without slides, I'm letting the audience see what I got to deal with on the phone once every couple months where I get these long lectures, but they are very interesting and I do learn a lot. But well, I want to get, I want to get the more basketball stuff. with my Warriors were putting a whooping on your basketball team. You don't oh, have a basketball you, team. Cleveland. You don't even have an Cleveland arena. Guy, and we put a whooping on you a few times, okay? So just remember that, okay? <laughs> this is where it gets ugly. All right. So I'm going to ask you one more type of radiation, then we're going to go through the lightning round. Because otherwise, okay. we're going to push two hours, and the whole conference is going to be 99% roach. 1% more yet. Now you can count me. You just cut it short. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't. I, I wanted speed all that. It up. <laughs> I, no, no. I didn't want to speed it up. I wanted that. I, I have 30 years of Mac Roach on slides. I don't have one oh, single man. lecture of Mac Roach getting up there and speaking his opinion and data. And I'm telling you, if you watch this whole tape already, people are going to learn a lot. All right. Be nice and be curt. I'm this trying time. to. I'm trying no, to be nice. I, I don't even, I don't even, want, to, I don't even want to bring don't this up. Angry black man. Just, I, <laughs> I, I don't even want to bring this up to you, but proton therapy. Proton's the only type of radiation we really haven't talked about today. Who's, who's a really good candidate for proton therapy, and how do you feel about proton therapy right now? And there's an old joke I like to say, because I'm I'm I did well in physics like you did that you know, the, the good thing about people who give proton therapy is they generally tend to be positive people. Ba bum boom boom all right. Tell us about proton therapy and your latest thoughts on it. Uh, well, you know, I started out talking about the word electromagnetic, you know, about, about radiation. So protons are a type of radiation. And when we, when we measure types of radiation, one of the things we look at is the radiobiological effectiveness. This is a metric to say, how effective is this radiation at killing cancer? Proton radiation has approximately the same effectiveness as X-ray radiation or photon radiation. So if you give the same dose of radiation to the same volume, you should expect to get the same results. Now, some people are confused by the marketing that some of the centers have had. There were many years ago, I'm not gonna mention the specific institution, but they had this, this, they had this website and they would show a proton beam coming in and stop it. And they would show an x-ray beam going Shh, And they would say, yes, but the proton beam is reduces the dose to normal tissues. Well, first of all, nobody uses one beam. And you use many beams or several beams. And so that's a problem because it's, yeah, when you do protons, the big dose stops and x-rays the dose go. But what you really want to know is what the composite is. And actually the Harvard group wrote one of the best papers many years ago comparing the doses to surrounding tissues with protons versus, versus IMRT, and they're about the same. The other thing that's a, bit, that a, that's a bit misleading is yes, the edge of the beam does stop with protons, but they don't know exactly where it stopped. It's called range uncertainty, which is affected by you know, things that are in the field. So typically speaking, the image guided techniques that are used for photon or x-ray based stuff 
is more sophisticated. Online image guided tracking, part of the reason that a lot of people you stick balloons in the rectums of people that are getting protons is because they can't figure out how to keep track with the prostate moves because the proton beam is, is more sensitive to differences in the density of tissue around the prostate. So you got bone around the prostate. When the prostate moves with x-rays, you can move the x-rays. The x-rays don't care whether you're going through bone or soft tissue or air so much. Protons, when you move the center, if you move the beam, the bone will, will impact the proton beam more than the x-ray beams have impacted. So they stick a balloon in the rectum to try to prevent the prostate from moving so much and then they try to use lateral fields. Well, first of all, there's some inaccuracy with how you put the balloon in and out of the rectum every day. I haven't met too many people that really wanted to have a balloon every day, although there's an interesting psychology behind there. These men, are, there's these brothers of the balloon. There's some people that are like, it's like a cult. I got my balloon in my rectum and I've got proton beam radiation. Well, good for you, you know, but the fact is that the, the radiobiological effectiveness and that proton beam is the same as the x-ray beam. And uh, so I used to tell people, if you live down the street from a proton center and you want to get protons, go for it. Now, those people that do protons with, have told patients, well, you know, there's less scattered to surrounding normal tissue. Well, that's true. If you want to do even less scattered to surrounding normal tissue, do brachytherapy. Brachytherapy will give you a higher dose to the prostate and less dose to surrounding normal tissue than protons. So, you know, there are good things and bad things about the various forms of radiation. Uh, protons are overrated as an as a, as a, as a option, but we, uh, I've actually designed a new study, which isn't open yet, it's called SHIP. Stereotactic heavy ions versus protons versus photons for prostate cancer. So I've proposed a randomized phase two study where we compare carbon versus protons versus photons. Now carbon is another type of charged particle which actually has theoretical advantages over protons. One being that it has an RBE of three. So it's sort of like in boxing, you know, um, when you can hit somebody or you can hit them real hard. Carbon hits harder than, than protons. Proton hits about the same as photons. And carbon theoretically has some other advantages in terms of being able to image the biologic dose distribution. Because of other radioactive species that are created when you give carbon, you can actually image that with a, with a PET scan. So there are, there are reasons to think it might be better. I'm skeptical. I think you can, you know, I think there are issues related to fractionation, imaging, precision, and so forth. Um, so, but, um, but, but protons are okay. Okay. Well, you were kind of nice. I'm actually surprised. I was scared to even ask you that question. I, just thought, the I, was facts, just the I facts. thought I was going to have to put a helmet on. Just the facts. Just the facts. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to keep jumping around the last 20 minutes. I'm going to take this almost to two hours, which again is like, man, that's the longest I've ever spent with you. Uh, <laughs> so that's not a bad thing. I mean, I like it, but there's so much more to pick your brain on. All right. Patient comes in, says, Dr. Roach, I think that you're one of the top radiation oncologists in the world. I'm going to let you deliver my radiation. And uh, I take 22 over-the-counter supplements that I'm also convinced cures me of prostate cancer. What's your take on patients taking all these things over-the-counter during the time of radiation? I see some radiation oncologists that say, absolutely not. That couldn't interfere with the radiation. I have other ones that say, it's no big deal. It's not going to interfere anything. What's your latest stance on someone wanting to take a whole handful of over-the-counter pills to think it's going to enhance the effect of their radiation therapy? Well, if, you know, I, was, I used to tell people all the time, you know, think about it this way. If you had a genie, like a lamp, and you could rub the lamp and get a wish, what would you wish for, right? So I would wish that patient would call you up and ask you all those questions about those supplements. <laughs> okay, in, in general. I know, and you gave him my phone number too many yeah, times. I, too. I call him, ask him about, see. During the holidays. Uh, the term supplement doesn't really mean anything, right? I right. mean, some, I, I had, actually, this happened to me like yesterday. This guy was talking about 
taking this, that, and the other. He said, he said, he asked me, could he take these Chinese herbs? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I told him about the randomized trial of PC spares versus conventional hormone therapy, how they found that the PC spares worked, but it was contaminated with all these other things, including Viagra and, and Valium and all kinds of stuff was in there. So one issue is what's actually in it. And also the idea, sometimes people think that because something is an herb, it means it's good, right? And there are Chinese herbs that cause bladder cancer, right? right. So I, I prefer that, and I prefer people to not take anything that's not part of what we're doing to try to treat the cancer. Because if it's an herb that I don't know the details of how it's, how it's purified and how it's processed. And also we know that some of these things have small amounts of estrogen in them. Yeah. And we know that we, we did a, a, a estrogen increases your risk of having a heart attack. Uh, so, you know, I don't really want to have my patients taking estrogen on the side in addition to what I'm doing. So my preference would be either they talk to you or they don't take herbs and supplements, except they can take a one a day vitamin. I'm fine with that. And, and there are things that I might prescribe them if they get urgency or urination or diarrhea, there are things I prescribe. But the, the bottom line is I, I want to keep them away from herbs, especially those I don't know what's in them. So you're a less is more guy still. Oh yeah. Okay. You know, I, as you know, I still agree with that. Uh, you know, we spent over $125 million of taxpayer money, not we, other people. I didn't want a part of that study <laughs> because everyone thought that a supplement was going to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. And that's why there was $125 million <laughs> of taxpayer money. Turns out that supplement increased the risk of prostate cancer. That was the case with a vitamin E supplement. And I know that's for prevention, but I think that if you're going for an actual cure and we don't have an idea of what you're taking can help harm or do nothing, why would you take that risk? You know where I stand. I think some of the best supplements are great drugs and they are the standard of medicine around the world in certain conditions like macular degeneration. But in prostate cancer, everything that we thought was going to be helpful turned out to be the opposite so far in our big randomized trials. So if I'm going, to see, I'm going to see Mac Roach, why would I even take a 1% risk during this time period to compromise that treatment? I can always not listen to you after you're done. But during that special time, that's why I'm a less is more guy too on that subject. Yeah, I mean, there's a role for hormone therapy, that's clear. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's the problem. People tear tweet supplements like politics, like it's all this or all that. And the reality is, it's like drugs. We have some supplements that work great in certain conditions like side effects and other supplements that are, are a real problem, just like drugs. So you got to be just as judicious. You wanted me to bring up a subject called oligometastatic disease, what it is, why it is important, and why people should walk away from this uh, no slide lecture of yours and why oligometastatic disease is important. Walk me through oligometastatic disease. Well, I mean, actually, I, I, I regret I brought that up, actually. But okay, I'll talk about it very it's quickly. The simple version. This is the rapid round. You don't have to give so, a lecture on it. So the classic setting, and, and actually, uh, Wexel Baum and colleague at University of Chicago sort of helped popularize this notion. And, and what we really saw in patients was this phenomenon where a patient would have colon cancer and they would have an operation. And then five years or seven years later, they would pop up with a lung nodule or a liver metastasis. Hmm. And you would remove that lung nodule and they would be disease free or cured or for a long time, they would do very well. And they, they believe that there was this intermediate phase where there's a small volume of disease someplace that pops up. And, and, you know, and that's sort of the classic late recurrence of oligometastatic disease. And in prostate cancer, we started seeing this more recently in the context of people that had PET scans done where they had a surgery and then a few years later, their PSA is going up and they have a distant metastasis. Their primary appears to be controlled. It's not a recurrence that didn't metastasize. It's a controlled scenario locally. And somehow this cell out here 
that was a cult and there for years finally grew up. And there have been a couple of nice studies. Um, the Stomp trial, which uh, uh, from Europe, um, uh, that uh, showed that you could delay progression of disease a bit. So these are men that have late, that have recurrences and they were followed, they either got radiation or not. And the patients that did not have very rapid progression and those who got uh, radiation did not progress as rapidly, but it still progressed. Um, and then the, uh, the folks from, uh, from, from Hopkins did the Oriel study. Now that is the best name ever. Because you know Hopkins is in Baltimore. Right. We had a trial called the Orioles study, right? Yeah. Baltimore Orioles. You get the name of trial after your team, right? But the O is for oligometastatic disease. So these people were randomized between only systemic treatment versus stereotactic treatment to a limited number of metastases. And it showed a dramatic reduction in the progression rate in those people that received treatment for oligometastatic disease with stereotactic treatment. Now, the important thing to remember about both of those studies, the STOP study and the Oriel study, is that those people had what we call metachronous metastatic disease, oligometastatic disease versus synchronous. From my perspective, there is no such thing as synchronous oligometastatic disease. It does not exist. It is metastatic disease, okay? But there are plenty of people out there that will say, oh, he's got met oligometastatic disease. The guy walks in the door, he's being diagnosed with prostate cancer, he's got a metastasis someplace, and they want to call that oligometastatic disease. That's not oligometastatic disease. That is metastatic disease. For me, oligometastatic disease only comes in one flavor, metachronous. It has a different biology. It's more responsive, has a better prognosis, and it also depends on where the metastasis is. So the most elegant um, study was written by Susan Hallaby using the CLGB data set. And they looked at people with metastatic prostate cancer, and they looked at the site of metastasis and the survival rate. People that have notable metastases, isolated, they do really good. People that have visceral metastases, we're talking liver and lung, they do really bad. People that have bone metastases only do somewhere in between. So the site of metastasis is really important. When the metastasis occurs is really important. And we now know that treatment of oligometastatic disease can have an impact on the progression rate, primarily based on the STOMP study and the Oreo study and our clinical um, uh, outcome. Now, one other point while I'm on metastatic disease is a complementary study, sort of like, in, in my opinion, even more important than the oral study, but oral part of study is a really important study, is the stampede trial. Now, in my stampede is not really one study. I mean, right. my colleagues, you know, they in the UK, they kind of, you know, they got away with that one, right? But they call these stamp, there's a series of studies and they call them stampede. Well, there's one where they randomize people who presented with metastatic disease to either have only systemic treatment or to have their prime, the untreated primary radiated. Now, when and you say systemic treatment, explain what you mean. Hormone, so it's either therapy. hormone therapy. Hormone therapy versus hormone just therapy. treating that spot. Right. right, hormone therapy that you take shots and pills and versus to just give you that alone. And, but, but before they, they stratified the patients into people with limited disease and, or low volume disease and high volume disease. And the benefit was seen in people with low volume disease. Now, that's a little tricky now because they use conventional imaging, right? So with conventional imaging mean a regular bone scan and a regular CT or regular MRI, people had low volume disease and they only had a few metastases versus people that had extensive metastases. And those people with low volume disease had a survival advantage. Now, what do we do when we now do a PET scan? That same patient who looks like he has low volume disease by conventional imaging now has more, more meds that you wouldn't have picked up if you hadn't done PET scan 
do you treat that patient as a low volume patient or a high volume patient? So it, the, it's a moving target. I think you have to treat them like a low volume patient, but it's a moving target. So then the next step is, okay, you've got the stampede study that says people that walk in the door with metastatic disease, limited, only a couple of metastases. Okay. And I have a young guy in the 50s like that right now. You should treat the primary. That what about the metastases? They just treat, they treat the primary. If you take the Oreo data and the stock data, it tells me we should treat the primary and the metastases. That's the clinical judgment part because in the oligometastatic metachronous setting, it works because these people would not have been diagnosed in some of these cases with those lesions and they would have presented with metachronous disease had they not had this pet that picked up their metastasis earlier. I think we really have an opportunity to have very long disease-free survivals by treating the primary and treating the, the limited number of metastases. So what you're saying there is worth its weight in gold markers. Sorry, I'm talking like a radiation oncologist. What you're saying is that if you've got these spots that are metastatic, you should be talking to your doctor about also treating the primary, which is means, when you mean treating the primary, what do you mean by treating the primary in addition to those metastatic spots? Explain that. The primary is the prostate. So Thank the you. prostate should be treated, and if there's only a few metastases, they should be treated. But it's not just you got to tell your doctor, you got to tell your insurance company. Yeah. So I had this young guy that came in, he presented, he's got, you know, he's got a couple of meds, and, you know, the insurance company goes, no. You can't, we're not authorized it because it used to be that the NCC and guidelines, which I helped write, the standard was not to recommend radiation in people that had metastatic disease to the primary, right? To the and process. for the insurance companies, there's a lag time, you know, we'll, you know, we'll say the NCC and guidelines should be changed. The insurance companies had their guidelines that were based on those guidelines. They don't change it as quickly. So I had to, so I did a, I, we submitted a request, they denied it. Then we did what we call a peer to peer. I talked to the doctor on the phone. He denied it because he said, oh, the man's got metastatic disease against policy. So then I, then he said, but you can appeal it. So I wrote up an appeal. I wrote a detailed letter explaining with all the data and sent it to him. They denied it. Then I did, I said, okay, instead of doing SBRT, I'll just do IMRT. Submitted that, they denied it. Then I did another peer-to-peer -peer and we had a conversation and we reached some kind of compromise. But the bottom line is these insurance companies, they write these policies. They don't actually uh, either understand or care and the people that they have who are responsible are following what's in the textbook or what's in the guideline that was written like a year ago when there's new stuff coming out all the time. See, this is one of the most dramatic things you've said over the two hours. And I hope they play this over and over again because this is a dramatic shift in the way metastatic prostate cancer or oligometastatic disease is treated. That you just don't go after those spots. There's a possibility that you gotta go after the tumor in the prostate to get an additional benefit. Now, if this is another cancer, say ovarian, or another type of cancer out there where they do something similar, nobody questions that, right? But this is the new way of thinking now in prostate. You gotta mention it to your doctor and your insurance company that you just don't go after the metastatic spots. You might have to go after what's still in the prostate, right? And that is a dramatic shift in thinking in prostate cancer, correct? Dramatic. This is, well, it's, this is the first time that we had pretty good data. You know, I mean, so we, but of course we've actually, some of us have been doing this for years, but we didn't have good data. But now we've got the data. So right. when they mentioned the trials, they mentioned Stampede, this, I just hope that some patients record these eight minutes and play it over and over again. What Mac Roach is saying. Well, I and, hope they don't have to. I hope they don't have this problem. You know, it'd be better if they have 
earlier disease. But they do. If I had a dime yeah. for how many times, even on the phone, I had to explain that you need to exercise the potential option of going after the prostate cancer and the prostate, even though the disease is well outside the prostate. And people said, what are you talking about? I'd have a lot of dimes. And this is going on right now. That is critical. Thank you for mentioning this toward the end, but I'm not done. I'm going to take this all the way to two hours because I'm a glutton for punishment. I need your quick summary. This is, when I say quick to you, that's kind of hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> One topic we didn't touch, but you talk to me on the phone about it all the time because you're excited about it and the right patient. It's so funny, you said, I don't want to talk about oligometastatic disease. And lo and behold, it's one of the more interesting parts of the interview. So now we have hormone therapy that goes with radiation, right? Traditional hormone therapy, been around 30 plus years, many of these companies. And now we got all these pills that affect the androgen receptor that you can add on top of that or androgen synthesis. So we got pills, for example, like abiraterone, right? Or Extandi or Erlita or Nubeca. We have all these possible pills that can be added onto hormone therapy with your radiation. And that's also changing the game. What do you tell patients who are told they have to go on hormone therapy, but their doctor has not entertained the option of also adding a hardcore effective pill, some of those new pills on top of the hormone therapy? Are you a big fan of that discussion? Is that happening now? Well, that is, that's an area that's in flux. I mean, first of all, the question is, you know, people are interested. Uh, first of all, you got a lot of people that just want to give the shot, right? So forget about the new drugs, yeah. you know, the, the newer, you know, androgen receptor blockers. Even when we just had the luprolide and the bifalutamide or the, or the uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, those older drugs, like you had people that wanted to give just the shot. Right and leave the pill out. Or you have people that want to give the pill for two weeks, they say, to block the flare, or for one month, OK? Well, first of all, if you're going to make some barbecue sauce and you want the barbecue sauce to come out really good, you can't start leaving out ingredients, OK? Just, you know, if they put this in there, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, and you still, and it doesn't come out, I say, maybe this doesn't taste like that barbecue sauce he had, then you didn't make it the right way. So the randomized trials that we did years ago that showed that people live longer when they got hormone therapy with radiation, whenever they were short-term, meaning four months, six months, they always gave the shot and the pills, period. That's true. So those people that want to give the, but they gave it for all, we gave from RTOG 8610, 9408, 9413, 9202. We gave the pills for all four months. But there are plenty of people, I don't know, my resident the other day said, okay, I'll give them two weeks. I was like, why, why, why where do you get two weeks from? I mean, I'm not, you know, um, why two weeks? I mean, that's not what they did. That's not the recipe. We know that those pills have independent activity. Some people think that the purpose of the pills are only to block the surge. We don't know that. Now, there's been one post hoc study that was done looking at the duration of the pills with the shots, published by Anthony D'Amico, suggesting that it was important to give the pills. Nonetheless, I'm not sure that that's a compelling set of data, but the fact is, is that there are studies looking at pills alone versus shot that suggest that pills have activity, which is almost as good as the shot. And when you do cancer drugs, when you're treating somebody for lung cancer and you have cisplatin and DB16, you give them both. You don't just drop off one drug and don't add it in there. So the first point is that with conventional hormone therapy, if they're gonna get radiation, they should get shot and pills, period. Okay, now, um, the other, the one other point, the most common mistake I see, again, in my opinion, is that patients with intermediate risk disease get put on short-term, you ask, you ask the radiation oncology, 
what is short-term hormone therapy supposed to consist of? And they say six months. You ask your Rollins, you go six months, you get the medical college, six months. That's not the right answer, people. We did a randomized trial called RTOG 9910. We did nine months versus four months. It showed with a couple of thousand patients going out 10 years, every single metric, survival, biochemical control, local control, four months was as good as nine months in patients with intermediate risk disease, except in one area, side effects. Side effects were worse in the people that got nine months of hormone therapy. So if you have a patient with intermediate risk disease, Nobody should be getting six months of hormone therapy. Now, it's not just 99-10. There was an Armstrong, a study from Ireland, four months versus eight months. Juanita Crook did a study from the UK, three months versus eight months. There's no reason. Now, I think three months is too short. There is some suggestion that the results are worse with three months. Three months are too short. In the paper by Juanita Crook, the people with high-risk features tended to do worse. There's a study from down under that looked at zero versus three versus six that suggested that three was sort of closer to zero and not as close to six. So I think three months is too short. But for an intermediate risk patient, the optimum duration of hormone therapy is four months, period. Now, the question about adding the newer generation drugs is mostly relevant to people with high risk disease, not low risk patients, not intermediate risk patients. Low risk patients should get zero hormone therapy. Right. Okay. Intermediate risk patients, if they're favorable intermediate risk, they may not need hormone therapy. If they're unfavorable, they should get short-term hormone therapy. If it's a high risk patient, they should get a long-term hormone therapy. If they're very high risk, then they should start thinking about the other drugs that are commonly used in the metastatic setting, which are either more next generation, more potent hormone therapy, or even chemotherapy in very selected patients to treat those people that are at very high risk of failing with traditional treatment. And you can look at some of the parameters. If their PSA doesn't go down far, these are people that are inclined to develop castration resistant disease. Those people need it. If they already have nodal metastases or these same people that we're having a conversation about oligometastatic disease, yeah. those are some of the people, especially if they're under the age of seven. I generally think it's a bad idea to do post hoc secondary analyses and then, and then look for that subset. But in the setting of, for example, with, with abiraterone, in the, in the, if you looked at the so-called, we call these things forest plots, where they look at you know who benefited the most. Yeah. The patients that benefited the most from abiraterone is a big difference in people under 70. And so when I see a 50-year-old guy that walks in that's got lymph node involvement, I want him to have a conversation with the medical oncologist about getting some of these newer agents added on to the stuff that we're gonna give because I'm more I'm not worried about his 10-year survival so much. I'm worried about his 20 years survival. Thank you. Thank you. Again, that's one of the top three or four things I see everywhere that people are missing, that if you're high risk, some of these new high power anti-androgen drugs added to hormone therapy and the rest of treatment could make or break your situation. And this idea, oh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, is not evidence-based, right? Especially in the younger patient who's high risk in that situation. Well, so, the issue of evidence-based, we don't have the perfect study. But we've got... New we got this data. I, I mean, I, I mean, we don't have some of the questions have not been resolved, and some of the insurance companies have not, you know, had they haven't drank the Kool Aid yet on that one. But, but the bottom line is that if I'm 50 years old, which I'm way past 50, I'm way 50, past 50, <laughs> if I'm 50 years old and I get locally advanced and you know metastatic, I'm gonna be trying to get some of those drugs in addition to, because the likelihood of having a survival advantage with that is, is high. Thank you. All right, I was gonna let you go, but I had one more thought, sorry. And if this requires a long explanation, I'm exhausted. Are you tired? This is two hours. I've never spent two hours with you except in your backyard at your house where I schooled you in basketball in front of your daughter and your wife. That I think must it was have been a delusional. Maybe played it ten. It was ten to one because I let you. I, I, I let you shoot one shot. 
uh, without no. blocking it. But uh, I don't want the audience to get caught up in our minutia, nor my athletic prowess that dominates you. Uh, <laughs> PSA, here's a, I got a ton of these questions to ask you, and I feel like I'm being thrown back at 15 years ago, but it's important from you to explain this. You know, you get your prostate out, you get an ultra-sensitive PSA, it makes sense. You're not supposed to make P any PSA. But I get all these questions submitted to us before I talk to a radiation oncologist about radiation and PSA bounce, bouncing PSA. Do you want to talk about PSA that bounces with radiation that doesn't necessarily just go down? Or, I mean, of course you want to talk about it. But <laughs> of can course you, I want to talk about it. Can you explain it? Because that freaks people out still. I mean, who gets bounce? Who's a candidate to get a bounce? What does a bounce mean? Tell me about PSA bounce before we end today. Well, first of all, the normal prostate makes PSA. And men can have bounces in their PSA without radiation or without anything in particular. Sometimes due to infection, sometimes due to prostatitis, sometimes due to riding on a bicycle, sometimes, you know, even a digital exam can have a small effect on the PSA. But the classic bounce post-radiation occurs somewhere between, say, six months, and it can occur at three years. But you know, what happens is there's, there's some type of, pro something happens, it's probably inflammatory in some ways, kind of like a prostatitis. We used to see it most commonly in patients that got a permanent implant. So I would do an implant on a guy, his PSA would start going down and then about six months or a year later it would go up. And sometimes it would go up a bit, like one, two, like that, after it was down to 0.5 or something. And my, we, we got my, and my computer's about to die on me in a minute. So I'm gonna make this real quick. See, low battery. So, so, uh, so the bottom line is that if you, so that benign bounce occurs about 20% of patients after brachytherapy. The things that are associated with it are good hot implant, meaning that it sort of, sort of riles up the prostate. It tends to occur more in younger men and tends to occur in men who are sexually active. But it can also occur in people that get SBRT. I have a patient, actually, I, have a, I, I got a lab result today, and that lab result today showed that his, P, his PSA had, I had done the SBRT on him, his PSA had gone up, and I was like, I think it's a benign bounce. I think it's a benign bounce. And then it went down. I was like, mm. okay, good, you know. So it does happen after radiation. Uh, there have been patients who've had their prostate removed and it turned out it was a benign bounce. So don't have your urologist, don't get put on hormone therapy. Don't, don't have your prostate removed because your PSA bounces up a little bit. You know, you have to do what you got to do um, and just be followed by your radiation oncologist and he can explain it to you. It's quite, quite well known. Okay. I think we covered everything unless there's something else we you think we should have covered in two hours. I mean, first of all, I hope you tell Hank Aaron that I am your best friend in all of the planet. I mean, yeah. everybody knows that I am, even though you, you, you come at me. Like, now, what is I, your name again? What's, what? your, what's your name again? What's your... <laughs> Just call me BFF. Oh, BFF. And then I, I highlighted your artistry, your Spanish classes, that you uh, outkicked your coverage when it came to your wife. And uh, we talked about a lot of things. I mean, this is the most we've covered. In Next time, hours. assuming that I don't get um, knocked off, assassinated by the, by the company in the meantime. Yeah talk about don't say it you're gonna say it go ahead, go ahead. Yes, okay. no no, no you should say it you should say it because i don't like holding my pet piece space on right so we're gonna talk about this is what we're about today no not today but here's what i'm gonna tell you i would like to do a, a side b in a couple months and we're just gonna talk about side effects and preventing side effects we talk about that on the side a lot too and that doesn't get enough attention but i also don't want to cram it all in in two hours that should be its own separate session so will you agree to come back and do it of course you can't say no i've got you on camera hey i'm here to serve <laughs> to whom much is given much is expected show them your t-shirt i gave you in oh, spanish oh so, man look, look so this is my uc berkeley t-shirt I, I know, but this is go uh, blue in Spanish. This is helps with your Spanish lessons. I thought I was helping you. Go blue. Go Got blue. From my Michigan buddy here. They have, right. they have pretty good prostate people in Michigan, you know. Yeah, we're okay. Yeah, they're I mean, all right. We look, stole one of them over here to join on our side, but you know that's what happens. You guys steal a lot of faculty. <laughs> yeah, well, from us. Pleasure. 
Stay That's safe. A pleasure. I, look, I love you. I appreciate you. I, um, I appreciate your candidness. I really do. And I think there was a lot to learn here. And then we're going to do a B-side at some point. So uh, thanks for all your time always. I really appreciate it. Hasta luego, mi amigo. Hasta luego. Vamos a los azul. All right. All right. See you soon. Thank you, Dr. Roach, and thank you, Dr. Moyad. For our next segment, we have Kelly Gingrich. She is a nurse practitioner who will give a brief presentation on Nubeca, a recently FDA-approved second-generation hormone therapy. And afterwards, we will have Dr. Moyad and Dr. Scholes in their extended Q&A. All right, I'm looking forward to this. Kelly, take it away. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Kelly Gingrich. I am a nurse practitioner and oncology nurse educator for Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Um, you, the patients, are my reason for why I do this. So I am very honored to be able to present to you today um, new information about uh, Nubeca or darolutamide. Um, and this is our newest prostate cancer drug on the market. Nubeca stands for new better quality. And it's a prescriptive medication that's used to treat men with prostate cancer that has not spread to other parts of the body and no longer responds to medical or surgical treatment that lowers testosterone. Now, throughout this presentation, we're going to talk about some safety information, um, and it's going to be scattered throughout. If it's something that we already touched on, we're going to skip over it, but if it's um, something that we haven't talked about yet, then we'll stop and uh, take a minute to review. Now, um, as you guys are all aware, uh, prostate cancer can affect men all across the age spectrum. On average, prostate cancer diagnosis is around 66 years of age, and so with that being said, um, it's really important for men that have significant others of childbearing potential to make sure that they use contraception throughout the course of their treatment, as well as for a week after their last dose of Nubeca. It is not known if Nubeca is safe and effective in women and children because it hasn't been studied in that population. So throughout the course of the presentation, um, we have several objectives that we're going to look at. Um, we, want you, we would love for you guys to understand what can happen when your hormone therapy is no longer enough to treat prostate cancer that has not spread to other parts of the body. Now, we're going to talk about hormone therapy a lot through the presentation, so I do want to define that a little for you. It does include drug treatments or surgery that lowers testosterone levels. We're also going to look at some definitions and terms that are used to describe prostate cancer and how treatment helps. We're going to talk about what rising PSA levels could mean and why you should take action. We're gonna review how Nubeca works or its mechanism of action. We're also gonna look at the clinical study or the Aramis trial that, pr that proved Nubeca works and possible side effects seen in the study. And we're gonna talk about how to take Nubeca. And finally, we're gonna talk about support services that are available for men that are on Nubeca as well. Now, during a hospital visits and for, during your provider visits, it's really important that you're very open and honest with them about all of your medical conditions. And that includes having kidney or liver problems. Um, this will actually help to tailor your treatment, uh, tailor a treatment that best fits you. So when you need more than your current hormone therapy, prostate cancer in general is a hormone sensitive cancer and it is fueled by testosterone. Testosterone is the main male hormone um, and which can help cause um, the prostate cancer to grow and spread. So you gentlemen actually create testosterone in two different parts of your body. Testosterone, 90 to 95% of it is made in the testicular production, and the other five to, five to 10% is made in the adrenal production of testosterone. So when we're using agents such as hormone therapy, we're typically blocking testosterone in either one of those areas. Now, you guys may be familiar with hormone therapy such as Lupron or Luprolide, and actually there's a little chart down here in the corner as well that looks at other medications such as Zolodex is another one that you guys may be hearing about, or Firmagon. Um, those are also very common agents. Now, what these agents do is they actually target that testicular production, um, which brings it down by 90 to 95%, um, which can make it look undetectable in lab work. Now, hormone therapy at times may not be enough to keep the cancer from starting to grow again. And so what happens then is you may need to add another medication or an agent into your regimen um, to the hormone therapy that you're already taking. So we need to do more at that point. So when hormone therapy works, your prostate-specific uh, antigen, and I'm sure you guys are all very familiar with PSA, um, will drop and stay low. Now PSA stands for uh, prostate specific antigen and it's actually a protein that's found in your blood and it's measured in lab work. So when your hormone therapy stops working, your PSA level rises, even if the cancer has not spread. And that means you have non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. Now it, typically we look at two consecutive PSA rises to kind of deem the castration resistance. 
Now that is a pretty heavy word right there, non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. So we're gonna break it down here for you. So what does this mean? Non-metastatic means that the cancer has not spread to other parts of the body. And then we look at CR, which is castration resistance, and PC, which is prostate cancer. And that means a cancer that starts in the prostate gland and keeps growing even when the amount of testosterone in the body is brought down to very low levels. So it is very important that your doctor monitors your PSA level. And it's going to be very provider dependent about how often they measure this. And this is through that lab test. Um, so it's blood work. Your PSA levels may rise even if you're on hormone therapy. And now if your PSA level starts to rise, and that's typically those two consecutive PSA rises, that's because your prostate cancer is castration resistant. And that means that the prostate cancer will keep growing even when the amount of testosterone in the body is brought down to very low levels. So this is a nice little depiction of what we're talking about here. So the PSA going up plus testosterone levels being very low can equal prostate cancer being castration resistant. So what is our goal? Our goal of treatment is to delay the spread of cancer. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see that the prostate cancer is, is um, confined to the prostate. And then over on the right-hand side of your screen, you can actually see the prostate cancer spreading outside of the prostate. Why does that matter, you may ask? So this matters because if prostate cancer spreads outside of the prostate, it can start to cause symptoms. And symptoms can include bone pain, worsened fatigue, a lot of you gentlemen may love to golf, spend time with family and friends, travel, be very active. And so it's really important that this additional time to prevent symptoms from developing will allow you to have a very um, full life doing what you love to do. So, and also make sure that again, like we talked about being open with any other um, sort of medical conditions that you may have, it's also important to talk to your doctor about any new symptoms because then they'll be able, be able to investigate and figure out why you may be having those. So when it's time, um, so Nubeca. So Nubeca, as we talked about, it's a pill for prostate cancer that has not spread to other parts of the body and is no longer response to medical or surgical treatment that lowers testosterone. So here is um, what Nubeca looks like in the bottle and um, actually a, a size comparison for you for how, how the pill is. So it's actually, um, it's the size is smaller than a dime. So um, pretty doable um, for, in regards to being able to take it. Um, so we already talked about this little safety uh, tidbit, so we're gonna move right along. So how Nubeca works, or so we're gonna talk about the mechanism of action. So as you can see in the picture here, testosterone is, is displayed by the little white dots and androgen receptors or AR receptors are displayed by the Ys. Now in prostate cells, um, there are molecules called androgen receptors. And typically testosterone will attach to these AR receptors or androgen receptors um, that can cause prostate cancer cells to grow. Now, what Nubeca does is it actually attaches to the androgen receptor instead of allowing the um, testosterone to attach, delaying the prostate cancer cell, uh, delaying prostate cancer from growing. Um, and so it's also deemed an androgen receptor inhibitor. So we are, um, we actually have the largest clinical trial of its kind, or the Aramis trial, where we um, had 1,509 men with non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer who were randomized on a two to one basis to two different arms. So we had 955 men in the hormone therapy arm um, it, with Nubeca. And then we also had 544 men who just had hormone therapy alone. So what we were looking at in this clinical trial is we wanted to find metastasis-free survival, which means it's the measure, we measured the uh, length of time living without the prostate cancer spreading to other parts of the body. Um, our little safety tidbit for this slide is that we do, if, if you, for women, we need to make sure that you tell your healthcare provider if you're breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed, because it's not known if the Nubeca passes into the breast milk. So we're looking at efficacy. So we did meet our endpoint of the clinical trial, and it showed that um, with Nubeca, men lived, twice, lived more than twice as long without cancer spreading compared to hormone therapy as alone. So on this bar graph, what you see is that Nubeca plus hormone therapy, and that's that arm with 955 men, um, lived 3.4 years versus 1.5 years of hormone therapy alone without uh, metastasis uh, forming. So the cancer, it prevented cancer for, from spreading for 3.4 additional years. So, um, so this is the delayed, and Nubeca delayed the spread of prostate cancer to other parts of the body. 
So on the bottom, um, before we move on, the safety information here is that we also want to make sure that you speak to your provider about any medications that you may be taking. Um, and this will help to make sure that there's no interactions that uh, between your new medication and a medication that you may be on. Um, and a lot of people just think this could be prescriptive medications. And it's important to know that this means prescription medications, over-the-counter medications, vitamins, herbal supplements. So it's important to talk to your provider about all of these. Um, and so some helpful information from patients that, um, actually that patients that I actually used to treat they would uh, take pictures of the pill bottles or write down the names in their phone um, of the medications, the dose, um, how often they're taking it. Um, you could do it on a piece of paper and just be able to bring it in and so that it's an all-inclusive list that you're able to share with your provider so they can best treat you. So overall survival was actually also looked at with Nubeca and it was shown to significantly extend overall survival, which is how long a patient um, is right after starting therapy. So it was a 31% lower risk of death, so compared to hormone therapy alone. Now it's important to note though that the study results about Nubeca being able to extend overall survival were not ready at the time the results on the previous slide were, were, were shown. Um, our safety information at the bottom of the slide here, actually we're going to go into this a little bit deeper later on, so I am going to skip over this, but I promise we'll come back to it how to take Nubeca. So with dosing of Nubeca, it is prescribed as 300 milligram tablets, and you're going to be taking two 300 milligram tablets in the morning with food and in the evening with food. Um, so a total of 1,200 milligrams total. Now it's important to take this whole, um, and if you miss a dose of Nubeca, take your normal dose as soon as possible um, prior to the next scheduled dose. Um, you want to return to your normal dose as scheduled on the following day, and definitely don't take two doses together to make up for any missed doses. So do you want to follow your doctor's instructions while taking Nubeca? And if your doctor feels like you need a dose change, follow their instructions. You don't want to change the dose on your own. Um, you should continue with your hormone therapy as well during your treatment of Nubeca. So those injectables that you may have, that you might have been on, um, as well as, or if you have had surgery done with an orchiectomy. Um, so you'll continue that to keep those testosterone levels low, but then you'll add this agent along in the mix. Um, just some, so a helpful tip in regards for remembering to take Nubeca is that you can set an alarm on your phone um, that will alert you whenever it's due. And we also have some wonderful starter kits at, here at Bayer that actually have magnets set to set a reminder on your fridge or um, a reminder as well on the, the, the pill bottle cap that shows you to take it either in the morning or you already took it in the morning or you'll take it in the evening. So um, also just helpful tips in regards to making sure that you remember to take your medicine. So what are some of the side effects of Nubeca? So this, um, this is a nice chart right here that look at the most common side effects of hormone therapy plus Nubeca versus hormone therapy alone. So the first thing on the list here is feeling more tired than usual or feeling fatigued. Now with hormone therapy plus Nubeca, it was 16% versus 11% of hormone therapy alone. Then we looked at pain in the arm, leg, hand, or foot was also on that list, which was 6% versus 3%. Um, and those are more like arthralgias, myalgias. And then we also have rash, which is 3% versus 1%. I kind of want to separate the bottom two here because the bottom two are more lab abnormalities. And with lab abnormalities um, on the clinical trial, I, say, I will say that they were collected um, typically between six and 12 weeks on the clinical trial. Now, anytime you start a new medication, your doctor is going to be keeping a close eye on you to make sure that you're tolerating the drug well along with your other medications you're on. And so um, they're going to be doing frequent lab tests, and this will be captured within those first three months. So what we found on the clinical trial was a decrease in white blood cell count or neutropenia, which was 20% versus 9%, and changes in liver function tests, which was 16% versus 7%. Now to continue on with our side effect discussion, um, serious side effects that did occur, did, that did occur in 25% of men who added Nubeca to hormone therapy and 20% of men who took hormone therapy alone. Out of those serious side effects that, that happened in 1% or more of men who added Nubeca to their hormone therapy, it included um, not being able to urinate, pneumonia, and blood in the urine. Now we're gonna look at discontinuation rate on the clinical trial. So in both groups, um, there was only there was nine percent on both sides that permanently stopped taking their medicine or discontinued it because of side effects. So that was nine percent in the hormone therapy plus Nubeca arm versus nine percent with the hormone therapy alone. 
So um, you can see there that, um, and plus the side effects that caused men to permanently stop taking Ubeka were heart failure at 0.4% and death at 0.4%. So you can see there that the comparison was the same. Now we're gonna look at other um, reasons why men stopped taking the medication during the clinical trial. So men who stopped taking Ubeka and then started it again because of other side effects. So kind of a dose interruption, if you will. So the most common side effects in this particular case when they stopped the medication but started it again um, were high blood pressure or hypertension at 0.6%, diarrhea at 0.5%, and pneumonia at 0.5%, and that was 13% overall. And then we had 6% of men taking Ubeka who had to reduce their dose because of the side effects. So this was a dose reduction. And the most common side effects that caused men to reduce their dose included fatigue at 0.7%, high blood pressure or hypertension at 0.3%, and nausea at 0.3%. Now support services. This is very important for, um, for us to be able to give to you guys. So we have the DUDE service. Um, we have our DUDE Access Services, which stands for Darylutamide User Drug Experience. Um, it's kind of a catchy name. So have, so, um, with what we would like you, with what we offer with the Dude Access Service, it's assistance to help you understand your insurance benefits for Nubeca. Um, it can give you access to nurses who can help answer treatment questions. They can help you with assistance with insurance coverage, which may or may not be covered, and connecting you for financial assistance, which we understand and that financial toxicity is real and this is very important. Um, one of our little helpful tips is that if you do use the Dude Access Service, um, center that it's not a bad idea to plug the number in your phone so that you know it's not a spam call calling you and that you're able to answer and be able to get the, the assistance that you need. Now, to kind of elaborate on financial assistance financial assistance that we have. So we are doing a new Becca free trial program for patients who are new to the drug. So it's two free months of drug. We also have a zero dollar copay program for any commercially insured patients as well. So Nubeca, it is mostly covered by, all, by most major Medicare Part D and commercial plans. Other things that we can do from a financial um, standpoint, we can make referrals to chari charitable foundations. The government does give a lot of money in regards to uh, grant funding, and so we can look into see what grant funding may be available. And they typically will do that on a year-to-year -year basis, that you will qualify it for it a year, and then you'll have to do it again for the following year. But they definitely can look into this for you. Um, every facility is going to be a little bit different, so your doctor's office may do this as well, but this is another option for you if you wanted to um, kind of research. It. And then we also have a patient assistance foundation. So this provides free medicine for patients who are under uh, underinsured or uninsured and meet certain eligibility criteria. So we, there are a lot of it, different options here. So um, it's important to use the utilize all the resources that are available to really help um, really help to get the financial assistance that you may need. So we understand that prostate cancer is not typically fought alone. It does take a village, and your support. Um, your caregivers are basically your pillars of support and love throughout this whole entire journey. Um, and as you are taking your journey uh, through prostate cancer, your caregivers are also taking a different journey. And it is important for us not to forget about them and um, understand that there are other ways to help to, to encourage them to deal with stress that they may be um, doing. Uh, eating healthy and exercising. Don't forget to, uh, to go out and enjoy the things that you love to do, whether that's meeting a friend for lunch or uh, hanging out with family or friends. Making sure that you ask for help um, if, you, if you do feel like it's needed. And also seeking out help from a support group or a mental health professional can be really um, helpful as well. There are a lot of resources out there and this is just Cancer Care provides resources. That's just one um, available option that is out there to help provide support and assistance for caregivers. Um, so talking to doctors and having questions uh, for them. So here are just some examples of some questions that can help you talk with your doctor about Nubeca and how it can fit into your current lifestyle. Um, I always think it's a really good idea that if you have a little notebook uh, laying around or if you can plug it into your phone, if you think of questions um, as you're going along throughout your day to write them down. Say oftentimes when you go into a doctor's office, it can be a little bit of a whirlwind. You have people coming in and out of the room and by the time you think of what questions you wanted to ask, they're out and you're on your way home. And so if you have it written down, you can even just show the doctor or your provider um, your piece of paper with your questions and have them answered while you're there. 
Um, and these are just some questions in relation to talking to your doctor about Nubaca and how it could fit into your current lifestyle. Now, how often are you able to exercise with your current hormone therapy? How do you like to spend your free time? Are you, are you able to spend a lot of free time uh, with family and friends? Do any side effects prevent you from enjoying your daily activities? Do you have any routine, do you have a routine meal schedule? What other medical conditions do you have? And what other medicines do you take? And then we also have uh, more information that's available on our website, newbeca.us.com. Um, so, and there's a patient brochure on there that actually lists all of these questions. So um, if, you, if you want access to them, you can find it on our website. So this is Ray. So Ray is a gentleman who has non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer and his approach to life um, is just wonderful and we would love to share you share this video with you. I'm 71 years old. My life has been pretty good. I've just had a blessed life. We've been married 46 years. It's been a great journey. I'm very active. I play golf once or twice a week. Uh, I volunteer at an animal shelter. I like hanging with my granddaughter. I retired on February the 1st of 2005, and two weeks later I found out uh, that I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. My only reaction was that I wanted the cancer that was in my body out. We talked about it. Uh, we decided to do surgery. I thought everything was going fine. Uh, I went uh, to a normal checkup and my PSA level had, had gone up again. A doctor recommended I start radiation treatment. Then a couple of years later, my PSA level started going back up. They put me on hormone therapy. That was fine for a few years, then it started going back up again. My urologist recommended I go see uh, a, a specialist. Non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer represents a point in the disease where the cancer cell is trying to grow despite the fact that the patient has been receiving hormone suppressive therapy. Dr. Shore thought Ray would be a good candidate for Nubeca, so Ray began treatment. Nubeca is a prescription medicine used to treat men with prostate cancer that is not spread to other parts of the body and no longer responds to a medical or surgical treatment that lowers testosterone. It is not known if Nubeca is safe and effective in women and children. Nubeca can harm unborn babies and cause loss of pregnancy. Men with female partners who may become pregnant should use effective birth control during treatment and for one week after the last dose of Nubeca. I had some concerns. Uh, one was like, is this gonna work? Surgery didn't do it, radiation didn't do it, hormone therapy didn't do it. Maybe this is what's going to contain my cancer and keep the cancer from growing. He cherishes every day. He says every day is good. Before taking Nubeca, tell your healthcare provider about all your medical conditions, including if you have kidney or liver problems. Have a partner who may become pregnant. Males who have female partners who may become pregnant should use effective birth control during treatment and for one week after the last dose of Nubeca. Talk with your healthcare provider about birth control methods. For women, tell your healthcare provider if you are pregnant or plan to become pregnant. Nubeca can cause harm to your unborn baby and loss of pregnancy. Breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed. It is not known if Nubeca passes into breast milk. Tell your healthcare provider about all the medicines you take, including prescription and over the counter medicines, vitamins, and herbal supplements. Nubeca may affect the way other medicines work, and other medicines may affect how Nubeca works. You should not start or stop any medicine without talking to your healthcare provider that prescribed Nubeca. Most common side effects of Nubeca include feeling more tired than usual, arm, leg, hand, and foot pain, rash, decreased white blood cells, changes in tests that determine how your liver works. Nubeca may cause fertility problems in males, which may affect the ability to father children. Talk to your healthcare provider if you have concerns about fertility. These are not all the possible side effects of Nubeca. Call your doctor for medical advice about side effects. You may report side effects to the FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088 or www.fda.gov slash medwatch.
So that concludes today's presentation. I just want to say thank you so much to Ray for sharing your story and for um, all of you for attending. Um, I hope you found that informative and helpful. Um, and please know that um, we at Bayer are here to support you with your prostate cancer journey and fight. So um, don't ever hesitate to reach out if you need anything and please visit our website for more additional information. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Kelly. If you would like more information about this presentation, you can visit newbeca.com. All right, the time has come. We're gonna have Dr. Mark Moyad and Dr. Mark Scholes. They're our famous duo. They are so funny together and we love them to pieces. We hope you enjoy this Q&A session. Wow, Mark, that's been an incredible two days and I'm just so thankful for you helping us carry this along and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's kind of sad that, like I said, that normally we have a lot of time to to uh, get together, have dinner and whatnot, but uh, we got a, a little time now and uh, I'm going to let you, as you sort of have been in control all along, I'm going to leave you in control. You do it so masterfully. And, uh, and so you take it from here, but just thank you, thank you so much for the wonderful interactions with the speakers. We obviously we have, are uh, blessed with amazing speakers and uh, you were able to really help them shine and to reveal their, the beautiful facets of who they are and what they do. It's been so much fun. So I guess now we're gonna do some questions. I think you have some questions we're gonna handle and uh, we'll, we'll just take it from there. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me always uh, moderate and do my thing and going what we call the naked and afraid route where I didn't let people really use slides. And again, I wanna reemphasize, it was probably one of the greatest interactions I've had with speakers in my career because they had no idea what was coming at them. Right. That's what people don't understand, that the beauty of this conference and what we do is that we're not scripted. People, this is, this is very organic. So for example, even this is this big pink roll of toilet paper here. I'm so tired. I put my head on here, you know, so I can relax. Plus I know that this used to be such a hot commodity when the pandemic started that I stocked up on it a little bit. Not a lot, if I say a lot, people will come after me. <laughs> And so I put my head here. So we have plenty of toilet paper now at the Moyad house to relax my head. And I thought, now is the perfect time. We got inundated by questions. So for you first timers, for you newbies, at the end of several days of conference in Los Angeles, there is a session that generally runs from 10 to 12 o'clock on Sunday morning. That's called the Moyad Shoals, Shoals Moyad Q&A. And we go through what the speaker said. That's what we first start with. And I think we'll start with that today, what your impressions of each speaker were and the take home messages. And then I generally ask you some questions, answer some questions myself. And suddenly we wake up and it's, you know, 60, 90 minutes later. So we decided to keep that tradition today and uh, just start out with, why don't we go through some of the speakers? What were some of your impressions? What were some of your highlights? And we can go back and forth with that in terms of what I learned too. And that's how we do it. So perfect. I that's like the, I like the tie. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a gift from a patient and uh, I, it's, it brightens my day and it brightens everyone's day. So yeah, um, I, so I went through as I was listening to all the speakers and to your uh, repartee with them and the, uh, there was a couple of things that stood out. Uh, let me start with a kind of a softball to you because uh, you brought this up. Dr. Margolis has uh, covered, Dr. Margolis covered the MRI imaging in an amazingly thorough and understandable fashion. As I was looking through that, I said, I have nothing to add. This is just incredible. Uh, people that want to understand multiparametric MRI for the prostate, all you have to do is listen carefully to what you and uh, Dr. Mar Margolis covered and that's going to do it. So. But you uh, brought up the fact that he stayed on a vegan diet all this time. As you know, the question of diet comes on over and over and over. And one of the interesting things I saw, because this came up with Dr. Uh, Klotz, he showed a uh, slide that showed no impact of, of diet on men on active surveillance. And uh, the, this is one of the things that I have uh, talked about a lot with patients. When they have a Gleason 6, a group, 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 group grade one, basically a harmless condition, should I be threatening them with the cancer getting out of control if they don't go on a diet? And as we know, these great group ones are innocuous. And to me, it's disingenuous. It's a lie to tell someone, boy, if you don't get on a diet, your cancer is gonna run amok and, and you, you just better be damn careful. Um, so it's, it's not fair to tell people that. On the other hand, in people that have metastatic advanced disease or even have a rising PSA after surgery, there's definitely strong evidence that diets make a big difference. So it's two different situations. Um, of course, as you clearly made out in the discussions that you had with these physicians, 
And the people that have the harmless types of cancer, the grade group ones, they benefit by reducing their risk of heart attacks, diabetes, being overweight, all kinds of nasty things that happen, but it doesn't change the future of their prostate cancer. So I wanted to make that clear. And uh, that uh, I think is such an important, it comes up almost in every conversation. That, that is a critical because it's not fair to go on the internet, even though I know it brings you a lot. So for example, if I write a book that says, prostate cancer, A to Z, or a supplement handbook, and I write that, yeah, a lot of people will like it. If I wrote, uh, you know, why statins cause cancer, I just make up something, I'll get a lot more readers and make a lot more money, even yep. though that's not true. And yep. what you see a lot with diet, it gets manipulated, that someone says this diet works against cancer, and the reality is it gets a lot of followers, people buy a lot of books, but you're really not doing a service for someone, you're not telling them what we truly know. So what you were referring to is in active surveillance, what clots, are, so I assume we're going to talk about clots first or Margolis, whichever one. Yeah, I'm so that was, that I, obviously it cut across all the speed. Yeah, it did cross but all Mar the speed. So, so I'm, going to, I'm going to put a line through Margolis now and say that his and your discussion about the, the vegan diet and everything was what I took home from that interaction because the MRI stuff, I couldn't add to it. Usually I can pick apart something and I will on the other speakers. I'll say, look, this is good, but I would modify it. But that was such a beautiful talk. And so I just decided to jump onto the, the vegan issue, which is uh, you know applicable broadly for everybody. So let me, I, I think it's beautiful because the vegan issue, you know, it's funny. I remember I did a talk at PCRI and I mentioned, and I, and I repeat what I say, I said it to Margolis. I said, if you think about the vegan movement, even though that's not me and you 100% and we're more plant-based, I believe, it's still a beautiful movement because the intention, whether it is to discourage animal cruelty, whether it is to improve the environment, and then whether it's to improve my body, or all three of those, how can you, how can you say anything different than the fact that it is a beautiful movement? So what I tend to see is I tend to people see, so people are excited about veganism, they say, yeah, this works for me. Oh my gosh, you know, patients will say that and other people, doctors will say that. And then four months later, you'll say, how's the veganism going? They, and they say the vegan diet, oh, that didn't work for me. I can't, I can't do that, that's too strict. <laughs> so, or, or there was a very famous trial that will go nameless. And I met a number of patients from the trial who did not want to become vegan, they became vegan. And I would say, well, are you happy? And they say, with some, some of them would say, no, I'm not, but it's probably controlling my PSA. And I just thought, well, we don't want to torture people. They don't want to do something specifically because they don't necessarily want to follow that. But I thought it was interesting that Margolis started this four or five years ago, and he's very much dedicated to it. And that's what I meant by beauty. Those are the type of people who become vegan that I think is really part of the beautiful movement. However, yeah. However, what you imply is also true, that you have to be willing to be humble. And what that means is that what Klotz was referring to is they did a two-year trial of active surveillance. It was run by Dr. Parsons over at UCSD. He did a great trial. It was called the MEAL trial, M-E-A-L, and it appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2020. And for two years, you had two groups, and it was very robust. And one group basically was told to eat a ton of vegetables, just move toward vegetables. And the other group is, here's a pamphlet, have a nice day. At the end of two years, there was no difference in terms of active surveillance, who progressed, who didn't. And the reason they picked eat more vegetables, I mean, it was more than that, but the reason they picked eat more vegetables is that you and I grew up at a time where people were saying vegetables and lycopene and carotenoids, these can change your cancer. And so it took years to design this, years to implement this, and they didn't find any difference at two years. What they did find though, what they did find was that patients really wanted to make lifestyle changes. So they saw great adherence mm -hmm. and they saw a really good reduction in caloric content. But, what, but the reason why we should talk about this for a second, then we'll move on, is that the control group decided to be really good patients too. <laughs> the control group cut back on calories a lot also. And so when I was, um, I was moderating a meeting where the head of the trial was there and I said, Dr. Parsons, did you see people lose weight? And he said, 
No. I said, did you see them block, reduce their blood sugar? No. How about blood pressure? No. I said, well, then why did we think it was going to work? And it wasn't to be mean. It was to say that the control group also did a lot of good things. We really didn't see anything dramatically, tangibly different between the control group and the intervention group. So I still want to believe that making those dietary changes is going to help them live longer. But I'm not going to look at someone on active surveillance and say, it's going to change your active surveillance situation. It's going to stop you from progressing. That's just not fair. And that's what you alluded to. Yeah, I'm alluding to the fact that these active surveillance cancers are so harmless anyway, it's hard to impact them. But the other thing you mentioned about weight loss, which you've commented on at previous conferences, that the type of diet that you have may be less important than whether it results in weight loss or not. Right. And I tell you, that's the theme that I see when I have patients that I don't motivate them. They motivate themselves to say, I'm going to do a diet. And I can distinguish the patients that will have PSA stabilization versus those that has no impact by just the scale. The patients that are losing weight, it wasn't their intent. They're just very diligent about their diet and they do lose weight. Those patients have, tend to have disease stabilization or slowing of their PSA rise. Convince me, I mean, I didn't, I, this wasn't my idea. This, this is something I've seen over and over. So that weight loss factor, and I hate to put it in those terms because it's a very uh, you know, intimidating and daunting prospect to say, I have to lose weight. But as a secondary effect of being on the right diet, I think that's one indication of something that's going to work rather than just kidding yourself. That's right. The idea is if you're going to make these changes, they have to result in a tangible change that you see and you need to feel the change yep. uh, subjectively and you need to experience the change objectively. Yep. So someone called me yesterday from California and said, my wife, I'm the prostate cancer patient. My wife wants you to develop a, a diet plan for her. And I said, well, I, I don't do that. And they said, well, we read all your books. I said, I want to know, I wanted you to be educated to the point where you pick what you like based on your beliefs. And I want you ultimately, whatever you pick, I want to see it cause changes in your cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, and your weight. So whatever that is for you, plus you're happy ethically and morally of the diet, that's the best we can offer you. And that is why my favorite line in the clots part, I don't know if you saw it, is I said, by the way, if nobody's dying of prostate cancer in your series over all these years, I said, what's the primary cause of death in your active surveillance patients? And he said, cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And I basically said, are you sure? He goes, no, that's the number one cause of death. And then I thought, well, of course you got to make dietary change, right? Okay. Yep. I mean, we know if you're in active surveillance, we know what the, has the highest probability of getting you early. Mm -hmm. And we know that diet makes a difference against cardiovascular disease prevention. So I don't to make these promises. Yeah, isn't it interesting that, uh, remember who it was at Pritikin when he was marching around the country trying to tell people, if you eat a diet, your heart disease, and he was laughed out of town? Yeah. I mean, that, that's how far we've come in, in, what, 30 years? Yeah, yeah, I say, uh, you know, even with Ornish's early studies, you know, mm -hmm. Dean Ornish, you know, not that I necessarily espouse that you've got to go that extreme, but he designed, uh, he designed low-fat studies initially and they resulted in huge reductions in LDL cholesterol. You know, he did a study in prostate cancer, and I used to quiz students all the time. I would say, do you know what the average reduction was in his initial clinical trial published in the Journal of Urology when patients went on a lower fat or lower calorie diet? The average LDL reduction in his trial was 30 points. And with the statin, if you got a 30 point reduction, you would go, wow, that's, that's pretty powerful. And that was the average, you know? And so, that is reason enough why you should make dietary change. But if someone's going to start promising you that it's going to stop your cancer, slow the growth of it, you're exactly right. I don't necessarily believe it's going to impact active surveillance, but I do believe it's going to increase your chances of living longer and better. I want to add one more thing that I often tell people that you've seen. When you go to the longest lived countries in the world, many of which I visited for my public health years. So if you go to Andorra, which has a life expectancy now up, depending on who you talk to, 80s and 90s, or Sardinia, or Okinawa, it's not as if people are living in these blue zones and beating a single disease. What they're doing is they're beating most major causes of death in the population, 
and they are pushed to a later age. So you're not just dying at a later age of heart disease, you're dying at a later age of stroke, you're dying at a later age of dementia, you're dying at a later age of cancer. And so what the message to me is, the game is about probability. It's about improving my probability that I'll live longer and better. And how they do that in the blue zones is they do that in much, mostly in part by lifestyle change. Yeah. And I think we have to impart the same knowledge, but I, I, I want to add something about Margolis because I do think there's something that you can add that you've taught me that now I'm just a huge convert of. And I tried to get into it with Margolis, but I figured after three hours with him, he was probably tired. <laughs> and do think running into a young I lost it. Um, can you hear me uh i lost you right after you introduced the idea of margolis go ahead i can hear you now though okay how about now yeah try try it now uh, can you hear me now yeah so two things struck me about margolis one is that he looks like Keanu Reeves, the younger version of Keanu Reeves in the movie Speed or something like that, or I don't know, Bill and Ted's Adventure. And I said in the video, I said that during the taping that he looked like he was late for algebra class. I mean, he looks really good, really good. The yeah. second thing we didn't touch upon, which you love to touch upon, and I agree with you, is MRI is beautiful, a beautiful method to measure prostate size. Can you talk about the importance of prostate size and not relying on this to determine the size? Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, and uh, you and Margolis handled or uh, mentioned that uh, the ratio of, of your prostate volume or size is uh, proportionate to your PSA. And it's an, easy, uh, it's an easy equation. So you take the size of the gland measured either with an MRI or an ultrasound, uh, let's say it's 60 cc's, that would be 50% larger than an average in a 60 year old man. Um, 60 cc's, the PSA will average around six divided by 10, it'll average around six. And that's the normal PSA for someone with no cancer at all. So this is how you could have some, my PSA is above four, I, do I have cancer? Depends how big your prostate is. And if you have a 60 cc prostate, your PSA of six is normal and it's not sending a cancer signal at all. Yeah, so when, whenever I ask someone, if you ask them, do you know the size of your prostate? And they say, well, it's pretty big. Well, how do you know that? Well, someone stuck a finger there. And I think, well, I always have this joke, this go-to joke, well, that's about as accurate as someone guessing your weight at the carnival, you know, I mean. So these machines are do a really good job of guessing size, which matters is important when it comes to active surveillance and PSA density. And the, mm -hmm. so I wish we had had more time for that. And I'm glad you talked about that. The other thing that I wish we had more time for, just from our goal is talk, since we're starting with him first, uh, I wish we could have talked a little bit more about the contrast and what you tell patients about contrast and gadolinium, because there's so much fear about that contrast agent and misunderstanding and misinformation. What do you tell people about getting contrast with their MRI? Sure, I, I thought Margolis was right on. The, uh, he, uh, as a radiologist, you know, from the radiologist's point of view, they want to have all the information. So a lot of them, unlike Margolis, a lot of the radiologists say, oh, you gotta, gotta, gotta have the uh, contrast. But he's so on the cutting edge of this, He's been able to parse out the, the minority of men that have to have the contrast and the majority they can get away with no contrast. It's brilliant. So it's, uh, I don't, it doesn't come up that much. Most of my patients aren't all that concerned about the contrast. It's been around for a long time. Nothing's really ever been attached to it unless someone has kidney problems to begin with. So, uh, so it doesn't come up as much, but for those that do some research and if they have a concern there's this issue of uh, gadolinium you know staying in your brain tissue for a long time um, some people want to attribute a negativity to that others uh, uh, you know experts haven't really pinned anything on it but uh, so it, it's nice to know from one of the biggest most prestigious prostate experts in the world that uh, about 90 percent of the MRIs could be done without contrast if that's what they want mm, interesting do you think 
a biopsy should even be done today? He, he didn't bite on this question. He kind of bit. He bit a little bit. Not enough. I wanted a bigger bite. <laughs> so I figured I would go to my, my old pal here, Souls, because he'll give me a candid answer. Do you think today now, everything that we know about MRI, that you should not even have a biopsy without an MRI first? Oh, uh, to me, that's an easy, that's a no-brainer. Uh, the, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, uh, I mean, unless you were fiscally constrained, you know, that you couldn't afford an MRI, um, or let's say you, you live in some outback place and they don't have good MRIs. So doing a uh, MRI that's done improperly is just like doing no MRI or could even cause more harm. But if you have access to these state-of-the-art facilities in New York and LA and now more and more around the country, um, I mean, it's not a hard sell to patients. We'll give you a choice. You can go in, get a scan. If you have some claustrophobia, we'll put you in feet first. We'll give you some Valium. You'll be real happy. And we'll try and determine if there's anything that needs further action. Or on the other hand, what we can do is we can lay you on your side. Uh, we'll squirt a little bit of Novocaine in your rectum. And then we're going to you know, take this large bore needle and we're going to ram it in there about a dozen times. Take little pieces and chips and chunks of your prostate out and look at it under a microscope. Now you choose. <laughs> so far, I haven't had any say I really want that biopsy. It hasn't happened. How many active surveillance patients do you have now? Because when I met you, you had very few, and that's was long ago, but you have a lot now. You know, ballpark figure, how many do you have? I, we haven't totaled them up, but I'm guessing somewhere between five to 800, something like that. How often, or what do you tell people about getting repeat MRIs while they're on active surveillance, since we're staying on the MRI topic? Yeah, that's, that's our, uh, our routine policy. We also do color Doppler ultrasound. So as medical oncologists specializing in prostate cancer, our mindset, I think, is different than the, the urologists who are proceduralists. I wish I could come up with a lay term for what a proceduralist is, um, because it doesn't really mean anything to the patient population. But there are groups of doctors that are trained to do procedures, surgeries and biopsies and whatnot, because you want to have specially trained people that are very good at that sort of thing. The trouble is, of course, that they tend to see the whole world through that type of a, a perspective. The old saying is, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I don't mean that to be derogatory. It's just that the, the idea of doing a procedure is part of their daily fare. And so this, uh, this proceduralist versus the, you know, the cognitive as oncologists, you know, I, I don't know, or maybe I'm I pass out when I was young at the sight of blood. So the idea of jamming needles into people is just, you know, a last resort. That's the way I think of it. And, uh, and that's the way patients think of it. So it, it, people empathize with that viewpoint. Now, the danger, of course, is if you go too far, there is a time and a place for biopsies. And although we, I don't know, last time we've even done a random biopsy, but there's probably a time and a place for a random biopsy too. Uh, but uh, the... Uh, with the modern imaging being so good, we've been able to circumvent biopsies to an amazing degree. Uh, we, uh, we do not do routine biopsies in our active surveillance patients. We only do targeted biopsies if something changes on an imaging study. That's a very avant-garde viewpoint. Uh, you know, the standard approach uh, throughout the uro urologic world is to go back and do random biopsies periodically. And I understand why that is. The whole, the whole lore was built on that. But uh, we've been able, so far, knock on wood, to get away without having to do random biopsies. Why haven't you published your protocol on active surveillance since you have so many people? I mean, why haven't you written more about, this is how I would handle active surveillance because I've done it this long, just like Klotz does. This, and this is not a softball question. I don't think I've ever asked you that question. I just no, I think, thought of it. I think it's a, it needs to be done. It's a lot of work. And uh, we might have the horsepower now with some assistance in our practice to be able to start to pull that together. It's a gargantuan task oh, yeah. uh, to, uh, to start gathering data on you know six, seven hundred patients. But uh, but it has uh, uh, it has worked very nicely, and uh, we just got a letter to the editor of the New England Journal published uh, querying about this policy of instead of doing random biopsies, why not do an MRI? Because as I think it was uh, Margola said that you're with a uh, MRI, you're missing perhaps 5% of the cancers that you want to find. 
And the ones that are missed are typically, not always, but almost always very small. And so if you keep doing the MRI annually and that little guy grows, it'll eventually become visible. And the way prostate cancer behaves is it doesn't usually spread until it gets fairly large. So, right. so it's a nice way to get around the biopsies. Um, in retrospect, who knows, 10, 20 years from now, they'll say that, you know, why was Scholl so paranoid about biopsies? You should have done more of them. But so far, we've been doing very nicely with this approach. Well, I thought, you know, I thought the, the fun part of these speakers when I'm, when I'm quizzing them is they know that we're going to talk about their cons, not just their pros. So I went right after Margolis about, we called it during the interview, the Achilles heel of the MRI and what all the people are saying and criticizing. And, and, and he handled them well. And I agree that the, the criticisms of the MRI are kind of weak, you know, when people don't want to use it. Oh, the tumor's not big enough. Oh, it misses this percentage. And I'm still going, but that's a small percentage. And so if not having access to this, then what are we talking about? So I told him about a study that I knew that if the prostate was this big, I picked a tennis ball because you like tennis. So you'll never look at this tennis ball the same way. So say this is a big prostate and you plunge, you know, 12 needles in different points and you give this tissue to a pathologist and you add up the amount of tissue, that's about 1% if you're lucky of the actual tennis ball. So you're only telling me what's going on at about 1%. And that's why, you know, I, I've learned a lot from you and the rest where, you know, you got to, you got to, if you have an ability to have an MRI and target those suckers, you got to use it, right? So the, the thing that depressed me about Margolis's talk was that A, he's been able to stick with being a vegan and, and he looks better and better. So now I feel guilty for not being vegan, <laughs> even though I might be close. But so that was one depressing thing. I think I thought about his talk. Um, but the other depressing thing about his talk, and I've never asked you this either, is I said, the thing that astounds me is that everybody treats pathology, now they do, as if a second opinion is important. Why would you trust one opinion? Why can't you send to Epstein? Why can't you send to other people? Well, you can now, and that's very well accepted that two opinions are okay when it comes to Gleason score. But what I said to Margolis was, but isn't that true now of almost everything, including reading an MRI, reading a PET CT, uh, sending someone to a radiation oncologist and getting a second radiation oncologist opinion? And he said, yeah. And I said, so where are we with second opinions and MRI? And he goes, we really aren't anywhere. Could yeah. you have any comment on that? That really is, makes me crazy. That makes me really nervous. Yeah. I appreciate your highlighting it. Um, it is not difficult to get a second opinion. Uh, when they do the MRI, uh, usually free of charge, you can ask the, uh, the center that did the MRI, uh, please provide the images on a disc, and then you can send it to a reference center. Uh, we send a lot of, uh, uh, of these discs to UCLA to get a second opinion, and they'll comment about the image quality. You know, did the, is the MRI taking clear pictures? Did the technician set it up with the right exposure? And then they'll also say, this is what we see. And you can then compare that with what the original physician said. And I, I personally, if someone's going to an MRI center that doesn't have a, a, a renowned name for doing MRIs, I would routinely get a second opinion because uh, as you and Margolis that came out, you know, you, if you're not reading these, you know, two, three, four or five times a week, you, you're really not competent to be reading them at all. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty big volume. A lot of these places say, okay, we, we, we now do this and they're doing, you know, two or three a month and, and the doctors aren't getting the practice they need. And of course they need feedback afterwards. They say, okay, I, I said it was in the upper left-hand corner of the prostate. And then did the clinician confirm that when he did the targeted biopsy? Yeah, you got this one right. No, you got this one wrong. You've got to learn, you've got to get feedback. And uh, the large centers have done that legwork and uh, they can uh, just look at a disc and give you an opinion uh, as to the accuracy, the quality of the image, and then the accuracy of the read. Wow, that's great. So are we to the point where every time someone gets an MRI or another imaging test, they should just ask for a copy on a disc just in case they're gonna sec send for a second opinion? Because if you don't ask for a co copy up front. Yeah, absolutely. Unless they're going to one of these centers Memorial Sloan Kettering, NYU, Cornell, UCLA, US, UCSF, um, those places, uh, you know, they have a large enough volume, they have programs, and they're, and they're solid. But uh, the other ones, 
you know, what I'll do is if I have patients that are seeing me from, let's say, Arizona, and they found a place that knows how to do this, we'll have the, at least the first one over red. And if it matches very nicely with the UCLA read, matches very nicely with the Arizona read, then we'll trust them going down the line as long as we have the same radiologist who did a good job the first time. You know, they sign it at the bottom as which radiologist read it. If you have another radiologist reading it, you got to start over again. Mm. Mm. Okay, so that's Margolis. Good, we got through one speaker, and it's only been about 30 minutes. <laughs> All, right. All right, we'll, we'll see you. Well, this is a good pace, though. This is a good pace. I really like this, because we have less speakers this year, so we gave them more time. What speaker do you want to talk about after Margolis? Okay, so let's go on and talk about uh, Roach's uh, nervousness about uh, focal therapy. Mac Roach, the radiation expert, um, was uh, so engaging in his presentations. That, yeah, I don't, you, you know that Mac is also a board certified medical oncologist, in addition to being a board certified radiation therapist and like former head of use, guys, brilliant beyond brilliant. Um, his, it was interesting what he said though. He said that um, he only believed in doing focal therapy uh, in patients that were relapsing. And he was able to do that successfully with uh, focal seed implants in patients that had had previous radiation Cancer came back, and so he set it up so, because if you radiated the whole prostate, that'd be too much radiation, cause potential long-term damage to the person's quality of life. So what he did was he would just treat where the recurrent tumor was. But he said he didn't like the idea of doing focal therapy for a virgin, for a de novo person. And uh, his reason for that was he said that the cure rates won't be as good. And he's correct. Possibly the cure rates won't be quite as good, but I don't know why Mac is forgetting that there's a quality of life question here as well. When you radiate the whole prostate with a seed implant or whatever, you're depending on the age of the patient and their function, you're looking at anywhere from a 30 to 70% chance that they're going to become impotent. Mm -hmm. And some of these relatively modest, you know, grade group two, three plus fours that are getting treated, you know, the chances of them spreading with no treatment in 10 years is maybe 10%. And then if you radiate focally, the tumor, it's got to be a lot less. And of course, if you radiate focally, there's a lot lower chance of impotence. So I was a little surprised that he had this sort of black and white view towards focal therapy, which was contrasted by Dr. Klotz, who's got several programs going with HIFU and, and uh, with the, uh, the uh, new uh, Tulsa and all these sorts of things. Um, Focal therapy is a nice bridge between the patients that are almost candidates for active surveillance, but to quite don't fit. Uh, the challenge, of course, if you go deeper into the focal therapy world is who do you trust to have the type of precision to be able to hit that little tiny target in the prostate consistently? Yeah, you know, that's that we don't have quality control for that sort of thing. And so that's a bit daunting. We, you know, in our own practice, we've just restricted our you know, we've used people like Duke Bond, or we've done, uh, we've had a guy, Albert Chang over at UCLA, has done focal radiation for us on seed implants. Mm. And now that I know that Mac's uh, available for relapse focal therapy, I'll probably tug his chain and send a few focal cases to him, see what, it, see what his response is. It's, yeah, uh, Mac is, uh, I, I was so happy he had zero slides. Because <laughs> usually he comes to the conference with somewhere between 100 and 3,000 slides. And I call it death by slides. And He's got so much knowledge, he wants to put it on slide, but all of my conversations at two in the morning or on Saturday when we're arguing sports and, and prostate cancer are the ones that you saw. They're off the cuff. And when he's allowed to think off the cuff, he's brilliant. It just it's is wonderful. Really wonderful. Yeah. And you see now he wants to speak Spanish. You speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's a great artist. Mm -hmm. um, but, and he's also, his uncle is Hank Aaron, which is not bad. I mean, he has no athleticism, though, which is uh, ironic, because, I mean, I've shamed him many times in sports, but that's a whole different story, and I brought that up in the interview. I think what was interesting was, maybe you want to comment on it, is that we talked about brachytherapy a lot, especially permanent seeds in his talk, but really, I'm not hearing people experts that you can go to and get this form of treatment anywhere. And he said, it's a reimbursement issue. We don't have hardly any experts. And so what's your take on that? Have we run out of experts on brachytherapy? Well, a couple of things. Um, Medicare has recognized that these brachytherapists are not getting paid enough to inspire people to want to do it. And that's going to change. Uh, next year, I believe they're going to reverse that and start paying all radiation the same. 
And so we'll probably see a resurgence because all the studies show that brachytherapy uh, translates into better cure rates. So brachytherapy um, has been under reimbursed and underutilized, even though it's a uh, treatment that has at least, if not better cure rates. It's certainly simple. It can be done as an outpatient. Uh, so it's going to have a resurgence, I think, once they start paying doctors better. But uh, there are still good experts around the country that can do this. They do need to be sought out. Um, people like uh, Dr. Steve Kurtzman in San Jose, Dr. Brian Moran in Chicago, and there are others around the country that are uh, very good at this, have dedicated their lives towards doing it. And uh, for the men that are candidates, it's, it's a wonderful way to go. What I haven't uh, worked with yet is uh, what Dr. Um, Mac Roach was talking about was doing focal brachytherapy. Now, why not? Yeah. Uh, that's a, it's a natural next step. Now, we've been do, doing focal HDR brachytherapy with Albert Chang at UCLA, and the preliminary results look good. So, uh, so I think that that's kind of, once we get the brachytherapists paid like they should be paid, I think the next evolution will be towards more and more focal brachytherapy. I did a paper with a guy named Dr. Greg Merrick. He's in Wheeling, West Virginia. He's, mm -hmm. This is all he's done, but yet he's in Wheeling, West Virginia. He's not on the West Coast. And, you know, this is where he wanted to be. He wanted to practice there and people come and seek him there. And he's one of the best in the world. But again, like you said, I can't, if you ask me to name five brachytherapists mm -hmm. that are top notch, I'd be lucky to hit number two or three before I have no idea. Yeah. And what worries me about what you say, even though they're going to be reimbursed better, is that that still means we have to wait several years for experience. Right. Yes. Well, the, our our audience, you know, one of the themes that just goes, we constantly pound the drum, is once you figure out what you want to do, and that's a process, the next step is who's going to do it. And the if you're reluctant to travel out of town to get a seed implant, I mean, a permanent seed implant is an afternoon procedure. You go get the seeds put in, you walk out, you have dinner with your wife, you go home, you never have to return. So to to be unwilling to travel you know, just to get the treatment is, uh, there's really no barriers. So Greg Merrick, as you mentioned, these, these people that have dedicated their lives to doing this one thing, you get one chance to get it right. That's right. One chance. And uh, so you, it's, it's a no brainer. You've got to go to one of the top, you know, five, 10 people in the country. Yeah. So that's also what struck me about Dr. Roach's talk, you know, a lot of other things we talked about, but, um, I'm not so sure. Is there anything else you want to talk about with Dr. Roach's talk? We covered it a little. No, bit. no, we got a long list of questions. So let's bang through these real quick. Let me mention about uh, on Klotz's talk, something went by really quick, which I think, uh, you know, we talk, and when we get to uh, Vogel's A, I want to talk about the PSMA PET scans a little bit. But Klotz um, was uh, mentioning that he's working with something called microRNA. And we just did a webcast on microRNAs, and uh, it's it's the it's a holy grail of genetics. Most of the genetics have been sort of circling and going sideways for the last uh, 5, 10, 15 years. But now with the discovery of these microRNAs, which is like a whole new realm that uh, helps understand what, what's really going on in our, in our biology, um, it really caught my ear when he showed a slide with some of the preliminary experiments that they're doing with microRNAs to detect who has the bad kind of cancer that needs treatment and who doesn't. And we've got tests like this, but the problem is, you know, like select MDX, opco 4K, they'll tell you with about 80% accuracy. Does that cut the mustard? And the answer is yeah. no. You can't, who wants to take a 20% chance that you're just missing the boat? Yeah. But Klotz's microRNA studies are showing something close to 95% accuracy. That's unheard of accuracy. And uh, if we can get something like that on the market in the next couple of years, that's going to change the way we practice. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, fascinating stuff. So that's him. If you want to go on to, we can talk a little bit about the PSMA PET scans because I think, uh, you know, I've been billing that as the biggest breakthrough since PSA. Uh, Dr. Vogelzang spent a little time talking technically about how accurate they are. And uh, all, I think you can say it in one sentence. These are the most accurate tests we've ever had. And they answer the one question we care about. Has the cancer spread? That's all these algorithms and Gleason scores and how high the PSA is, all it is is an indirect indication of has the cancer spread? 
That's yeah. what makes cancer dangerous. And there's many prostate cancers that never spread. So, so the idea of being able to find out if it's spread, that's awesome. And then not only if it's spread, where it's spread. Because yeah. with modern radiation with these little pencil beams, we can go in and, and dry it up with a non-toxic treatment. So the PSMA PET scans, people are uh, estimating will be on the market within six months. And uh, this is gonna explosively change the way we practice. Uh, how will it change? Well, think about some of the unfavorable intermediate risk patients, the grade group threes with four plus three and a PSA of 12. And they say, okay, there's a 15% chance that it's spread. So you've got to take hormones. We, we don't want to take it. Oh, God forbid, you must do this. Well, doctor, my PSMA PET scan shows there's no spread. Do I still need to take those icky hormones? Well, there's no studies to prove that you can stop, but I don't know. If it was me, I might skip the damn hormones if the PSMA PET scan was totally clear. Anyway, it's going to start a discussion about changing the whole way that we treat prostate cancer. It's very exciting. And uh, you heard a little bit about the oligomets and how now we can go out and chase the spots even when they're outside the gland and, and put people in remissions. Uh, all of these things, the PSMA PET scan is going to touch on every stage of prostate cancer from the earliest stage out to the, you know, the metastatic stage. So that's coming very quick and it's going to change everything. It is really coming very quick. By the way, I've never heard you use such bad language on, ca on, on camera like the word icky. Icky is about the worst language I've heard from you, so please keep that tone down a little bit. Uh, but it is remarkable, isn't it? Do you remember, you remember not that long ago, you could say, we could find cancer in your bones, they can find cancer in your prostate, but anything in between, it's hard to find out where the heck this is at. Yeah, and that was the first jumping off spot, the lymph nodes. Yeah. Uh, that's where you have the best chance if you can catch it before it gets to the bones while it's still in the lymph nodes, you're going to be able to capture some of those back and maybe even cure some of them. And then the other thing we used to say, which is difficult for people to appreciate today, and this was talking about a couple of years ago, is if you had recurrence, let's say you had surgery and you had recurrence and they wanted to radiate you, the idea was to radiate your prostate bed as quickly as possible while the PSA was rising. And the reason for that is because we couldn't see where the prostate cancer was. So you, let's, just hit, let's just hit the target with radiation. Now you can say wh where the target is. And can you comment how low these PSAs are where they're detecting recurrence? Because we started with the Mayo idea in Arizona where you had to get that PSA to one and to two. And now that threshold is dropping, dropping, dropping. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, and uh, your point is well taken in the PSA relapse category. It's really obvious how these PSMA PET scans shine because if you have a rising PSA, and the answer to your question is PSA is of 0.2 or above, very, very low number. But Can you repeat that again? 0.2. No, I'm serious. It's unbelievable. That's it's like Russian, yeah, That's incredible crazy. technology. So, but the issue is this, you know, it's not inconsequential to radiate where someone's prostate used to be. It can still cause incontinence and it can cause uh, impetus. Now it's not as high a risk as when you still got your prostate, but it's still a risk. And so if you have a PSMA PET scan and it shows a spot in a little lymph node, you can bypass radiating where the prostate used to be and spare that gentleman from the risk of impotence and incontinence. Wow, that's really exciting. Yeah. So why don't, we, why don't we have more PET CTs that are FDA approved? Do you think it's really coming in the next three? I know that's what he said, mm -hmm. but do you believe in the next three, six months, we have, we're going to have multiple different types of PET CTs approved? Do you I think don't know about multiple types. I do know that at least one type is likely to, uh, the evidence is so overwhelming, even the government can't ignore it. So that, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my take on why it's going to come soon. You just generated a lot of jokes. <laughs> and I'm not, we pride ourselves at PCRI of not taking sides. <laughs> so we won't do that. We're just, we, we give information. We don't give politics. You got to go somewhere else for that. Sorry, I had to sneak that in. No. So anything else you want to say about PET CT or PSMA or imaging before we go into some of these questions? But, you know, Vogelzang did touch on that. And Vogelzang touched on uh, just the fact that, I mean, one thing we didn't get a chance to talk about, and it's not in the questions. 
and I just dawned upon me, and I really wanted to talk about it with Vogelzang, was clinical trials. And the reason I want you just to comment on it is it still seems very difficult to recruit for some of these clinical trials. Do you have any opinion on clinical trials and can you reassure the public? And it's not a softball question. I hear all the time, well, I don't wanna get the placebo. I don't wanna get the placebo, I wanna get the active treatment. And I'm going, well, it's not really like, you're not really getting placebo. And then, you know, we have crossover and you can explain that, but we really didn't get a chance to talk about clinical trials, the importance of them, that in many private practices like yours, they do clinical trials too. Clinical trials aren't just done in hospital settings anymore. It's a big question, a big pool. Can you answer some of that? Well, my thinking has changed on clinical trials because if you go back five, 10 years, the type of drugs that were being investigated weren't very interesting or exciting. It was the technology uh, wasn't that good. Uh, now in 2020, because they're, they're designing solutions to known problems, the type of stuff that's being evaluated in clinical trials is a whole step above. And uh, typically the clinical trials are reserved for people that are running out of FDA approved options, uh, because if you've got something that is proven to prolong life, you're gonna use those things first and then start thinking about uh, uh, having a backup plan uh, if, uh, if those don't work. And uh, so it takes a lot of sophistication. And of course that uh, fits our audience. You know, we have a lot of researchers out there that are um, good at taking control because you say, you know, where they're doing the trial has to be close enough to your home. Uh, you have to fit the entry criteria. Um, you have to judge that your chances of benefiting are high enough to justify the fact that it may not work. Um, so it's, it's something in combination, usually with a medical oncologist, where you'll look at all the different options and then decide if one of these trials fits your profile. I look at clinical trials from the point of, will it help me, the patient? Unfortunately, it's a big industry, and sometimes the, the academic side is, we just want a warm body to slot into this trial. Uh, and whether it helps you a whole lot or not, is, that's secondary. Uh, as a clinician, I can't think that way. So would I go on to this clinical trial if I was in that same situation? And that takes a lot of analysis uh, because you know, there's just so many variables. But thankfully, the, you know, the research industry is bringing out amazing stuff, especially in the realm of uh, immune therapy, these CAR T cell type things that are um, so targeted at getting the immune system revved up against the prostate cancer. Very, very exciting stuff. So uh, we've referred some people over to Tanya Dorf at City of Hope for that particular trial. One patient had a dramatic decline in PSA. He'd been on everything else. So, so today, in 2020 and going forward, we're looking at, I think, the golden age of clinical trials. For people who don't know who Tanya Dorf is and the clinical trial you speak of, can you repeat that? Who is she, where is it, and what's the trial? The so City of Hope is in Duarte, California. It's east of Los Angeles, about 30, 40 miles, and uh, it's a large research center. Tanya Dorf is a, a medical oncologist specializing in prostate cancer. And, uh, and so she has uh, several different immune programs. I think it's uh, a technology that's being developed by Amgen uh, Pharmaceuticals. And, uh, and the, uh, the whole policy, is, is the whole process is to uh, take the patient's immune system and get it directed at fighting the prostate cancer. And this, is, uh, this technology has been around for treating lymphomas and other, very successful in other cancer types. Now they're trying to transfer it to prostate cancer. It's, still in the inception stage, but it looks pretty hopeful. Yes, and it's exciting. She's doing a trial and, you know, last I checked, she had some spaces left. And I think that is an amazing study. Like you yeah. said, in lymphoma and leukemia, it's changing specific ones dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's time for it to start in prostate and she's one of the first to get it off the ground. And I know you've been referring some people there. There's one other thing, I'm, I promise you, I'm gonna get to these questions, even though now it's 40 minutes, but remember, during the actual in person, I can't believe, I can't believe you're. Act, are you actually watching your clock? I, uh, I just, I just have this advanced time. age. At this advanced age, have you <laughs> actually grown a sensitivity to time? I can't. This is unbelievable. <laughs> I, it, you've got a big clock behind you. I bet Alex probably flew out there, put a big clock over the top <laughs> of your computer, right? No, I just look, at you all the time. I look outside your window and I'm able to tell, you know, it looks like the sun is setting slightly. I kind of do some quick computational math in my head and I'm figuring this all out, you know. 
It's all, it's all, you know, it's all from my diet. My diet <laughs> allows me to predict time. <laughs> well, I'm just so impressed, Mark. So um, impressed. Thank you. So the second thing I didn't talk about with Vogel Zhang, which I think you should really talk about because I didn't even know you were capable of doing this until many years ago, is something we call expanded access or compassionate use. Mm -hmm. Meaning there is a category, there's this asterisk, and you got to elaborate on it because you've done it many times, is that people don't think they can get a hold of a certain drug because it's not FDA approved, but they, if they appeal to the company and they fill out the appropriate paperwork, they can get a hold of a drug they never thought they could get a hold of. And I've seen you do that before with some immune therapies, correct? You've so got a great, you've got a great yeah, you've got a great nose for what's really valuable. Don't say to nose. I have a huge nose and that makes me really sensitive. So can we move on from that analogy? <laughs> yeah, I, that was probably just subconscious. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a Cyrano de Bergerac comment. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. So I, I don't can't come up with another cliche. Let me think for a minute here. The, just say I have an incredible mind with an amazing gray matter that you basically worship day in and day out. All right. Ditto. Ditto to that. All right. So... The um, so the what are we talking about? Uh, oh, I'm no. sorry, we're talking about expanded access, compassionate yeah. use. You're able to get immune therapies. I mean, this is a remarkable category that not many people know about. Let me give you an example, and and I, we have talked about this, and thank you for reminding us in the audience because uh, there's a medicine called Keytruda that's in phase three trials right now, an immune medicine that put President Carter in remission. He was dying of a metastatic uh, melanoma in his head. And he's been in remission, or at least he's still alive years later now. Amazing. Um, so that's being studied in advanced prostate cancer, but not everybody can get on a trial. And Merck Pharmaceuticals has generously, uh, on a compassionate use basis, offered this medicine to any medical oncologist that asks for it, uh, for his patients. And uh, so we've treated well over 100 patients with this uh, medicine, Keytruda, and it has activity. It's, um, it's a totally different type of medicine. It's generally well tolerated. So that's just one example of what Mark is talking about is that there are, um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies can be very open-handed with their medicines. And uh, if you have a specific one in mind, it's amazing what you can accomplish, just maybe writing a letter, just checking it out. And uh, this medicine is super pricey. And so for patients to get it absolutely free of charge is quite an amazing thing. And, that, and that's a key, right? They're not getting charged. They're getting, they're getting it for free. Absolutely free. So okay. what, that, what that taught me is the squeaky wheel gets the drug. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so it, when you're running into a situation, you should talk about expanded access, compassionate use. And it's a matter of your oncologist and you appealing to the company and seeing if you can get it and if you qualify and you've done that so many times it is impressive yeah the, the qualification process i have a, a nice uh, qualified staff that interfaces for me but i have i don't i can't think of a patient that's been turned down i mean it's uh we we identify a patient that would be a candidate that could potentially benefit we request it we get the medicine amazing yeah it's an incredible story yeah, wow, it's because it's a, it is a good product. It's not just another yeah. knockoff. It's a it's a very unique immune stimulating medicine that uh, has uh, has definite value in prostate cancer. Every day in this country, and people watching this video somewhere in the world over the next few weeks will think a couple things. One, Mark Moyet is incredibly good looking and intelligent person, and Mark Scholz is lucky to have to know him and spend <laughs> time with him. But what they'll think of actually secondarily is there'll always be someone watching this video that believes they've run out of options. Mm -hmm. And the only way they can access another option is that they make a dramatic geographical move. You know, right. they go move to another city or they go to Australia or Australia comes, someone comes to the United States, but they're not told that there's this other category where they can stay at home and access this drug that they potentially qualify for by staying at home and still seeing their local oncologist. And that provides hope, my friend. And yep. that is worth its weight in gold in our talk today. All right, so as a, as a segue into doing questions, the same can apply for these second generation hormone medicines like Erlita, Nubeca, Extandi, uh, the, uh, which are very expensive. And sometimes insurance companies will push back and don't want to cover them or the co-pays are out of hand. 
Same thing can apply. Direct application to these uh, pharmaceutical companies oftentimes will result in, the, in a very open-handed gifting of these medicines to the patients. So, so if there is a medicine that your doctor has identified that would help you, but it's out of reach financially, um, petition the companies directly and you may be very surprised. Wow. Right, to the questions. I, There's so many good questions here. I'm going to ask the questions because I get to, I don't know why, I get to ask the questions. So you ready to start with the questions? I mean, I got to tell you, that was 45, 50 minutes. I really enjoyed that. I think we got through the speakers and the import, the real, the real meat and potatoes are the real vegetables and, and uh, fruits. I don't know, you know, or the real, uh, I don't know, fiber and so on and so forth. All right, here's the first question. And I'm just gonna give you the general gist of it. And I'm gonna tell you what I think after you tell me. This person says he was diagnosed with a PSA score of 4,800. Let me repeat that. 4,800 in stage four metastasis, a prostate cancer. And my oncologist has put me on hormones only. Should I be doing something else to stop the spread of this disease? So can you, let's, let's, let's take every question and educate on that so 4800 and stage four is is this a problem and and is just being on hormones a problem yeah it, it, i mean that's a real eye catcher a psa of 4800 uh, which is interesting and you mentioned that uh, the cancer is limited to the lymph nodes that they didn't pick up anything in the bones of course there may be small mets in the bones and uh, they probably didn't do a psma pet scan which might show many small mets in the bones but to, for someone to be on just a hormone uh, treatment like Lupron or Firmagon or Trellstar alone is really a mismanagement of the situation. Uh, the, the studies, just as Dr. Vogelzang said, dual therapy is the modern standard. So dual therapy would either consist of adding something like Extandi or Zytiga or adding something like Taxotere. And uh, if all the lymph nodes could be, uh, if they're in one area that could be radiated, uh, probably not with such a high PSA, but that would be a practical consideration as well. So let's just go back to what Dr. Vogelsang said about dual therapy is the modern standard, and that is clearly the case here. So for him to be on Lupron alone is a mistake. Yeah, so we don't have these injections anymore. We have all these pills. You know, you mentioned them, Erlita, Nubeca, Extandi, Abiraterone, which is known as Zytiga. These weapons exist to be added to things they're, they're not, they don't exist to be standalones, right? And the yeah. other thing is, tell me if I'm wrong, but when someone tells me they have a PSA of 8,000 or 4,800, I say, well, there is some good news on that. And they say, well, what are you talking about? Usually, P, usually prostate cancers that make a lot of PSAs are amenable to treatment. The ones, the, the patients and the people that, it's, that, that haunt me still to this day are the ones that have a very low PSA, high Gleason score, and the disease is everywhere. It's not, it's become so, it's become so de-differentiated that it basically doesn't make PSA anymore. This thing's become its own monster. So when a, P, when a prostate cancer is making a ton of PSA, the chances that you're gonna get an initially really good response to treatment, in my experience, is really good. Yeah. So what you're saying, Mark, is that these prostate cancer cells have retained their normal function, which is to make PSA. The really nasty ones, they say, now we're not gonna waste energy making PSA, we're just gonna make more cancer cells. Exactly. And so the, um, the really cool thing, the highest PSA I ever saw was 17,000. Interesting story of a, an airline pilot, a stubborn airline pilot that uh, went into his doctor with a PSA of around 4,000 like this and uh, told him, you know, got diagnosed. He had metastatic prostate cancer. The doctor wanted to put him on Lupron. He said, nah, I don't want that. Went out for another year. And that's when he came back with a PSA of 17,000 and his bones were hurting too much. He couldn't endure it any longer. Mm. Went on Lupron and his PSA, just as you predicted, dropped way down to less than one. Mm. Shocking, wonderful remission. He lived for many, many years. And so the, the, I can't guarantee that everyone with a high PSA is gonna do well, but the concept or the principle that behind that you're describing is very real. Yeah, that's great, that's great. All right, let's go to this next question. This one is, let, let's, this one is a person, I mean, we're gonna jump around a little bit if you don't mind. Yeah, go anywhere you want. 
This person was diagnosed two years ago on active surveillance, had a couple of biopsies, Gleason's was six, P low PSA below 10, and now the PSA has hit that double digit mark, the 10 range. So is it time when that PSA hits the double digit range to get active treatment? I mean, what's basically what he's asking is, if you're on active surveillance, what the heck is the trigger to make me come off active surveillance? Yep. And it turns out it's not PSA. PSA is not the trigger anymore. We thought it was 10 years ago, but they jump around so much because of prostatitis and other factors that it will trigger treatment too often. And so how do you make that decision? Usually you get a scan. If the spot that you're following is enlarging or changing, you get a targeted biopsy. And if that shows an increase in the Gleason score, the Gleason sixes we know don't spread. Uh, then if the Gleason score is increased, it's time to think about treatment. If it's still a grade six and there's no new spots, then I would wait it out. And most times these PSAs will settle down on their own. It's probably some transient prostatitis. Maybe the prostate's getting bigger with age. Who knows? But it's not the cancer. Hey, they call PSA prostate specific anxiety for a reason. So when you talk to clots and I talk to him, I say, okay, what's the leading cause of death in the active surveillance patients? He says cardiovascular disease. We talked about that. But then when you ask him, well, what's, what's some of the primary reasons people come off active surveillance in the old days? He doesn't answer this anymore because people are comfortable with him. In the old days, it was anxiety. Yeah. And it yeah. still is anxiety for people because they see something slightly change and they think, that's it. I got to come off now. So I'm glad you talked well, about so their tools. Just remember, if you have someone of Dr. Klotz's stature sitting across from you, reassuring you, telling you, in my 25 years of experience, I know you are safe. And he's, Dr. Klotz believes in active surveillance. So he's, he's trying to get that message across with passion. But then you have a, a doctor that maybe has two or three active surveillance patients, and he's kind of nervous that maybe he's missing something. He's not that familiar with it. And he may say, yeah, I think you can possibly stay on active surveillance if you really want to. Um, but I do have time in my surgery schedule next week um, if you'd like to get it out. That's a totally different message. And then that, when that patient goes and has surgery, that's called patient anxiety. And really what it is, is he never got a clear statement of his status by a reputable, believable, credible expert. And yeah. uh, in the absence of that, people say, I better just cover my ass. I better just, I be just better treat it just to be safe. And it's because they don't have a, uh, an expert, a credible expert to fall back on that says, no, you're okay. You're, you're gonna, you can watch this. There's no increased danger. Yeah, the messenger matters, doesn't it? And the experience of the messenger matters. Yep. And yeah, I'll go to meetings with clots and they'll say anxiety. I don't have any patients that have anxiety when I talk to them about active surveillance. I'm going, well, no kidding, because you've got thousands of these guys and they're used to you, you know, preaching about it and feeling comfortable with you, you know? If, yep. So if, if I'm on a sinking ship and there's been a guy who's already been on 20 sinking ships, he knows exactly how to talk to me or one ship, that, maybe that's not a good analogy. But the point is well taken. It's very well taken. How about this guy who says he's got nine months of hormone therapy, then he had all this IMRT, followed by LDR brachytherapy, and then the, it goes on, but it says PSAs dropped to 0.2, and now it's gone up to 0.3, and so let's go back to anxiety. At what PSA reading after radiation and hormone therapy should I begin to be concerned and seek additional treatment? Yeah, I love these examples. I mean, this is so instructional because on, when men have been on hormone treatment, their PSA will drop down to zero. And after they've radiated their prostates, the prostate isn't vaporized. The man still has a prostate and it will still make some PSA. How much will it make? Uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Mac Roach talked a little bit about that. So having small amounts of PSA after treatment once the testosterone wears off is normal. So I've seen patients put back on hormone treatment to get further treatment because they thought the cancer was coming back. No, it's just the prostate coming back. Mm. A very, very important principle. Now, with these PSMA PET scans, if this starts to misbehave, like in the old days, I say, well, if the PSA goes above one or two, then we start wondering, do you have a bump or is the cancer coming back? But now with these PSMA PET scans, if let's say PSA goes above 0 0.4, 0 0.5, you say, you know, with a seed implant that seems a little high, it may be a bump. Well, let's just get a PSMA PET scan. Why guess? Let's just check. 
Uh, the only caveat is that if it's within two years, uh, I know you know this very well, Dr. Moyad, the radiation uh, kills the cancer cells, but it takes about two years for them to go away in the prostate. Mm. If you do another biopsy within two years after the, um, after the treatment is done, you may find a few cancer cells left behind. Same thing for a PSMA PET scan. Mm. So uh, you have to wait about two years before all the cancer in the prostate dies off. And then, of course, if the PSMA PET scan shows something in the prostate or outside the prostate, you know you got a problem to deal with. Was that too uh, much information too fast? Is that, do you follow through on that? No, no, I thought you followed through very well, but it reminded me, because all these questions reminded me about the speakers, and it reminds me of what goes in through my mind late at night, which is why I don't get a lot of sleep, because I can't turn off my mind. You know how that is. And I'm thinking, did we cover that? Did we cover that? What I told, maybe I told Roach this, but I tell every radiation oncologist, I say, you guys are terrible at advertising your profession. You're just horrible. And of course, I don't mean that on every single person. I just mean that the reason they're horrible is, look, people can say all the time, if I take your prostate out, at least I can then still radiate it. So you get a second shot at cure. And that's fine. That's not necessarily inaccurate. But what I, I never see a, a radiation oncologist defend well is that, and this is what I told Roach and other people, that when I get, you get radiation to the prostate, and if it comes back within the prostate, you can be radiated again. You still, it, you can get radiation a second time, and that's what you were talking you about. Get radiated, you can get radiated again, you can get high food, you can get cryoed, you can get electroporoted, whatever that is. You can, there's a, a litany of things. So the old time argument, which uh, the reason that surgery was always done first is if you go back 15 years, radiation was scary bad. And uh, people got burned and they didn't get cured. It was really ugly. Yeah. But this is 2020. I mean, the, everything's reversed now. The radiation is super precise, super effective. And the problem of cancer coming back in the gland is very rare when you're being treated by experts. But that's an important point, you know, and they, you know, they should just defend themselves a little better. Not that I want, you know, my shtick, not that I want anyone to be treated for anything. I just wish cancer would go away and we would go fishing or something. Uh -huh. uh, Here's a question about surgery and radiation 10 years ago and then dealing with very severe incontinence. Mm. Yeah, so they- so, uh, and, so, and so the reason I wanna bring this one up is because he talks about condom catheters. Do you have any recommendations or advice about, he said he wants to consider external catheter options, but what I think this question should really bring up is the concept of severe incontinence after treatment and where do you go and what do you think about and because there are a variety of potential options. So what do you tell these men who have severe incontinence even 10 years later? Yeah, I don't usually tell them about condom catheters, although they work, especially if people uh, at nighttime, you know, they can, it's like a condom they put on the penis and then it drains the urine into a bag. Um, but it doesn't seem like a, a, a real finished product. I mean, there are artificial sphincters, there's other um, things that can be done that are pretty successful. Like any procedure, you've got to seek out someone that's devoted their life to doing that. Uh, we had Gary Leach speak at our conference in the past. It's been a, um, a pursuit of his life, uh, a urologist in the Los Angeles area. Uh, and there are others that have dedicated themselves to, to fixing this problem. And so, and however, if someone's not a surgical candidate, if let's say he's very elderly, uh, can't have an operation, uh, condom cath might be a, a reasonable stopgap. Uh, type measure. This has been one of my pet peeves, and we've done a good job in PCRI of addressing that, and we've had a huge response, which is, you know, we talk about side effects of radiation. We just talk about side effects, but truthfully, people just don't know where to go, so they just go to their local doctor and they get advised, when in reality, there are certain doctors positioned around the world and in this country that only deal with those type of side effects, and you mentioned Gary Leach, who's near you. Um, there's a guy named Stoffel, uh, you know, locally at our place, and that's his focus. He's awesome. You got to seek these people out where this has become their specialty, fixing issues like that. And we don't do a good job of advertising those people. We really don't. Yeah, it, it's uh, with well, this whole quality issue. We keep coming back to that theme. If you're going to get a seed implant, find someone that does seed implants, not someone that does seed implants plus IMRT plus this plus that. Go for the guy that's really devoted himself to that skill. Yeah. And same thing for fixing uh, incontinence. These putting these sphincters in is a is an art, and uh, the the results are going to be on average far better if you go to someone that's doing it all the time. 
I had a great moment with Snuffy Myers because Snuffy taught me a lot. But once he asked me a question at a meeting one time, he said, you know, I send you all these people and you never return their call. And I said, it's not purposeful. I just came to the realization in my career that eventually you can't be everything to everyone. And what I meant by that is I'm good at what I do. I'm good at educating. I'm good at helping. I'm good at my public health. But the idea that I can start meeting with people like you do and be good at, that sounds good, but it's just not going to happen. And, it, and, and he looked at me as if to say, hey, that's not a bad answer. And I thought, okay, I impressed him because I, you know, he's always impressed me. So I don't know why that, I don't know why I came back to that. I just came back well, to that. Well, Snuffy actually did that same thing. You know, he developed a, his own proprietary approach to prostate cancer. He did relatively little in clinic work, but he provided cognitive oversight for hundreds and hundreds of men all around the country, even around the world. And uh, so he blazed his own path too. Remember he was at what, I think it was the NCI, right? And then when yeah. he got prostate cancer, he, he decided to, uh, to just devote himself to taking care and helping guide people with prostate cancer. Yeah, and he could have been the head of the big NCI. I mean, it's like Vogelzang. They had these people could have been the top dog, you yeah. know, at the dog pound, and they decided to instead pursue their passion in a different place. And I'm, I'm impressed by that. Uh, we touched upon this. I had a bunch of questions on focal treatment. Mm -hmm. And they're very generalized questions. And they talk about safe and insurance covered focal treatment. <laughs> That's a... That's sort of an oxymoron, insurance covered focal treatment. No, I, there's an exception. There's an exception. And that is that the, if you can find like, uh, when Dr. Mac Roach does a salvage focal seed implant, he can bill for the seed implant, which is Point. different than the HIFU, the laser, the cryo, which many of these centers are charging, you know, $20,000, $30,000 out right. of pocket, um, which is really um, obviously a huge problem. So, but, Focal radiation, if you have a doctor that's comfortable with those, uh, that approach, makes a lot of sense because their whole training in the radiation field is about targeting. So they don't have to go out and learn a new skill set when you tell them, I want you to just radiate the left base where the tumor is. They look at the MRI and say, yeah, I got it. I'll put a margin around that. We don't need to radiate the whole gland. And, uh, and they appreciate that a medical oncologist is standing behind us and saying, this is what we want. This is not some half-assed idea that the radiation therapist came up with. There's, there's a team approach that, that, that provides credibility to making these choices. Yeah. So the radiation treatments can get covered by insurance, but you have to find a highly skilled and uh, avant-garde you know, doctor that'll think a little bit outside the box. Yeah, and you have to bring it up. I think that's a good point. That's that's the exception to the rule. I, you know, I'm excited about these focal therapies. I'm excited about HIFU, but still it's the it's the out-of-pocket cost. So even if you're going to pay that kind of money out of pocket, you better look around because what I'm noticing about HIFU or doesn't matter. We can talk about cryo. We can talk about anything. There are a handful of people that do it enough to be that, that would impress you. The yeah. rest of them, the rest of them are what we call wannabes. Right. Right. They're, they're not there. And you have got to figure out who that is and the number of treatments. I talked to a guy yesterday. This, and this is not just in the cancer world. There was a guy I talked to out West who they want to talk him into getting a certain procedure for atrial fibrillation. And I said, did you ask the person who's pushing it, this specific procedure that will go nameless, how many procedures they've done? Well, they just started doing them in 2020. And he Scary. said, he said, I thought they would tell me that. And I said, no, this is what you have to ask. You have to ask them, okay, I understand you do this procedure now, but am I patient zero? Am I patient 21? What am I? Because sometimes that gets in, gets missed. Well, so, it's, the last, it's the last thing that these beginner doctors want to mention because they've got to get over that hump. They've right. got to get enough practice on volunteers uh, unknowing volunteers that are willingly submitting their bodies to this sort of thing. I, I had a patient, same exact thing, where they're doing these ablations, and the doctor, I said, well, what is he quoting you for success rate? And he said, 50-50. Uh, and that sounded really low to me from what experience I'd heard from other practitioners. And lo and behold, he got a second, a third opinion, and the, you know, the batting average of some of the other physicians in the LA was like 85-90%. And he was will he was just gonna kind of blithely go in and, and with a 50-50 shot and who knows how accurate that number was. Maybe it was 50-50 out of two patients, you know. That's uh <laughs> that's so I, it's really important to be careful with these procedures. Yeah, that's a really good point. I got another one here. Uh let's talk about let's go back to immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the questions, the multiple questions we get on immunotherapy is, okay, we had Provenge out many, many years ago. And you would have thought by this point, we'd wake up and there would be 
all these other ones FDA approved, Yervoy, Keytruda, uh, Tecentric, we have one in bladder now called Tecentric. Where are we with immune therapy besides Provenge? So first, first, let me throw this question out. When we talk about Provenge, it's still out there. So who's a good candidate for Provenge? And then we'll talk about what the HE double toothpicks is happening to immune therapy approvals of the FDA. So it turns out that immune therapies work better if you get after the cancer before it gets in every bone in your body. Um, the studies that were originally done with Provenge that showed just a, a four month improvement in survival were in people that had cancer all over their body. So the way it's evolved in the 10 years that Provenge has been out, the 10 plus years that Provenge has been out, is that when people get started on Provenge when their PSA is down at below 20 or even below five, you're looking at a year or two of improved survival for a, a treat, three treatments in six weeks. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, the, uh, it's a pricey thing, but it is covered by insurance. So um, it's uh, tip, tri typically no side effects at all. So the, the upside is huge. And it's, uh, I think, a very underutilized treatment. So Provenge in the right setting, especially men that have relatively low PSAs, is a fabulous treatment. Mm. The uh, neat thing, too, is that the med medicines that you mentioned, like Keytruda and, and Yervoy and Tocentric, would pr are probably synergistic with Provenge. So if you uh, get some Provenge, then talk to the doctor about maybe giving some Keytruda right after. We mentioned that you can get it uh, on a compassionate use basis from Merck Pharmaceuticals. The Keytruda works by taking the brakes off the immune system. What a beautiful thing to follow up Provenge with that's designed to um, you know, release the bloodhounds of your system to go attack the cancer. And then the uh, Keytruda, which shuts down all the inhibitory factors and allows the bloodhounds to really run free. So that uh, it, it has not been proven in studies that that combination will help, but it's very logical to assume that it will. And both of them have activity. So it's, kind of, it's almost like a why not. Yeah. Can you talk about, though, the catch with the immune therapies besides the cost, besides qualifying? It's funny how we used to argue that Provenge was, Provenge was expensive. And then the past five, 10 years, the price of these new drugs make Provenge look like a discount. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is. They're very pricey. Of course, very on a capacity use basis, they're, uh, they're free. But the, um, the, the downside is, is that they are powerful enough to cause serious immune problems. Uh, probably about 20% of patients can develop you know, asthma, irritable bowel syndrome, rashes, uh, hypothyroid. It's, you really have to be on your toes when you're giving these medicines. There is a uh, uh, microRNA test being developed at UCLA that can sniff out the people that are likely to get these side effects and, and tell you, well, we better stay away from that medicine in this individual. Unfortunately, the COVID thing has sort of sidelined that their whole industry, their whole business of, uh, that was doing that test has now been repurposed for testing for COVID. But hopefully that'll be back soon. It was a beautiful thing. So if we have someone that comes back low risk of side effects from Keytruda, We've, so far, the patients we've treated have been free of, uh, of side effects. It's really a, a nice to know in advance that it's a safe medicine for the patients to take. That's interesting. And then since we're talking about immune therapy and the immune system, uh, the questions that I get, but how has COVID changed the practice? Is it, are you back? I mean, are you taking, obviously you're taking different precautions, but do you have any just sort of general or specific thoughts about COVID-19 and its impact on prostate cancer patients. What I told, if you watched the Klotz interview, I'm sorry, not Klotz, Vogelzang interview, I essentially said that, you know, I'm kind of looking at it as the uh, glass is half full because we have one, uh, one of the most effective treatments now for people in the hospital is dexamethasone. Um, it came from a big trial in the UK called the recovery trial. And a lot of patients are on, on drugs like these for prostate cancer. Um, and so maybe, something they're taking could be beneficial, but what are your thoughts about COVID or general or specific? Well, our, um, apparently our patients are very careful patients because we've only had a couple, we have a huge practice. I mean, 2,500, 3,000 active patients, but the, um, we've only had a couple, a handful of documented cases so far, no one's died. Um, and uh, it's, uh, when you consider how big the practice is, that's kind of surprising. I think it's, uh, well, if you go back to like uh, March, April timeframe, you know, we were sitting around playing backgammon all day. Patients were so afraid. No one was coming in. They were all staying home. So you could see the level of, of, of care that was being exercised. People were just hanging out and, and, uh, and that 
works, uh, especially in a population, you know, sometimes aging population that's at higher risk. It, so uh, thankfully, uh, we haven't seen a much of a problem. Now, we kept pushing patients back, pushing back, and at a certain point, our practice has, has picked up again, and we're um, pretty much the same except for the increased incidence of phone visits. Uh, the uh, uh, insurance companies have switched their policy now, and they do now cover uh, phone visits. And so previously about 10, 15% of our practice was phone visits, and now we're pushing close to 50% of the practices uh, phone visits, which is uh, very convenient and effective. Uh, and uh, so that's the phone shift is the one big change that we've noticed. Other than that, thankfully, not much different. Do you have patients who come into your office, they have to wear a mask? Yeah, everyone's required to wear a mask and, you know, all the surfaces get wiped down and people, you know, keep their distance and we take all the usual precautions. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I have a little uh, missive, which I'm happy to mail out to people. I don't know if I, I don't think I ever sent you a copy, but I, for many years, as uh, you know, I don't like getting sick and yet I love being around patients and I'll see, you know, 20 plus people a day, shake hands and hug them and kiss them and all kinds of stuff. And the, I never get colds. But I think what was different about me and my office manager, who's a very, uh, my business manager, a very intelligent woman, um, I remember her talking about, because we had an employee that was out with a cold, and she, and she said to me, Mark, when will they ever learn to keep their hands off their face? And, because uh, she never gets colds either, but both of us are always aware of where the hands are. In fact, I rebuked you earlier yeah, on. You did. Oh, because you were rubbing your hands, and then you held up your, your uh, hand cleaner, and I said, I, okay, I release you from guilt, you're okay. But um, that policy of always knowing where your hands are, if you need to be reminded by putting some gloves on or a face mask, you're not supposed to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And I never get colds, and this is a, you know, this is just a ramped up cold virus. This is a scary, dangerous cold virus, but it's a cold virus. And uh, that's how you catch colds, is you pick it up on a service that someone coughed on or touched, and then you rub it in your eye or your nose or your mouth. Now you got a cold or you got a COVID. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, th and I think that if our patients will follow through and, and if they have the discipline to keep their hands out of their faces, they will, uh, don't touch your ear like that. No, I did that. I did kind of a comical part. <laughs> that's a bad joke. So, so, they, um, so that is, uh, I think it works. I really do. Yeah, I think you got, you got to be cognizant of it. And, you know, I bought these. People don't realize I don't wear glasses normally. I just wear them for reading now a little bit more because it reminds me I'm getting older. So, you know, I go grocery shopping. These are my grocery shopping glasses. And I don't give a damn who's laughing at me. I mean, these are for power tools, right? But mm -hmm. they feel good and they keep me from touching my eyes and they keep things from going in my eyes. And it's funny. I never thought I would go into our grocery store wearing power tool glasses and a mask and cover my nose and mouth and but but this stuff's important you know this stuff's really important it reminds me of public health it's the, it's the most simplistic recommendations that people have a problem with it's not the most difficult it's hard changing our lifestyle but it's, it's, very, uh, it's very motivating because if if someone particularly we know the people over 80 the people in nursing homes i mean we're looking at very high mortality rates in those groups so the people that are more elderly and we have them in our practice they have to be extra careful yeah, it's, 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 it's scary. It's scary. But, you know, I, I am incredibly optimistic that we will conquer this or at least control it quickly. Um, I want to talk about two tests that came up a few times, and I like to talk about these two. And that is uh, Garden 360, which is also known as a liquid biopsy. So can you tell us a little bit about how you use that? And the other one's Foundation One, which is traditionally looked at as a tissue, a tissue molecular marker, you know, product. But a lot of people are turning to one or two of these companies or other companies to give them some kind of insight if they can pull out a rabbit out of a hat, can they find a drug that's going to work specifically for them? And for many people, it doesn't, but for some people, it does. And these are very important, worthwhile companies. And can you talk about Garden 360 Foundation One or just the general category? Yeah, so I mean, the exciting thing is the ease of getting the information. In the old days, we had to line someone up for a bone biopsy to take tissue out and look at it in a genetic sense. But now they can just test the blood. So it's become routine in anyone that has advanced prostate cancer to do the Garden 360 Foundation. One has a liquid biopsy as well, so either one. 
and, uh, and see uh, the things that you mentioned. Uh, there's basically two things. One is the, the Olaparib and the Rucaparib, which got FDA approved. Dr. Vogel Zeng covered that. And uh, if the uh, BCRA uh, BRCA mutation is present, then the insurance will cover that and it's an effective treatment and a pill. Uh, and then the other thing you mentioned was, is you're going on a fishing expedition to see if your type of prostate cancer has some genetic similarities to other cancers, bladder cancer, lung cancer, whatnot, for which a treatment has been developed that is known to be effective and then can be translated off-label to treat prostate cancer for, if you have the same mutation. Only way you're going to find that out if, is if you look, and if they do find a mutation that matches something that's known in lung cancer, bladder cancer, it's very logical, again, to petition the company, see if you can get the medicine, and then uh, give it a run. Uh, this is the sort of thing that's usually reserved for men with advanced disease that have tried a lot of the standard stuff, and they're kind of running out of options. But uh, it's such a simple test to do, simple blood test, it's, that everyone should have it if they have advanced disease. Do you find that it is covered though? People are paying for it, the insurance companies pay for it. These aren't cheap tests. So do you find when patients are at a crossroads, they cover it? They are indeed covering it. And how long do you wait for the results? And right, how long are you waiting for the results right now? Is it still a week or two weeks or has it has been shortened? Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty quick turnaround. I'd guess about a week. So, I mean, those are important. I mean, those, those have become critical tests, you know, so Garden 360 Foundation One, I just kind of look at them as the paradigm, you know, they're, they're the names, but they're, they're, there are other companies out there that are outstanding, but the concept is the same. Can you find something in the genetics of my cancer, whether it's the blood or the tissue that can give me another shot at this thing? And that leads me to the question of, I, I asked Vogel Zhang, and I think he gave me a good answer. He said, now most of the patients with advanced disease do get genetic testing. So whether it's we call germline, the, the, ger the, the genetics you were born with, um, or what we call somatic, what's testing your tumor. Do you do BRCA, BRCA1 and 2, ATM? Do you do these kind of genetic tests now and everybody that walks in the office just to see if they qualify for some of these newer drugs? We don't do it routinely. Um, and it's an evolving thing. I've been I've been kind of mulling this one over. Uh, you know, the um, genetic tests can open up a can of worms in different ways. And if a person has, you know, if they're on active surveillance and everything's going well, uh, people need counseling as to, you know, what kind of information are you going to get when you do a genetic test? I don't think there's a one size fits all approach. On the other hand, if people have something, you know, their dad had prostate cancer at a young age, or they get it at a young age, or other factors, higher Gleason scores, it's very logical to do these tests and check and see if there's some underlying genetic abnormality that could be relevant to them or to their family members. Do you find that these are covered? These are expensive. Uh, sometimes. sometimes they are. Uh, sometimes uh, they're covered. And uh, if you meet those criteria that I described that, uh, you know, where you have some risk factors, it usually is covered. If someone just wants to do it and they don't have specific risk factors, they may have to pay for it. So now you mentioned the two drugs that we have for if you come up BRCA positive, you know, uh, we talked we talked about Limparza. I call it Limparza because that's where it was first approved. And actually, if you type in how to pronounce the drug, all the oncologists are pronouncing it Olaparib. But then I typed in the pronunciation on Google and it said Olaparib. So I don't know. I don't know what that, who knows? I don't know if that's correct, but I thought that's how you pronounce it. So, so these two drugs, so you've used these two drugs in practice, right? The Rucaparib the, and the Limparza. And uh, so tell me about side effects. Tell me about what your experience is. I mean, have these dramatically changed the outcome for some patients who come up BRCA2 positive and take these drugs? Absolutely. So um, they're... Uh, they have the same side effects as a mild chemotherapy like Taxotere or Jeftana, except they're uh, usually not associated with hair loss. And, uh, but they can lower blood counts, they can cause fatigue, uh, and they certainly can cause PSA declines and they can cause regression of cancer. And it's, uh, we've had some nice responses to these medicines. Can we talk about that for a second? You and I have not covered that. I've sent a couple friends to you and they've told me, and it surprised me because to each his own, they said, I don't want a drug that causes hair loss. Mm -hmm. And then I would think, what? You're dealing with cancer. But then I, I've been around breast cancer for 30 years. And, you know, it's an issue in breast cancer. Women don't want to lose their hair. I understand that. 
So why am I thinking men want to lose their hair? I mean, so it's not surprising people say, Get, point me to drugs where I don't lose my hair. Do you, do you have that discussion with patients? Because one of the chemotherapies that are delivered causes hair loss, another one doesn't. How do you address that? Are you seeing that more and more? That, or is that just an LA thing? I don't, I don't know. What is that? Well, I mean, it's, it's not a small thing. It has, you know, it has to do with your self-image and all that sort of thing. In most cases, we've, if you think about tax tear, that, uh, which is the most common medicine we use, which causes hair loss maybe in half the men that take it, uh, maybe a little less frequently if you do small weekly doses. Uh, if you think about the uh, situation where men are confronted with having to take Taxotere, usually the arguments for doing it are so overwhelming that they look past the cosmetic issues. I, I, uh, I don't know if it's the way we present it or whatnot. We have had a few patients, you know, they have these ice caps now that you can put on. It's not covered for men. It is covered for breast cancer. They are effective. Uh, they're a bit of a hassle because you have to put them on and keep them on for three or four hours um, or two or three hours uh, during the time that they're getting the chemotherapy and it will prevent hair loss because the blood flow, uh, you know, they're, they're ice caps. And so yeah. that when your scalp is very cold, the blood doesn't go there and it doesn't carry the taxotere there. And therefore the hair roots are not damaged by the chemotherapy. Yeah. So um, when I talk about damage, of course, hair loss is reversible when the taxotere is stopped. But uh, it's, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's not a small issue. Um, and, uh, you know, we tell patients if they start to lose hair, you know, just cut it short and, and uh, people get through it. But it's an interesting, fascinating issue because on one hand, if you go on hormone therapy and you lose your testosterone, a lot of men stop losing hair because the testosterone has to be around to express hair loss for many men. So a lot of men will say, oh my God, I'm growing hair out of my scalp where I didn't know it. I might be losing body hair, which is what happens. And then suddenly they go on taxotere and they lose hair from that chemo. And so I just found that more and more guys are bringing it up and we need to answer that question. And I think that makes sense, right? So. Well, the way taxotere works is it attacks rapidly dividing cells, which is cancer cells, but also the lining of our mouths, sometimes the lining of our stomachs, um, the, the clear uh, conjunctiva covering our eyes, the hair where it's growing quickly, all these things are susceptible to the, uh, to the effects of taxotere, and it varies from patient to patient. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that he was, uh, during my interview with Vogelsang, they're talking about an oral product. Did you, I don't know if you caught that. And uh, that was fascinating. What about, uh, what about the neuropathy? What about the nerve issues that can occur where you basically lose some kind of feeling. It just feels different in, your, in, in what we call the stocking and glove effect, right? In the tips of the fingers and the tips of the toes. Yeah, it's, it's a real problem. And it can, it's supposed to slowly reverse when you stop the medicine. It doesn't usually show up in the, uh, in the first, say, four to six treatments, which is oftentimes the protocol that we use, or maybe around the sixth treatment, people will start to notice some numbness in their toes or fingers. Uh, there are exceptions to that where people have a bigger problem and it even becomes an issue of maybe stopping the treatment early if that happens. Um, but uh, the, it's, it's billed as something that will over time go away once you stop the tax tear. But go away could mean a year or longer. Uh, so it's, a, it's not an inconsequential problem at all. Yeah. I don't know if you caught that part. I said to Vogel saying he didn't bite. He was just very stoic. I said, you need to change the name of chemotherapy to plant-based drug treatment because taxotere came from a plant essentially. And then it sounds more benign, you know, but truthfully people look at chemo today as if it's some harsh chemical, but we have a lot of harsh chemicals. You have a ton of harsh chemicals and this has stood the test of time. So maybe we're giving it the wrong name. So I wasn't actually being facetious. I thought you should change it to plant-based drug therapy, PBDT. And I think more people would be excited about it. Right? What are your thoughts? Well, yes, I, I I run into the same problem with calling, uh, you know, grade group one prostate cancer, cancer. Uh, the, <laughs> power of, the power of these words, cancer, chemotherapy, and the radiation, because if you go back 15, 20 years, the, what the radiation therapists were doing to people was really ugly. And there's there, we, people in, uh, that, you know, the 60, 70, year, 80 year olds that we're treating, they remember what happened to their Uncle Sam with radiation 20 years ago. And so radiation, chemotherapy, these are, really scary words and 
for good reason. If you look at what the type of chemos that were given 20 years ago and it didn't have much benefit, but they had yeah. a whole boatload of side effects. So it is true though, that uh, especially for prostate cancer, Taxotair, if it's given skillfully, the, I mean, you get some fatigue, uh, a transient and reversible fatigue, possibly some hair loss. You have to monitor for blood counts. And then in uh, Los Angeles, there's the, uh, you know, driving through West LA traffic to come to the doctor's office every three weeks. That's, it's, it's right in there. Um, so that, uh, it's not a small thing. You know, you take a day of someone's life fighting traffic in Los Angeles, that's a big punishment. So, um, so but that gives you an idea. There's an inconvenience factor, there's uh, side effects. But it's not like uh, for, you know, when they give chemotherapy to, to a leukemic and they put them in the hospital for a bone marrow transplant and, and they, you know, they basically wipe out your immune system. That's called chemotherapy too. And, and people conflate these things. Whereas taxateres, well, taxateres, you give 75% of the dose that you give to a breast cancer patient. But for the breast cancer patients, they add two more chemos. Mm. So get your, what uh, prostate cancer patients probably getting like 20, 30 percent of the intensity of what a breast cancer patient is getting when they call it chemo. That's a good point. I haven't really thought about that. You know, uh, again, I'm going sidetracked, but I just read an article because I, I follow breast cancer a lot because I think it teaches me a lot about prostate and hormonal tumors. And plus, they get a lot of money and they get a lot of money to do research that we don't get. And that's fine. And we should learn from it instead of me complaining about it. I think they should both be funded well. But uh, the argument was they've been looking back on a couple of studies and they're suggesting that uh, Taxotere, docetaxel, may have may be impacted by weight more than they realize. And so the argument that I just had to review for urologists and for primary care doctors, it was an article that perhaps we need to take a better look at how much of these chemotherapies the actual tumor receives because um, some of these are lipid soluble. And so someone that's got a lot of adipose tissue may be uh, sucking up or taking up a lot of the drug that never gets to tumor. I don't know if you have a comment on that. I just thought that was one of the most fascinating papers of the year because we, you give chemotherapy based on body surface, right? You give it based on parameters, height, weight, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that larger patients essentially are not getting enough of it. It's, it's theoretically possible, isn't it? That we will relook at the way chemo is given in the future based on weight? Yeah, not just weight, but obviously the other medicines that they're receiving. And uh, one of the things we watch is uh, we expect to see some decline in the white blood cell levels. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that we give medicines to prevent that, but we still expect to see some decline in the white. And so if you're not seeing any impact at all, you have to wonder, are you delivering the type of dose that you really think you're delivering? Interesting. Uh, that's just part of the art of, of giving these medicines that uh, is that you learn over the years. Well, have you actually, do you actually deal with that very often where you give it and you think, is this thing getting to the person? Is it getting to the, to the yes, tumor absolutely. site? Do you actually change the dosage? You can. And then the other thing is the, uh, of course, you want to see an impact on the PSA declining. Uh, so if you're uh, getting a wonderful, robust decline in PSA, then you're not going to ask very many questions. You just ride that horse. Uh, but if you're not getting the kind of results, adjusting the dose or adding something like carboplatin to the uh, taxotere has been a very effective measure as well. Wow. Uh, here's a question on significant difference between taking, you know, a lot of these anti-androgen type pills, the new ones, whether we started with Extandi, they're, they're basically four pills a day, right? So this person asked, Look, is there really a big difference between taking two pills a day of Xtandi and four? And I understand the question. It's, it's a lot of compliance to take four a day for a long time. What's your answer to what, what do you have to say to that? Can I just take two instead of four or I got to absolutely take four? Well, all the studies were done with four and it's not too hard to remember because you take them all at the same time. But the uh, the point being, especially with Xtandi, sometimes you'll see some fatigue that's associated with it, and a smaller dose may be more tolerable than the, than the four pills a day. And uh, I would say there, there's two different situations. Sometimes you've, you've got a relatively mild cancer, you're filed, fighting a rear guard action in an 85-year-old, and you're just trying to get them through, and using a small dose of Xtandi is a nice compromise. If you have a young person with high risk prostate cancer that you say, this is our one chance to cure you, 
I would never fiddle with a dose, uh, and you know, unless there was some real strong extenuating circumstances. All the studies were done with four pills a day. Let's not mess with success. Let's let's carry through. Do it according to the book, and uh, unless something comes up that you know would suggest you you're forced to modify the program. Yeah, that's interesting. And now that you have essentially four pills at your beck and call, and we reviewed those. We talked about Nubeca, we talked about Erlita, we talked about Xtandi, we talked about Zytiga. I mean, what's the, is, is, is it what I talked about with Vogel saying the decision on which one to use really comes down to side effects more than it does efficacy? Well, side effects and insurance coverage. So the, um, uh, the way medicines are approved these days, they, they're approved for a segment of the prostate cancer, a stage of the prostate cancer. It's not universal. Probably Xtandi has the most universal coverage over the different stages. So they're very pricey pills. And the one you get paid for, you know, you, you welcome that. You're, you're very grateful for it because the side effects for all of them tend to be, compared to how potent they are, tends to be quite minimal. Uh, so there's a little difference. Erlita is a little higher association of rashes. Um, Xtandi is a little higher association with the uh, with fatigue, and then uh, uh, you can't take it if you've had a history of seizures, for example. But those are usually uh, not an issue, and uh, we're always grateful if we can get any of them. You know, in the patients that need them, these are uh, these medicines changed my whole world. When I first started practicing in the prostate cancer world, about half of my patients were getting infusions of chemo. Now, in this modern era, it's probably three percent of my patients are getting infusions of chemo. So it's totally changed the way we, these medicines are so effective. It puts the disease in remission and it keeps people from needing chemo for years. It's really amazing. So we talked about present there. We got a, we had a number of questions and they were, they were formulated in different ways, but it all comes back to the same question. Uh, not too long ago, we heard about this radio pharmaceutical called lutetium and everybody was excited about it. And you got it in Heidelberg and you could get it in Australia, and now it's gone quiet. I know there was a phase three trial called the Vision Trial, I think, and that's ongoing. But what's, what's the status of this thing, this radio pharmaceutical that you can deliver that goes after bone mats and soft tissue disease? Do you have any comment on that? Well, I believe it works. Uh, we had patients that did travel to Australia and Germany that had pretty much run out of options. Uh, that got very nice responses. So it, it works. Uh, Novartis Pharmaceuticals bought the technology, what, last year, the year before for $2 billion. So they believe it works. Uh, so the phase three trials uh, that uh, are designed to get FDA approval have, um, have been completed. In other words, they've accrued all the patients, the ones yeah. that got the real stuff, the ones that got the placebo. Now they're waiting to, to prove and establish that the people that were treated with the lutetium live longer. And if they can show that, and that may take another, who knows, six to 12 to 18 months, if the, uh, when, that, when the code is broken and they figure out if it really worked, uh, usually FDA approval will follow within three to six months after that. Do you feel good that it will make it? I do. I'm very optimistic that uh, this, because uh, of the things that we observed in the patients that went overseas and some of the patients that were treated on clinical trials here in the United States. Well, there's a radio pharmaceutical available right now called Zofigo. It's radium. So when do you use that? And can you tell us a little bit about that? We get questions on that. Yeah, so it's just actually, uh, it's, rad it's radium uh, and it's injected in the bloodstream and it concentrates around the spots in the bones that are uh, irritated by cancer cells. And uh, it uh, is effective, it's simple. It's just an injection monthly. Patients will get uh, maybe a little bit of mild uh, nausea or diarrhea for a few days after the injection, maybe nothing at all. Uh, and it uh, can relieve bone pain. It can make, it's been shown to make people live longer. Uh, so it's an effective and simple treatment uh, with relatively few side effects. Uh, it's a very attractive, we're very grateful that we have it in our um, treatment armamentarium. But when I, when I do these meetings, there's still this debate over what to get first. What, you know, there's this debate of chemo first, then the radium or radium and chemo. Do you have any comment on that? The sequence, it's like the sequence is making people crazy and mad. Um, how do you play that out in your mind? Well, in people that have bone only disease and, uh, and they have good quality of life, they may want to try the radium first because I think it probably has less side effects than the taxotere does. There's no hair loss. 
um, and there are, there's not much of any associated fatigue. Um, if there's disease in lymph nodes, in liver, um, where the radium doesn't have any impact, uh, then the taxidermy would be a better first choice. Well put. Let's take, let's stay on the topic. Man, I'm getting through all these questions. This is amazing. I never get through these questions. <laughs> let's talk about radiation still. I brought this up uh, with Mac Roach because I hear more and more radi radiation oncologists using this four letter word. And it actually seems to be a nice word, but they're bringing it up, they're on board more. And I wanna know pros and cons called SBRT. So can you tell us about SBRT as an acceptable uh, treatment for radiation primary or salvage radiation? Just, mm -hmm. I, it seem, people seem to be jumping more on board and you know, it's four to five treatments and you're done. So can you talk to us a little bit about SBRT? Yeah, I, I think the excitement is justified. The uh, convenience factor is, is one thing. Uh, in the old days, we were worried about such high doses causing uh, what we call proctitis. Uh, th that's a, a burn to the rectal wall. What a disaster. Yeah. And there seemed like there was a slightly higher incidence with SBRT compared to IMRT. And so we stayed away from it until the advent of space or. Uh, where they inject a gel between the rectal wall and the prostate, push the rectal wall out of the field. Once that came into being, uh, our enthusiasm about SBRT went up dramatically because of the convenience. You can get, like uh, Max said, four or five treatments and you're done. There's no reason to, there's zero evidence to suggest that it's less effective. It might be more effective, we'll find out. Uh, and uh, the convenience is wonderful. The other thing is that in treating spots in the bones, which is this whole oligometastatic thing, there's a suggestion that if the radiation is given more quickly, it creates a stronger immune reaction. Mm -hmm. So if you just kind of sneak a little radiation, sneak up on the cancer cells and poison them with small doses of radiation over three weeks or a month, two months, that one thing you don't do is you don't get the immune system revved up against the cancer. If you slam it with a huge dose of radiation, it just blows these cancer cell uh, tumors apart. And then the immune system comes in and, and uh, cleans up the, the little bits and pieces of the proteins and learns how to attack the cancer in other parts of the body. It's called the Ibscopal effect. Yep. And the Ibscopal effect seems to be much more prominent in people that have SBRT than in the other slower types of radiation. So there's a number of reasons to think that SBRT is gonna be the wave of the future. Wow, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because SBRT is used right now. So when, when men have oligometastatic disease and they have a spot somewhere, right? They cyber knife some of these spots on the bone if there's an isolated spot and it's quite effective at targeting a little old spot somewhere on the hip or in the spine, boom, you can hit it. And that's where I thought all the excitement was. And now everyone's talking about SBRT hitting the prostate, right? So it's, it's fun to watch people excited about something that requires so much less time and commitment in terms of radiation therapy, I think. I mean, maybe. Well, it's, it's a mar I'm in, in this business now for 25 years, and uh, the tools that we have to offer are s dramatically superior to what we used to have. And it's uh, uh, just, as I mentioned before, that relatively low use of chemotherapy, that's a sign that our other treatments are working. Yeah. So now we're going to go into the topic of, this will handle most of a full page of questions. And get, I realize as we come to an end here in about 10 to 15 minutes that we really got through most of the topics that people asked us about on some level. This is the topic of testosterone. Ooh, this is juicy. And the reason it's juicy is on two sides of the coin. The first side of the coin is there was a Johns Hopkins study of men with advanced prostate cancer, castrate resistant prostate cancer that seemed to have, they didn't have many options left it seemed, but they had some and they gave them high dose testosterone and got a couple, I don't know how many responses, but it was impressive enough. And then I asked Vogelzang about it. And he said that he's treated about, I think he said five or so, and he's seen a couple of responses. So my first question is, Giving high dose testosterone as a treatment for castrate resistant prostate cancer, what's your thought process right now on that? So uh, you and I've had this conversation, you've been keeping your eye on this literature for a long time and um, my enthusiasm wasn't that great. Uh, my partner, Jeff Turner had uh, given a lot of testosterone to men in multiple different settings and has, have, has definitely observed responses 
Um, he, he didn't come away from it with a sense that it was a um, uh, consistent big time game changer. He'd see some responses that wouldn't last very long. Sometimes the men were excited about to, to be able to get their energy back, their libido back, um, and that was a big sales point. But uh, the data that you're talking about is pretty interesting. You know, there's, it's not only giving testosterone, well, how much, how often, you know, what's the protocol? And the, the particular protocol that was used um, is, is, may work better than some of the other methods that were uh, tried in the past with, you know, continuous testosterone and whatnot. Yeah. So, um, so it's on our radar is something to consider. There's, it's typically in situations we've always had something else that seemed a little more compelling. When you're making decisions about what to do for patients, it's treatment option A versus B versus C, and uh, that has traditionally been down toward the low, lower part of our list. But um, I don't doubt that there's something there uh, that that it is um, it will help some people. Of course, if it causes some disease acceleration in others, uh, you know, you need real experts monitoring you when you embark on something like this. Yeah, it seems like there's something there, but it's the, the real question is when do you, when do you put something there there, so to speak, right? Because it seems how do you monitor for it to make sure that you don't create a cord compression or something like that? Exactly, because a lot of things can go wrong with testosterone, and then that brings me to testosterone replacement therapy. Do you know we had a multiple questions on? Is testosterone replacement therapy safe while in active surveillance? Why do some doctors agree and others don't? And that summarizes about 10 questions we got. Do you want to yeah. comment on that? Yeah, it's very understandable that there would be confusion because the most effective treatment against prostate cancer is to block testosterone. So people assume that the converse will be true, that if you give extra testosterone, the cancer would grow faster. It's an assumption that seems very logical. It just turns out it's incorrect. Uh, that idea has been tested and, and giving testosterone doesn't make the cancer grow more quickly. Uh, so uh, the analogy I use is oxygen. You take oxygen away, we die. If you give people extra oxygen, they don't live longer, they don't live better, they don't become stronger because they have enough oxygen. And uh, so testosterone, if you equate testosterone with oxygen in that type of an example, you give you some understanding of why um, the many experts that do this a lot are not nervous about giving men who are otherwise stable, they've got these low, you know, great group one Gleason 6 cancers that aren't gonna ever hurt them, who may be hypogonadal and they're suffering. Their libido's gone, they feel tired, they can't concentrate. And they say, most of the men my age group don't know it and they've got the same condition. They're taking testosterone, why can't I take some too? And in our practice, the answer is you can, you can take it. But I think that the doctors that aren't heavily involved in treating prostate cancer, they just assume, they just conflate this idea that testosterone removal is treatment, testosterone extra is going to be like gasoline on the fire. And while it's a logical assumption, it's actually incorrect. Yeah, I just think the question is, you know, it's, it's a very complex question. I mean, you could argue that when you give intermittent hormone therapy, you're taking testosterone away and you're allowing some to come back for a while, you're getting a surge. Yep. But I, I, I think, I also think why it makes enough, some people nervous is I think some people have a low testosterone after treatment or they get older and they think it's going to be the end all be all that changes their life. And they see these commercials that look as if, you know, they're swingers now and they can get all this stuff done that they couldn't get done. And now they're going back into their twenties and check me out. This is all because of testosterone. And I'm always thinking, Hey man, if it was that simple, I'd be taking testosterone, but well, your, your, point is, your point is very well taken that um, the kind of results you're going to get when you give testosterone are variable from patient to patient. So some men can load up on a boatload of testosterone and they come back and uh, you got to give it a few months, you know, two, three, four months to see how it's going to play out. And they'll come back and say, I feel exactly the same, Dr. Scholz. Now my <laughs> testosterone's running 700. Before it was only 250. The numbers are different, but it doesn't do nothing for me. And, uh, and, I, and I've had the opposite true too. You know, I've had these rare patients that go on Lupron and their testosterone was 500 and then it goes down to zero and they'll come in for the second or third monthly visit after starting treatment and I'll say, you know, I'll sort of bemoan with them say, you know, isn't it sad that, you know, your sex drive is going away and, and they'll look at me with this blank look and they'll go, what are you talking about? Hmm. I said, well, you've lost interest in sex, right? What? Yeah, I, I, I had no interest when I was eight years old, but it hadn't changed since, Dr. Scholes. 
And so there's some people, you take all their testosterone away, it has no impact on their libido. So you can get, you have to, when you embark upon the testosterone treatment paradigm, you have to look not so much at the numbers in the blood, but what are you trying to accomplish? And are you accomplishing that? Do you indeed have more energy? Do you, do you have more libido? Is that what you want? Are you getting what you want out of this? Because not everybody just by cranking their numbers up is going to, you know, get everything they want. Some right. people will have a very wonderful effect. Others, it's kind of like, eh, I don't know. I don't, doesn't really do much. Yeah, no, that's very true. Very true. Uh, the, uh, the only other questions I really want to address were the questions about how long hormone therapy should be given with radiation treatment as if there, you know, there's some question, how do I know if I should be on long-term hormone therapy? Someone asked that they heard the protocol is two years. Others heard it's indefinitely if you're really, really high risk. I mean, how do you slice this bread when you want to talk about how long someone's supposed to be on hormone therapy while they're also getting radiation treatment? How do you counsel on that? Because that is a really, that's such a complex question that I never even got to it with Roach. When I mean, we covered it a little bit, but. The, the nice thing is one of the few areas where we've really got some data. And uh, it turns out that after you've given 18 months, and this 18 months of hormone treatment is sort of the standard for what we call high-risk prostate cancer, um, you really don't get much, if any, additional benefit. And that's been shown in like men that were randomized between 18 to 36 months, five, 10 years down the line, same exact outcome. So once you get to 18 months, you can say enough is enough and you can take a holiday, assuming that you know, your PSA is behaving and whatnot. Uh, that's for the high risk. And then for the intermediate risk patients, uh, the standard is usually to give four months. And then for um, favorable intermediate risks, um, and, unless you don't give any hormone therapy. That's been the traditional approach. Now, I'm wondering if the traditional approach, which I adhere to myself, which I think is the right approach, um, I'm wondering with time now, are we going to, uh, with this PSMA PET scans, is that going to start shouldering into this? And you say, well, but doc, my, I don't have any small METs outside. Like that's why you're giving me the hormones, right? And uh, so there's going to be some compromise. Perhaps it'll start in the men that are somewhat older, you know, the 75 plus year olds where they have a negative PSMA PET scan. They say, yeah, you give me hormones for 18 months. My 75 year old testicles will never come back. Um, Dr. Schultz, you know, can we just do four months or can we skip it all together? My PSMA PET scans, fine. If I have, a, you know, I'll, I'll get PSMA PET scans in the future. If, if we don't get it all this time, we'll get a PSMA PET scan if the PSA misbehaves just slightly and then we can go chase it down at that point and I'll take hormones. But the vast majority of men that have what I have, Dr. Schultz, they don't have metastatic disease. You know, I don't want to take all these extra precautions now that I know my PSMA PET scan's clear. Yeah. Well said. Uh, okay, so I have a couple questions that are personal questions, all right? And then we're going to go into my quiz and call it a day because we have 15 hours or something of material. I figure, I mean, I'm sick of myself after 20 minutes. I can't imagine people seeing me for 15 hours, for God's sakes. Uh, what's the biggest, this is just random because I think of this stuff when we talk, you know, whether we are in person or not. What's the biggest advance you see coming still in the next five or 10 years? I mean, the biggest advance that could knock our socks off and say, wow, this is a real game changer, whether it's a year, three, five years. I mean, if you asked me that question, I would think maybe it's immune therapy, but I don't know. I never would have predicted these other things coming up on the market, you know, all these anti-androgen products. What do you think is going to be the big game changer or triple or home run we see in the future? What would I think you it'll be three things? I think it'll be the better scans. I mm -hmm. think it'll be the immune therapy that you mentioned, and then I think it'll be the uh, discoveries that these micro RNAs that you know we tried to uh, with the genetic tests that we have now that look at structural proteins. We really milk that cow for all its milk. There isn't much left there, and not much has changed in the last you know three, four, five years. But ninety percent of the DNA is making micro RNAs, which are regulatory, and Cancer, if you think about it, is probably a regulatory problem. So as they start to sniff out what these microRNAs are doing and they start finding ways to adjust and, uh, and to use those as a treatment paradigm, I expect absolutely amazing advances to come. So um, genetics, especially microRNAs, the better scanning, which we've talked about, and the uh, uh, better understanding of the immune system, I think those will be the big three probably in the next five, 10 years. 
And in my world, I hope the greatest advance is that people realize that they have a lot more control uh, than is told that they have, especially when it comes to making their own personal changes to improve their quality of life and outcome. Mm -hmm. I am troubled by seeing, and I told this to Klaus, I am troubled that now in the active surveillance trials, including, remember we talked about the meal trial that Parsons ran? I, when I was asked to review that, that paper, and I talk about it in lectures and with students, I found the most troubling thing wasn't the diet didn't work it, in that situation. It wasn't uh, anything but the fact that when I looked at the baseline characteristics of the patients in that trial, the average patient in active surveillance was a BMI of almost 30. So you're already starting out, look, I know weight loss is hard. It's the hardest thing we do but you're already starting out, not only with prostate cancer at the early stages, but already metabolically unhealthy. And so we're seeing that across the spectrum in prostate cancer, whether it's some of the chemo trials, whether it's the hormone trials. 20 years ago, the average BMI was 25, 26, like you see in some other countries. Now you're coming in at 30. And now you're talking about a disease that really accelerates this metabolic unhealthiness. And so my worry, is that we're going to get these advances that you speak of and we're going to go yay and then people are going to be dying at record numbers of heart attacks and strokes because they were so metabolically unhealthy one because they started unhealthy and they two they didn't, weren't able to make the lifestyle changes which i know are hard and three because these drugs as awesome as they are in many cases can make you more metabolically unhealthy so I just hope we come to the realization, I know you practice that, I know I practice that, but I just wish people would understand that this game is about probability. It's not just about beating prostate cancer, it's about living longer and better. And if you beat prostate cancer, but you're dealing with raging diabetes, and it's not controlled or hypertension, you've got problems. You're just gonna go on to the next problem. Uh, so that's so bad. The nice thing about that, that we know it's a great challenge, but this is what one thing that is completely under the control of the patient. So the the sad thing is it's a very difficult mountain to climb. Very. But there is a possibility of climbing the mountain. There's nothing standing in the way of people, uh, you know, getting the counseling they need, hiring a trainer, surrounding themselves with like-minded people, become a problem solver, and it uh, not only pays off in terms of living longer. I mean, your self-esteem goes up. You feel better. You think better. Your memory's better. All kinds of uh, marvelous things come if you're able to implement this. And it's, uh, it's good that you keep reminding us of that because it is one thing that's under the patient's control. It is because, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't talk about it. Now people are talking about it. But really, the numbers are getting worse in these clinical studies. And, and the population is, you know, we have almost a 10% prevalence of diabetes in almost every state. And I understand these things are very difficult. And it takes so much energy and time just to focus in on those basics, the basic numbers I always talk about. That's why I don't like when people get distracted by a bunch of other products and things that in the big scheme of things don't matter. So one of the most frustrating things I deal with is that someone has a very high blood sugar, they have a high blood pressure, um, you know, they're having problems with their weight, for example, there's a cholesterol is a problem, and they, they get me on the phone or they come by uh, and they talk to me and they say, oh, I'm so honored to talk to you. And I get this huge ego hit, right? I want to hear it because, you know, I, I have very, I have huge problems like all of us with self-confidence. And they say, oh, you're the greatest thing. I can't, I'm so glad I got you. I just, I can't even believe I've got time with you. And I'm thinking, okay, that's all very nice. I can't wait for this juicy question. And then they go, here's the question I've been just dying to ask you. And I'm thinking, okay, what is it? And they go, should I be taking high doses of vitamin blank? And I'm going, ah! <laughs> have you seen your cholesterol? Have you seen your blood sugar? I'm going, that's an important question, but we got to take care of the elephant in the room. That's the number one problem I deal with. And so I'm going to get off my soapbox for a minute. Now well, I'm, gonna I'm going to bring you out to the practice sometime because I'm amazed, Mark, at the type of clientele that we attract in Marina Del Rey because uh, I ask every patient that comes to the door, are you exercising? And of course, they don't have to tell me about their diets. I mean, you can the yeah. way this measure. Yeah, it's, uh, but I am impressed that uh, 
the type of people that we're seeing are very engaged in these questions. They understand that it's not just surprise, uh, surviving prostate cancer, it's about living a good quality life and, and not dying of other things as well. And uh, we see a lot, of, a lot of our clientele that are getting their weight under control, even when they're on Lupron. You know, I, it's extremely impressive. But the message is getting out there. People are starting to understand. They're starting to engage. I'm, I'm encouraged. So next time you're out, we'll, we'll have you buy and you can uh, just get a random sampling of what I'm seeing on a daily basis. I'm encouraged that people are starting to figure this out. Well, I'm very encouraged too. I mean, there's no question now it is a priority. You know, in the, in the past 20 years, I'd have to beg just to get a lecture at a conference. And now that's the least of my problems. But the reality is I think that, I also think the people that seek you and I out know like, like Klotz, you know that he's going to talk active surveillance, he's going to be pro. They know now, it's clear that when they're seeking us out, they're going to get that speech. They're, we're going to talk about it. It's the ones that aren't getting that on a regular basis, the ones that we can't reach that I think is the best thing about Zoom and the best thing about the YouTube channel, that that's what I see. There's so many men around the country just looking for answers, you know. They're the ones that are going into other people. And let's face it, it it's not a priority everywhere. It is what it is. So we got a lot of work to do, but I, un I understand the struggle and I feel bad for the patients, but I think but we always bring this up and it's a good thing and we can never, uh, we can never not talk about it enough, so to speak. We got to keep talking about it because it's so damn important. Now there's two questions I've asked every speaker for over 10 years of the conference, but I never asked you. And th this is how I want to end before I give you my final quiz. I used to ask the speakers, and I thought it was a very, very intriguing question. Maybe I asked you privately, maybe I didn't. I just don't remember. I would ask two questions. What do you think the biggest mistake doctors make when it comes to prostate cancer? It's a totally off the cuff question, but what's the biggest mistake doctors make? And then the second part of that question is, what's the biggest mistake patients make that you've seen? And it's not fair to throw such a generalized question and force you to think of one answer, but still, I mean, if there's something that comes to mind. Something comes to mind right away. And the, the biggest mistake, I don't know, I, I, with deeper thought, my answer might change, but uh, right off the top of my head, the idea that, um, uh, well, the, use an example of, of teaching someone how to play golf. Would you rather take someone that's never held a golf club before to the to the teacher and teach them a pure swing or would you rather take someone with a horrible slice take them to the teacher and try and fix it and the uh, prostate cancer is such a deep subject that people read a little bit about it and they tend to think they've got it figured out and there are just so many layers to it so it it takes a, a lot of humility a lot of the decisions we make are based on probability as you've said a couple times even that's a difficult concept for a lot of people. So it takes a lot of humility uh, what if, to help patients deal with the fact that they really don't know what's going on. Uh, you need to team up, you know, team up with uh, support group leaders, uh, you know, get a, a spouse involved and, and study and all these sorts of things. There's all kinds of things you can do. So that's the one problem that I see. And then in terms of the, of the caregivers, I see the same, really the same problem. The, uh, the, the urologists are stretched too thin. You know, they've got to know how to do, um, you know, take care of stones and you know how to surgically remove prostates and they've got to understand, you know, hormone therapy side effects. It's just too much. And, uh, and the idea of, as we've repeatedly talked about, of getting specialists that are narrowly focused on one area when you're dealing with an, such a sensitive area of the body, it's, it's not such a big deal if you have your gallbladder out or your appendix out. But when you're starting to deal with the area of urination and sexual function, uh, you need to get to that, those narrowly specialized doctors. And uh, that, um, so it's kind of similar on both sides is people don't know what they don't know. And, uh, and that, uh, I, you know, there's so much, I'm still learning. I've been doing this 25, 30 years and I, I can't keep up with it all. So I know that people are trying to do it part time or just kidding themselves. Yeah, well said. So my dream, after this video is that everybody who goes into Dr. Souls's practice or any other practice in America always thinks of the Moyad 5. Don't let your doctor tell you, send them up to Dr. Souls and say, Dr. Souls, I'm gonna give you the Moyad 5. And he's gonna say, what's that? I'm gonna tell you right off the bat without you having to look it up. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat what my blood cholesterol is, my blood pressure, 
my blood sugar, my BMI or my belly fat or what my waist size is in terms of my pants. And then I'm going to tell you about my brain health, mentally how I'm doing. And so I'm going to cover those five more than anything else. I know my numbers and I'm not going to accept any of those numbers that a doctor says, your number's fine, have a nice day, and you don't know the number. And I always say it's like the weather. It's 60 degrees in Michigan right now. I wanted to show you a campus trees. I think it's the greatest day in the world. 60 is perfect for me. I had the windows open. It's a fall day. This is nirvana for Moyad. For people like Shoals, you come here at 60, you're wearing eight sweaters. You probably don't like it. My point is it's relative. Just like you know your PSA, you've got to know your numbers and you've got to know your general health numbers. So my dream is I know your patients know everything about diet. I know all that. We have a lot of great people, but I want them to start coming in and going, I'm giving you the Moyad 5, Dr. Scholes, before we even start this conversation. My blood pressure runs 120 over 80. My blood cholesterol is 160. My blood sugar is 99. My pair of pants I put on in the morning is a 32. And you know what? I'm doing great. I'm in a great mood. Life is great. And I just wanted to give you those quick Moyad 5. Now can we go on with the appointment? And then there's a lot of virtual hugging or just hugging going on. I don't know why that's my speech today. No, that's brilliant. And the, uh, it, what's the old saying? You know, if you don't measure it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So you, you're just kidding yourself. The only, only modification I'd make is uh, the, uh, which, you know, total cholesterol gives you a rough idea, but uh, know your LDL, LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Absolutely. Boy, now you're trying to come, now you're coming at me. Good for you. Cholesterol is relative. What I really want them to know is I, I want them to get the A++. I was just being generous. I want them to know their LDL. I want them to know their HDL. And I want them to know their triglycerides. Total cholesterol, as you said, is kind of a meaningless number. You can have someone that's got a really high total cholesterol, but they work out so much, their good cholesterol is 105. So in reality, they have a high cholesterol because their good cholesterol is so high. And so they should really today know their lipid profile. You know, LDL is bad cholesterol. Triglycerides is a measure of fat in the blood. And HDL, and you know, you can always tell, I call HDL truth serum. So if someone says, oh yeah, Dr. Scholes, I play tennis seven days a week, and you see an HDL of 30, you're going, oh, there's something not right here. This is either a genetic problem or they're not really working out this much. But you're exactly right. When you and I in the future take it to another level, they got to know those specific numbers. And it's not hard to memorize them, and it's not hard to understand that they're all impacted by what you do. No, that's brilliant, Mark. And the uh, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because it, it sounds so simple after you say it, but you and I know it's not happening. That the uh, people are very concerned about their health. They're coming to see the doctor. Um, they may know their PSA, uh, but the chance of dying of prostate cancer is probably 2% of the chances of them, if they're a you know, 65 year old male of dying of a heart attack and the LDL or the total cholesterol indirectly will uh, give them some clue as to whether they've got some work to do. That's right. I mean, I've always argued that some, we also live in a society, and this is a global pr problem, that some people are driving, I put this in the, in the book that you read, some people are driving 100 miles an hour toward a cliff on the Grand Canyon, and you're in the car with them, and you see them driving that fast, you're going, hey, you got to put on the brake, what are you doing? You're going to go off the cliff, and, and they go, yeah, but hold on a second. There's a mosquito in the car and I need to get rid of that first. And you're going, what? The mosquito? And I give that analogy because people always say to me, well, why don't you recommend more supplements? You're, the, you're supposed to be the supplement guru. And I say, it depends on the condition. But in reality, what I have learned and that what's brought me the most attention since 1999 is I don't want people taking anything unless they need to take it. And if they need to take it, it should be something that provides some kind of tangible heart benefit that then can pay off in multiple arenas instead of guessing. So yeah, I've always been excited about cholesterol lowering drugs as you have been, statins. I've always been excited about who might qualify for metformin in terms of controlling blood sugar. I've always been excited about who might, con who might qualify for aspirin, for example. So we came up with that acronym SAM. It doesn't mean that I want people to take these pills. It's just, you, there's 100,000 pills in the market today, 100,000. So you can only invite so many people to the dinner table. And if I only have three or four chairs at the dinner table, I better be damn sure that the one people I'm having come to dinner are the ones that are gonna provide the most entertainment for me.
because otherwise I can invite a thousand other players. So I focus in on the pills that have a track record of in the worst case scenario, they help you live longer. In the best case scenario, they help you live longer and fight your prostate cancer. In other words, th this is how, it's not that I'm not excited, but the reality is we talk about drugs and supplements that have heart healthy benefits for a reason, because those are the ones that have tended to pay off in the area of prostate cancer, not just heart disease, right? Now, let me, while you, you're on the subject of supplements, and I know we're running li long, but I, a question that I uh, specifically wanted to ask you about, because it re relates exactly to what you're talking about. Many, many patients are taking statins. Uh, where are you at with coenzyme Q10? Um, do you recommend it use universally in all statins? And if so, what kind of a dose are you recommending? Well, th the problem with CoQ10 is that there's, there's one problem with it. The problem is, is that in most of your clinical trials, in the statin clinical trials, where we saw dramatic effects, CoQ10 wasn't a part of them. So the idea is to take CoQ10 because statins naturally reduce body levels of CoQ10. Now, for someone that's experiencing side effects of a cholesterol lowering drug, namely myalgias or muscle type issues or joint even issues, and the decision is to continue the statin or not, but you want them to continue it, and they might get relief from those issues by taking CoQ10, that's where I think we should be more favorable. But coming right out of the gate and paying for an expensive supplement that might go after a side effect that many people actually don't experience at low dosages, I just get worried coming after pills and more pills for side effects and becoming dependent on more pills without empirical evidence is not the way to go. So I like CoQ10 for that handful of people that they're having problems with their cholesterol-lowering drug. They're having problems with other cholesterol-lowering drugs. And now it's become a matter of, gosh, are they going to stay on it or not? And how do they stay on it? Well, there have been clinical trials testing dosages as low as 100 milligrams a day to 300 milligrams a day. And half of them have been successful, and the other half have shown no benefit. And I'll tell you why that is. Because statin-induced my myalgia, we call it, or SIM, is a very complex problem. So for example, people that gain weight have that problem. People who are intense exercisers have that problem. People sometimes who are very skinny have that problem. So it's not just CoQ10, but CoQ10 should be a part of the discussion at the lowest dose possible, and most of the trials started at 100, and you can elevate it if the question is, I'm thinking of dropping my drug entirely when I need it. That scares me. And you know, so really, that, that really fits your, your modus operandi. What you're yeah. saying, uh, Mark, is the book that I wrote about you know, all these different supplements is aimed at helping people fix real problems. It's not just right. emotional solve that you, you know, you're taking your nine things and now you're going to live uh, to be 110. Um, that these things do have activity, but they also have potential side effects like any other effective agent. And uh, I love that answer because you're saying it has a it has a role, but it's not a panacea. That's right. That's right. It's you know we didn't have time, and we'll talk about this next year at the conference. But uh, ASCO just came out with new guidelines uh, for peripheral neuropathy, and boring, right? What to do for peripheral neuropathy? Not boring. I had to review it, and it's the first guideline I can remember from ASCO where it actually says, and I agree with the conclusion. It says, look at that beautiful view you get in the back. You're just trying to throw that at me to compete with my, my forest view. I don't care that you live in California. Michigan is the greatest place in the world, right? That's why my Michigan mask, my Michigan football, I've had patients and little kids even make me Michigan pillows. You can't move me to California, man. I'm staying here unless I get fired. And then anyway, so what was I talking about? I got crazy for a second. I was talking about, what was my topic? You, yeah, you moved on from CoQ10 to... Um, uh, oh, I moved on to ASCO, the peripheral neuropathy. So here's the conclusion. Do I have it around here? I just had to review it for doctors. It was, they discouraged the use of one supplement called acetyl-L-carnitine because in a couple of trials, it made the neuropathy worse, wow. worse. And I thought, wow, for the average person reading that, uh, that's pretty harsh. But for the person that's read our books the past five, six years, we say that because those trials were real. And the point being that supplements are amazing drugs when they work for the right situation, like macular degeneration. 
but they're also like very dangerous drugs when you start applying them to situations where the evidence clearly shows they're not beneficial but harmful. Look, I have no doubt acetyl L-carnitine can help in other issues, but it's not something an oncologist should be combining with a chemotherapy drug because there is evidence to show that not only can it not do anything, it can make certain things worse. So keeping up with this is a full-time job and it should be respected. And I just don't think people should pop any pill until they've done their homework, drug or supplement, on the pros versus the cons. Now can we get to my quiz? Get right, on. All right. So here was my quiz. You have to guess, you have to guess this song. This fight song. Ready? Here's here's the first one. Let's see, I might recognize it. Is, it, is that uh, is that your fight song? What's my fight song? Can you please say that with clarity, just like when you're looking outside the window? What's my fight song? I, I think you're at Michigan, aren't you? You have, to, you have to say the university. Yeah, I am Michigan. All right, you got one for one. You know what my other one was going to be? What? My other one was going to be the USC fight song. Oh, well, I think I might recognize that. <laughs> That's what one. Alex... I don't know. I might have to play that sometime. My, my daughter is uh, fourth generation USC. You'd think that we were just as rabidly alumni as you are about Michigan, but it just sort of fell into place for us. So, Because you are a USC kid, right? Yeah, and my father and my grandfather. Yeah. Wow. We go way back at USC. And uh, the uh, I, I don't make as big a deal out of it because I think last year you kind of raked uh, USC over the coals about their uh, some of their uh, indiscretions. So, um, so we're laying low. I don't know what you're talking about. I have <laughs> short I have short term memory loss right now. <laughs> but don't you, where did you where did uh, Peter go to school? Uh, he went to that dreaded uh, UCLA school across town. So Peter is a son of uh, Dr. Scholes. He's working behind the scenes. He's an incredible camera person, editor, all around tech guru. And he went to what school? Can you please use those four letters for me? Because I've never seen you use those. Yeah, UCLA Bruins. So the only, the only football game I got both of my uh, kids to go to, because my daughter was at USC, was a USC UCLA game at the Coliseum. Uh, they weren't big football fans like you are. But uh, unfortunately, U UCLA won. Uh, so Peter was thrilled. At, Natalie and I, Natalie didn't care that much, but I felt pretty, pretty bad. Yeah, I mean, I pretend like I'm a big football fan. In reality, I miss so many games every year that even though I've had season ticket for 50 years, I think I catch one a year. And uh, oh. so, and anyway, I know you, so can, you, can, you can walk right over to the stadium from your house, right? Yeah, so you see here, here you yeah. see the trees. You just, you just go up the street, turn right, take left, and then walk straight down that street for a while, and you run right into the students going into the stadium. That's why... Uh, if there's a better place to live, I want to know where it is. I mean, I live in the house right now I used to deliver newspapers to as a kid. So I, I live the small town American dream and uh, I love it. And just like you love Marina Del Rey and that whole area, which is beautiful. You know, we have our own little piece of the pie and it's, it's, it's really quite a pleasure. And I want to tell you too, again, with now sounding too fluffy, um, you and I uh, have teamed up. We came from two very different worlds. And our whole goal was to educate, educate, and do more education. And I've, I've done this with you for a long time. And I know I rib you a lot and you rib me, but it's, you know, I hope to do this a long time, but it's been really an honor. And I think, I think that when we go to sleep at night, we've really done the right thing. I feel good about what we're doing. I know we got more to do, but I am, I'm, it's, it's very, it's a huge honor for me to do this with you every uh, year. Mark, it's, it's not easy what you do. Uh, we've seen so, as uh, you know, we see some of the challenges that the entertainers are facing out there without an audience. I just love how you how you've been able to make the transition to this online format. I uh, I, I I got to watch all this the talks personally and uh, was so impressed. It was it was I was learning stuff, and I was enjoying the whole process. So. Thank you so much for making this happen, for pulling this together. I know it's, it's been a tiring run for you, but I so appreciate it. And I know that uh, it's gonna be so helpful to so many people. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I was, we were joking today before we went on the air that uh, I got Zoom neck. I really did. 
you know, because we did 14 hours. So I woke up this morning and I couldn't move my neck left or right. And I thought, how did this happen? And it comes from leaning forward into the camera, into the computer for eight hours. So well, it's like how engaged you are. I mean, you are energized by the process and it helps us all stay focused. So, so thank you so much for sacrificing your body. And uh, I hope we have an excuse to get together before the mid-year conference. And yeah. uh, I hope we'll be able to start traveling again. Yeah, no, I hope so, too. I mean, I'm very optimistic. Uh, but thanks to all the PCRI volunteers, as well as all the staff. They're incredible. And uh, I know you can see them on the website and their photos. But uh, we'll see everyone again soon. And if you have really nice to things to say about this conference that we did, the past few days, please write us. If you have something bad to say or critical, please write somebody else. And um, with that, I hope to see you, my, my friend, really soon. It's, it's been a really good run this year, and uh, I can't wait to be out there again for the spring meeting. All right. Great job, Mark. You enjoy your, your wonderful life there in Michigan. Thank you. You enjoy it, too. I'll talk to you soon. Bye All now. Right. All right, the time has come. I can't believe we are at the end of our conference here, but I wanna thank you so much for joining us virtually today. You guys mean the world to us. Uh, we love being able to support you and create services for you guys, and knowing that you're there online with us, we feel all the energy, we feel all the love, and I just can't thank you enough. I'd also like to thank our favorite Dr. Moyad. He did such a great job with all of our speakers, and. Oh my gosh, we just love him to pieces. We thank him so much for just the incredible time that he spends donating to PCRI. I would also like to thank Dr. Mark Scholz. Obviously, he's our executive director, but he donates all of his time as well and just really keeps us running. I'd also like to thank all of our presenters, Dr. Margolis and Dr. Klotz, Dr. Vogelzang and Dr. Roach for their presentations. All the information they provided today is gonna to help a lot of people. And finally, thank you to all of our sponsors. You guys have helped provide uh, you know, funds that we can make this 100% free for the patients. And thank you to my team because they've always done an incredible job presenting these types of conferences. As a reminder, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. This helps you stay up to date on all the content that we produce. And if you have any questions, we are here for you and so happy to answer. Also, we do have our mid-year conference coming up in the spring. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, visit PCRI.org to stay up and informed. And also, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. You can visit PCRI.org to learn more. Provench is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. 
Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, nausea or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis, which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information.